Is anybody there? Can't hear anything. Hello? Yeah, I, I think they haven't started yet. It looks like it seems that way. So we'll just go on. Uh, we'll be starting short. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So hello Hello, everyone. Hello. So 
So good afternoon, everyone. All right, so Is somewhere I've been from Federal University of Technology. Okay. So, um, I'm, I'm a student from the Department of So, I my expectations this program, this event, is that I wish, I mean, I want to do strategies on how to be creative. Um, innovative and uh, learn more about life. Then I'm a graphic designer. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Chukunikagulon from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Part 11. Um, I'm a student leader and also um, a marketing strategist. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Yoruwa Oroka, and then I'm from the Federal University of Technology. I graduated recently from Electrical and Electrics Engineering Department. So my expectations for this are to learn with on our um launch my Creative product or a creative product. Thank you so much. Please just give me a round of applause for on today. I start on science call. My name is Jyoti. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emmanuel, student of Futa. My expectation, well, I, such a I hope to learn uh, research and innovation. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is um, I graduated from very recently. So, 
my expectation for today's um, event, I hope to learn some things uh, before. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Bala Dilengwa. Thank you so much. Um, honestly, The expectations from the room are all amazing. We have to go down to learn new things, global opportunities, want to have fun, and I'm sure um, we have a lot of expectations for the event. So um, before we um, call on on our, oh, sorry, yes, before we call on on our um, CEO, have one more. That's a breakout session. So, okay, so how did you hear about the events? Um, is it online? Is it through an association? Um, just how did you hear about the events? Yourself also then hear about the event. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Pivo from the Federal of Technology at Kure. My, my engineering department, 300 level. Um, actually, I'm a front end developer and also um, I'm a tech editor research. I'm into research, innovative research. So I got to know about this program on Futabro status. So, yeah, Futabro. I just checked yesterday and I saw the research. That was a place to come. Let's give him a round of applause. Uh, I guess you're ready. Afternoon. The program runs by a team. So I heard about the event from a departmental mate of mine, but it's not around. Yeah. Let's give her a round of applause. All right. Uh, yes. Hello, my name is Ayodeji. I heard about the program. Yeah, on WhatsApp or Facebook. I think I saw it on a, in a Facebook, in a WhatsApp group. Okay, yes, in a WhatsApp group. That's how I heard about the program. Thank you. Please let's give it hope or let's like clap for him. So um, while we are still waiting, do you get questions for any questions at all that you'd like to have before we start the event? Yes, it's going to be QA after session. Sessions and hall. Have any questions now? I don't think okay, so um, let's keep the question for now. We'll do that. Behind. Let's officially welcome and introduce the CEO of the Growth Hub and also Sales Flat, Mr. Victor Latunde. All right, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah. I'm just gonna do a little introduction about what we're trying to achieve, and then we'll just go right straight. We're already about um, about thirty minutes late, so um, like I said, Victor Latunde is the name, and um, I happen to lead the growth hub. One of the major challenges that we have seen is the fact that uh, we are having a lot of graduates that are leaving the universities and you know, not being employable, that's one. But number two, um, 
by the time to go to the universities themselves, you observe something. That is the fact that you know a final year student wants to do a project, and then the supervisor just looks for one topic from somewhere and just gives about five of them very crazy topics to go and do the research. So many times it is the lecturer that understands the topic. The student that is actually doing the research himself is lost. I mean, how many of us can relate here yeah, to an extent? So you have a situation whereby there is people are just doing research just for doing sake. Are we together? They just do it. Um, you know, nobody cares if their research actually makes sense or not. But uh, when I was an undergraduate, it wasn't like that for me because I had a supervisor that was an industrialist. So every project he gave me to do, they were real life problems. So I think I built my first machine in 300 level, a sugarcane juice extractor. It was a real problem until today, in fact, and that's the other side of the conversation today, how to commercialize many of those things. Imagine that we have in our houses sugarcane juice extractors. Many of us will take sugarcane more than we take it. The reason many of us don't take sugarcane today is because the way it affects your mouth. But I built that machine 2008 that could solve that problem, and it really worked. Uh, 2011, um, I built my first yam pounding machine, also 2011. We are still importing the majority of the ones in the Nigerian market today. Um, same 2011, I built cassava peeling machines to peel cassava. And it really worked. I built three models. And my supervisor went ahead to commercialize the best. You know, he, he actually like improved on my own model and did about one or two after that. To the point where I think he made millions on doing cassava peeling machine. When I did my master's project, he asked me to choose a topic. I said, she just give me a reasonable problem to solve. And um, that time, and even till now, we're still importing. I mean, there was an aquaculture. Okay, none of us here. But in aquaculture, there's something they call fish feed. So majority of the ones that can float on water, we import them from Israel and other places. But he gave me the problem to solve. And I built a machine from scratch. Nigeria, floating fish feed. I really float for about 24 hours and commercialize it. But the same Nigerian issues. We built that machine and it is now like, a, what is it, like an artifact in the department there in you know, Futa. What could have actually brought maybe Futa to become to have Futa fish feed? You know, because we won 10 million way back 2014 to commercialize it. So uh, but I've always asked my supervisors another, why are we not innovative? Why do our researches end on the thesis paper? Why don't we have someone that can create something that can go ahead to become a very big business? How many of us know OpNepa app? Some of us might be familiar with OpNepa. So the founder of OpNepa is going to be speaking here today. Because when he was on campus, he loved GIS. And it created OpNepa, and it really solved problem for many people. Because when you're in Obanla, you're using OpNepa to know whether there's light at Obakekere. And that little project of, I think he's gonna to talk to us about it when they get to their panel, has become something amazing. No longer OpNepa app, Milsat Technologies is now maybe one of the top 10 in the country in GIS solutions, right from campus. So if people like that could build solutions, I believe that many students and many researchers on campus can actually build amazing solutions that can go global, just like he has gone global now. And you know, we are still doing much more work together. So the goal of this conference is not just another you know, gathering. It is tilted towards research and business. So you're going to be learning about business and you're going to be learning about research. So it is more like the meeting point between the academia and the business world. 
are we together? So, and this is why we need to have, you know, and don't be discouraged about the physical number. It is both virtual and physical. So a good number of people are virtual on YouTube right now as we speak. And then we have the physical sessions as well. So the Campus Innovation Labs is what we're establishing across campuses to actually bridge the gap between academics and industry. So we're going to be incubating people that have ideas to become business within six months. And those that are researchers, university lecturers, actually want to ensure that their research becomes a reasonable business. We're going to be incubating them as well so that that person that builds you know, uh, a solar system or a whatever system as their final year, but their master's or PhD projects, or even normal research work, they can build reasonable businesses out of it. All of us, how many of us are on Facebook? All right. Facebook started from a dorm room, from a university room. I know it is easy to give that example, but the truth is, I have our own physical examples right here. I started my first business on campus. And as of today, I think if you Google my name, Google easily it easily tells stories about us. We have a lot of things that have been said about us, a lot of awards, a lot of businesses. If I didn't start way back, I honestly may not be on this path, you know. And I was so good enough that way back 2014, I was being offered a 400,000 era job per month and I rejected it. Way back 2014, you know. So how good can you become? while on campus. So welcome to the Campus Innovations and Innovators Summit. I use this to welcome you because it's going to be an amazing time here. And I hope that you're going to gain a lot as we go on in this conversation. So thank you once again for coming around. Um, I'll hand over to Taufika now to take us on. Thank you. Let's give him one thing. All right. So um, I do hope we meet up to your expectations and yeah let's just move on to the next session so the next session is going to be a virtual panel session and the topic is exploring passion and innovation mindsets while on campus exploring passion and innovative or innovation mindset while on campus and um, the moderator for this session So um, this is going to be a virtual panel session. And the speakers are Taslim Saludin, Eitemi, Eitemi, Egbejule, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and Ademola Morebise. Yes. So the moderator um, is Oinda Mola. Moderator. Let's give it up for moderator, please. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adi Bayo in So I'm the moderator for this particular virtual panel session, which is exploring passion and innovation mindset while on campus. So here with us, we have Aitemi, we have Adi Damola, and we also have Teslim. So you are welcome to this Google Meet. Hi, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So I believe we can go on, right? OK. So I just have a few questions for you here, because we have limited time. So we are discussing on exploring passion and innovation mindset while on campus. And um, from what I heard, I heard that um, Mr. Teslim, you started using GIS to build up a while on campus. That's something very interesting. And uh, Mr. Itemi, you started your tech journey while in school. As started Amola, you started building web platforms. Please, my, my name is Ademola Murebishi. Can you hear me on ground? Ademola, sorry, sorry for that mistake. Yes. Yes, so, Murebishi, thank you. 
first question is, did you discover what your passion is while on campus or after you left? Uh, what are you asking okay. first? Mr. Ademola, the question is directed to you. Did you discover what your passion okay. was while on campus or after you left? Funny enough, I don't like using that word passion, right? Um, it's uh, for some business I won't get into. So let me answer your question this way. So for me, I was already uh, coding even before I got on campus, right? So for me, I just, um, for me, it was like this. I asked myself, what would the future look like? Nobody knows tomorrow, granted. But what could the future look like? So for me, for my POV then, um, I actually applied for, to come to Futa to study um, electrical electronic engineering, but then I was admitted to physics electronics um, physics electronics department. So for me, there was this initial disconnect, right? Like, okay, physics, what do you do with physics? I, I didn't have the understanding I had now. I didn't have it back then. So, but for me, what did I have already? So I had this coding thing. I love solving problems. I love coding. I felt tech was the future and all of that. So I already had that background coming on campus. So on campus for me, it was just to do more of that, right? To explore and see what we can do, what we already have. So for me, it was just about having that mentality, right? And just going down that path. So when you talk about discovering passions, right? I think that um, anybody, um, let me, let me, I don't make a general statement, okay? Anyway, other speakers, I also bring their, I trust they also bring their perspective to the table. So from my own personal perspective, I think anybody out there worried about passion, I'm looking for my passion, I'm looking for my purpose, I don't know what my passion is, I don't know what purpose is, don't sweat it, all right? Don't sweat it. Just engage with as many things as you can, all right? Try many things, try everything, okay? So if any of them fascinates you, engage on a deeper level. As you continue to engage, eventually you get to what we call mastery. Once you master anything, Baba, that's your passion. <laughs> so that's the best way I can explain that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So, Mr. Oh, frozen. Are we still connected? Yes, yes but, whatever uh, um, up there, pa, as at now. Yeah, we are connected. Mr. Um, Sorry, I, I didn't get your question. Good afternoon. Okay, I said I used to doing your project up Nepal. Why still I <laughs> to the project as now? Okay. Um. So if your question was if I'm still running up Nepal, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. So um, the context behind up Nepal, yeah, that's still running. Uh, because so far so good, uh, we've done a lot in terms of um, collecting data that you can find on Google, right? Uh, I think in the last three years, we've worked with the Nigerian government to process over a hundred and a uh, hundred million data set, right? And this is way beyond what OpenPAR is. Uh, but in terms of the OpenPAR power tracking context, we um, find it, we found a niche that that would generate revenue. Um, because the campus showed the possibilities, uh, but the business model will not thrive in a campus unless it's a um, kind of an impact project. Uh, I remember we covered about seven campus in Nigeria at that point in time, and then we shifted into high-end B2B, like GIZ and uh, some other large companies that want to track their own power supply across all their offices while their headquarters is in, like, in Germany and the likes. So we give them a service and then they paid for it in a very nice way. So, so it's still running, and uh, I think just of recent, of a recent, the team decided to roll about some few hundreds of devices across the country because of this new band A, band B thing crisis. So we thought of rolling it out massively again, and uh, so people can see their data about their community and use it for reference purpose when trying to fight with the discos. Yeah, yeah. So expect something very soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Sir. That's it's nice to hear that you are still running off the bar. So uh, the question here I have is for three of you. So I think we can go in the order of Mr. Teslin first, Mr. Itemi, and Mr. Ademola. So um, I would like if you can give me just three bullet points, three bullet points on how to discover what we need to be. 
like what would it be a little bit of passion i have things i want to do can you give us three bullet points for us to actually determine and understand that yes this is what i want to do this is what i want to go for did you, did you say how to discover <laughs> your passion did you say how to discover your passion whatever what you said I said I three bullet points on how to discover your passion okay. what would you do as a student can i what uh, can i do now okay okay um three bullet points to discover your passion uh the first thing is that uh three bullet point that's quite short don't stay inside your lodge yes <laughs> uh go out right go out go out and find people that if you have no idea what you want to do with your life right find people that are doing something with their life first and we just observe them and see why are these guys so serious with this thing just be with them right there is this vibration there is this energy that would come around you also that you would find find your yours very soon that's the first bullet point the second one is trust me money is not your problem first of all if you think you are busy every day of your life you get more busier trust me you have yeah yeah you are most you are most you are the other english you are most free in quotes right now on campus than you would be after you finish school right so i would say you should uh um unless your available time right and it, don't see it as i have zero and i can't do something i'll give you a scenario my first business on campus was to sell i started selling data i kept my money for one month to buy five thousand dollars data and start selling it and whenever i made profit i bought more data to learn youtube video and how to write android java and yes i made my first 100k in less than one month so the thing here is that your your cycle that you mingle with in campus is very important it's, it's not like number one but yeah, i'll put that number two also your network cycle you mingle with is very mm -hmm. If you meet with people that watch ball, play ball, everything alone, trust me, you would have a nice time, but time, time, time will pass you by. Go to people that do things that amazes you and join them and volunteer, join them, do something too. If they're doing an event program, go and join them to do the event program. You will see one or two, you'll meet people. And the third point will be your success, no matter what, even now and later on after campus, is people. The people you meet now that are serious, in five years' time, they'll be in different people. They are the same guys you be calling Alpha. I have this deal for you. Alpha, my my networks in school. I think the one I still call for like high end deals right now because I trust them the most because we built together, we grew together. There's high trust there. So if you if you if you 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 don't have long leg from your family normally, eh, and you still can play with people that are in your same category, you have much problem. You know people that are, that you see that are in the same line of potential growth that you are willing to have learn with them build with them when you are done with campus you'll find them very useful that's all thank you okay thank you very much sir so um mr itemi are you there with me yes so i would like to ask you were you involved in any extra curriculum activities or organization while in school uh i think quite a lot maybe a lot more than my actual school work uh yeah a lot so i think right from my pre-degree days, so I did pre-degree years uh, before. Uh, so pre right from pre-degree days, I was already involved, right? So right from a uh, fellowship, I had already gotten involved with different units across fellowship, helping to build stuff. Oh, so before I came to school, I was already coding, right? So I was already working, working full-time before I even came to school. So right from when I was 14, 15, I was already working as a programmer. Uh, yeah, as so when I came to school, I was already looking for avenues to deploy these already existing skill sets into and it manifested in volunteering. So volunteering a fellowship, uh, designing posters, building stuff, um, doing assignments for people. And so uh, all of this opened me up to a network of various tech communities across campus. And I think that's where I met uh, Ademola Murebeshe, uh, GDG, I think this was 2011. So yeah, uh, and GDG, expanded my network further right because i met like-minded people people who were also involved in various communities across uh design community was on one hand so then i was doing designs for jccf 
and fellowships across campus, right? And I decided to pivot to doing uh, 3D designs. I met two of my mentors sort of in the design community at GDG. Uh, on the other hand as well, I met people who were in my department but years ahead, and they also involved me in the community. So there's a particular community. It, was, it didn't really have a name per se, but just a bunch of people who gathered together and would go to engineering building to work overnight, right? Uh, but the goal was try to write code at least 15 minutes every day. Okay. So now, out of this... Sorry? Okay, sorry. I said, out of all these plenty of activities you were involved in, so how do you think, how did you balance it up, like, as a student? How do you balance all this and then be able to come out well? And hmm. I all see that, yes, you are doing well. Uh, before I directly answer the question, I would say you have to define personally what success means to you. Right? That when you have a personal definition of success, then you can proceed about how to balance. I did a very bad job of balancing school work with uh every writing i did right uh because well i got into the third class and an extra year so i did very very terrible job of balancing up but it's just that quite early i had defined what i wanted out of life what i wanted success to mean to me right and so i didn't really pay attention to school i said well i had a bunch of issues well but there are terrible excuses it's just i didn't do a good job of balancing so once you define what success means to you, you need to find a way to now balance that idea of success you have, what you're currently doing, and what you aim to get out of school. All right. Uh, while, while it looks like I have achieved success to a great deal, really, uh, I've been finding it difficult to get back into academia. I've been wanting to do a PhD for a while, but it's been quite difficult given my undergraduate degree. So, it's wanting to define success to be excellent at what you want to do. So, for example, if you want to be a programmer, you want to build a excellent startup solving very important problems, right? But you also need to focus on graduating, which is your core responsibility being in the school environment. Focus on graduating and just graduating, graduating with good grades. Yeah, so that's up to you. First thing, take up what your differential success is. Take up your uh, what you're working on right now that looks like your passion, and then find a perfect blend to all three of it: school, that thing you're passionate about, and your definition of success. Thank you very much, sir. So my last question for this panel session is: uh, I think, Mr. Ademola, you can answer this first, and every other person can answer. So, student okay. needs money. Yes, so student needs money. Everybody is always after money, 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 money. Yet, passion and innovation is essential. So can students go for both right from campus? And how can they do that? And so I think at the very basic, you have to learn before you can end. Um, I think the greatest thing you are doing, whatever it is you are doing on campus, is, trust me, you're not making money from it. Uh, of course, your mileage would vary, but my argument is simple. So you have to learn before you can earn. When you're on campus, you are trying to, a, a campus is like a mini society, right? Basically, you are there, you have figured, you, are, you have this ecosystem you're interacting with. So can you hear me? Can I keep going? Is that a problem? Yes, I can keep going. Can I keep going? OK, yes, thank sir. you. So I was saying that um, when you're on campus as a student, right, you want to explore your passions, you want to innovate and all of that. These things take money and all of that. You can't make a decision to start making money as your primary goal in the university. And that's because the basic truth is that you have to um, learn before you can earn. So the idea is that learn as much as you can in school. This is how I figure out, this, this is my approach to these matters, right? I believe that, like I said, I said, I don't believe in you saying you have a passion for something. My passion is writing. My passion is cooking. Forget that thing. Interact with everything you can find on campus. When I was on campus, once there's any, so far it is a free event. I'm there. I don't even mind. The topic doesn't matter. So far it's a free event. Women have been a graduate there. They want to talk. Let me go and listen. I might find an idea that will do my life good. So I don't sit at home saying, uh, what are they doing there? Don't talk about um, catfish. I don't do catfish. What do, do I, I don't even know myself. 
bottom line. So interact with as many as you can interact with. Some of them will resonate with you. Explore further. And if in the process of exploring, you find things you really like, you now find your passion and all of that. So that needs to be at the at, at the at your mind because if you are looking for money too early in life, first of all, you won't get the money. Secondly, you waste a lot of time. So you want to ideally, you want to try a bunch of things. That's why on campus, I didn't do one or two things. I did a lot of things. I I, I must have built and tried nearly um, at least seven to eight platforms on campus, including a social media website. That was the most popular one called Gscaster. Later, I did G160. Um, I was talking about how we, I was talking about how we met at the GDG program. I remember the face from the first, I was like, I know this face, you know, from back then. <laughs> you know, I met a slim to doing uh, one project like that, you know. Just try, not, I tried a lot of things basically, because the goal is not to make money first. The goal is to learn, the goal is to get skilled. When you have the skills, when, you are, when you've learned, then as you get out of school and all of that, you can begin to now um, slim down your life. Now it's time to concentrate. It's time to now pick up, pick on two, three things you want to explore further. But if you try that too early in life, you won't get far in all of these things. So I want to say it's not the money first, it's those skills first and all of that. You want to learn, get all those things, master them, then you can begin to make good money, you know, as you, as you uh, finalize that part of your life. So I think that is the best advice I would advise anybody right now. That's like an optimal approach to uh, this problem. So, but of course, bear in mind that after school, you can't take as much risk as possible anymore. When you talk about risk taking and all of that, now is the time you can take risk because now, at least all things being equal, uh, some people have to sponsor their parents even though they are in school. We have to acknowledge that. I'm always grateful for my privileges. My dad wasn't a billionaire, I wasn't a millionaire, but at least, you know, they, were, they paid my school fees and I was relatively able to get funds to go from month to month. So I didn't have to do uh, sell bread or do all jobs on campus to, to make it. I didn't have to do that, right? And that's a privilege, even though it doesn't look big and all of that. So some people might not be privileged to even say they're experimenting with ideas on campus and they really have to make money. So I respect that and I acknowledge that possibility. But, all the, but that being said, understand that all things being equal, when you're on campus, your life is a non-profit, an NGO funded by your parents, your guardian, your sponsors, and all of that. But when you get out of out of campus, your NYC, yes, post NYC, your life now becomes a for-profit that you are going to fund. So if you don't have to fund your life right now, don't kill yourself looking for money. Learn as much as you can. Explore everything. Get good. Get skilled. Then your post-campus is when your life changes and now you have to make money, you have a lot of skills, you can now actually make money. So that is how I think about the old making money um, argument. I would like a, a, me to add some um, you know, context to that. Hmm. My approach is a little bit different. It's, well, I agree to a lot of what he said already, but the slight difference is I try to be practical as much as possible. And uh, I would say what well, for me on campus, I found something that was high impact, low intensity or low effort way to make money. And I was doing that to keep the bills running while trying my hand on other things. And for me, it was repairing computers. I repaired a lot of computers on campus. Okay. I did uh, help people to install operating systems, right? I was the guy that everybody wanted to install Linux came to in my years. I was the one who people came to when they had virus on their computer and they needed to clean it up. So that was very low activity, low intensity way of making money right while i was focusing on learning other things so yes while you're trying to count your 1000 sorry is it 10,000 10, hours uh yeah, <laughs> why i try to count it and i also don't believe you have to count 10,000 hours on one single thing it can be across multiple things but while you're trying to count it you should also be looking for something very low effort low uh, that, that, that's why i had the context that for me my dad wasn't a billionaire but at least i was getting 5k 10k every month to keep all the answers together. So I didn't have to make money on campus. So I, I, of course, I had web design skills. I was getting projects, making some money, putting it, you know, and all of it. So that's definitely is part of the conversation. Uh, that thing's raising his hand, ma. OK, so what do okay. um, I want to just add something quickly, right? Um, I resonate with a lot that um, AHME and uh, Mr. Ademola has mentioned. But I, I want to give some people fair warning ahead of time, right? Hungry men don't dream, right? If you're hungry, trust me, you're gonna find money to eat. <laughs> but, 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 uh, um, Mr. Atemi mentioned what I wanted to say. 
personally for me, like I mentioned in my in my part of discussion, I really have, I really have much money for my for my parents every month. But I had to like literally start for like one month. Because I know I, I need to buy data to learn. You need data to learn on your laptop, right? So so and first of all, I didn't have a laptop at first. You wonder how I got a laptop, right? That, that that's a very different story entirely because I took from a good friend as a loan. And I, I, I learned it from him for, I, I, I don't know, I'll pay in three months. In that first month, I now went to find one gig. I said they did to, to pay me half of that money. So it was a very, very funny story, right? Which is, I can't say right here. But the point is that you have to have at the background of your mind that if you don't have good financial um, source, figure out a way you can do some side also. Plan your plan your, your, your time well. One thing, if you are finding for first class, please, I, will, I recommend you read your book very well, right? Don't worry. Like in my own case, some of my colleagues that go first class, I end up working with them and implementing my company trial. But the thing is that everything plays out at, at the end. I didn't pursue first class on my own, even though I love my books. But I was there learning my code in the SUB every day. And as I'm going to read my book in during the exam period. No, like um, ATM said, plan, define your success. This just mean to you that my success to me was that I want to have I want to apply what I study geography in reality and make money from it, and I want to make my first one million five if I leave school. That's my own objective. Someone someone own success was I want to get first class. Our own way of doing it will be very different. So define your 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 success and don't be very don't be too extravagant. Look and say you want to make one billion in, in campus. You cannot you cannot do that. So be be realistic, right? I, I, I wanted to say that because the moderator did make it clear how much money we are talking about. If you're yeah. talking about once someone to make money, if it's billion, million, forget that thing. Make enough to keep body and soul together. Maybe 150k, 300k a month or something. But if, you're, if you want to parallel making money on campus, you're going to, you will not learn certain things you need to learn. That's my point. Just, you know? Exactly, exactly. So, because if you don't have, it's what it is. see it this way, your average your average cost of your hour of your time, no, that's too complex to explain. The, the more value you, you get in upstairs, the more people will pay you for that value. So if if you don't improve your upstairs value, you will not be paid very high. So you are you must learn more than you earn actually on campus. Because of course your parents will not leave you just to be idle. Yeah. So so yeah. figure out a way to have some people in small small. And you have friends that will support you in your hostel. You can eat together, you can play together and everything. But don't prioritize <laughs> making a billion and then learning something small because, because it will never work that way, per se. Learn more. Okay, thank you very much, yeah. sir. Yeah, thank you very much. No yeah, thank you very much. Yes, so I'm going to ask from the audience if any of them have questions. I'm going to permit for two questions. So do anybody have questions in the audience? Do you have questions for any of them? You didn't show us the audience, so. Cameraman, show us audience now. Alpha now. <laughs> Uh -huh. Thank okay. you, brother. Uh -huh. yes. So please, if you ah, have my gas on Cito, hey. <laughs> please, if you have any question, can you please identify? Okay, there's no question. So um, this will be the end of the panelist section. So thank, thank you, you very for much us. for having us. Uh, sorry, before you end, I just want to say one very last minute thing, right? So in 2013, I got an advice from someone. 2012, 2018, I got an advice from someone, and they said, "Whatever you do, make sure to do at least 15 minutes of it every single day, right?" And that there is nobody. Well, another person said to my pastor then in school, said, uh, "Nobody's as consistent as the devil. The devil is very consistent, and that's why he's successful in the game, right?" So you should aim to be more consistent than the devil, because the devil is always disturbing you, trying to get you to fall asleep. So you should be consistent in whatever you choose to do, right? Pick just one habit, get a habit tracker app and log it every day. The consistency, consistency of even logging it every day is enough to propel you to success. So I think that's just final part of things. Just be uh, consistent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really appreciate and really enjoyed this section with you guys. Thank you very much. All right, cheers. All right, so please let's give them a round of applause once again. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. Please, please say no. All right, so the next physical, um, the next session is a physical panel session. 
and it is how to build a successful enterprise from campus. Let me take that one taking. So um, the physical panel session is how to build a successful enterprise from campus. So I'll be inviting the speaker and the moderator for this session. Um, the first speaker is Damilola Mogaji. Please let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. The next speaker is Shay David. Then the last speaker is Triumph. Okay. All right. So, and the moderator for this session is Oluwa Lonimi. Please let's give it up for her. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, our, our panelists. We are glad to have you here. So we have a um, few questions for you. And this section, like she rightly said, how to build a successful enterprise from campus. Asking Mr. Sheyi, do you think a global brand can be built from campus, either by a student or by a researcher? Check. All right. Thank you. Um, first, I want to appreciate you for having me here on the panel. Yes, so right to the question, so we don't wait too much time. Of course, a global brand can be built. We've seen it. We have a lot of evidence was right by uh, Mark Zuckerberg and um, there are several other businesses or startups that started from campus and they are global brands today so also you asked for um, the research okay I would like you to quickly this is just okay, you know, on campus, right? We have um, students on campus, we have people that are researching, basically, people that are, I think, more people that are doing their PhDs, lecturers, you know, I think institutions and all. So, do you think that we can actually build a global brand from campus? Yes, yes. Either Her a student or a researcher? Oh, yes, yes, very much well. I, I think that there are a lot of, I can't pinpoint one right now, but. Uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of um, researchers who have built uh, um, businesses or startups or ventures from campus, uh, right, within their campus. Because also the campus gives you the environment to, uh, I mean, access resources for your research, right? Things that you may not be uh, have the capacity to um, bring up on your own. So you have research labs and different campuses that you can leverage on to actually uh, build your uh, whatever you're doing in your research. So yes, brands can be built from uh, the campus. Global brands can be built from the campus. All right, thank you very much, sir. So the next question will be going to Mr. Damilola. What are the crucial first steps for students or faculty looking to transform their innovative ideas developed on campus into a viable enterprise? So the first thing that I always say is be solution oriented. So you identify a problem, right? And you build something to solve that problem. Maybe a product, maybe a business model, right? You don't want to just build because you, you didn't build because you just want to build. You are building because you identified the problem. The first thing is make sure that your drive is solution to that problem so you can see it through for example i'll use myself as an example i'm currently building two um, companies right now spark up and Novet africa and the reason why i'm building them is to solve a major problem in the society i'm not giving up on text i see those problems solved. so the first thing is you want to solve a problem and you are determined to see that problem solved the second thing is Business is key. I mean, any problem you're solving, money is important, right? So 
how do I make money from this business or this solution that I'm building? That is very, very important. You have to figure out that. And one of the main factors that it's one of the main factors that investors and um, investors majorly look forward to, right? It's one of the factors that they consider before they give you their cash. How do you make money? If, I mean, you are passionate. We, we love your innovation, but how do you want to make money with this? So it's very important. Make sure that what drives you is the problem. You are determined to see that problem through and through, right? And you are sure how you want to make money. I mean, from scratch, the business model is clear. You are sure as regarding profitability. And I think the last thing, which I think is major, honestly, get mentored. One of the things uh, I've been engaging in the undergraduate space actively um, for more than five years now. And one of the things I've discovered to be a bottleneck is experience deficit. It's one of the major reasons why campus ventures, campus products don't scale. Students don't have experience. You have passion, you have the drive, right? But you don't have the experience. You can mitigate um, experience deficits with mentorship. I mean, I don't rely totally on just the knowledge that I have and the passion that I have about the ecosystem or about the solution that I'm building. I rely on the experience of some of my mentors. When I'm stuck, I'm confident reaching out to them and asking them genuine questions, right? And they are able to provide guidance because the truth is you need guidance as a student to be able to build a solution that can scale. I hope that answers the question. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So basically, what is said, I can just wrap it up with a quote, PPM. Problem, identify a problem. Profit, how do you plan to make profit? And then get mentorship or mentoring. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. So the next question will be going to um, the only lady aside me. What are the biggest challenges you've seen that students have in trying to build from campuses? And how do you think they can navigate them? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here. So um, for the challenges that seen students navigate while you're trying to build businesses on campus, right? That's the question. Yeah. Okay. So I think one of the major challenges I've seen uh, with students trying to build businesses on campus is, I think I'll just coin it out as capacity building. So what I mean in context is you're trying to build a business on campus, but you don't know how to navigate your way. There are no um, programs, there are no capacity building programs on campus or definitely you're in school to learn. So they're not going to teach you how to build a business in CSE 101 or AMTS 202, for example. So it, this is where the um, programs that are organized on campus come in play. So that's to fill that gap of capacity building as a challenge. There's, there's not enough programs that students can plunge into and say, okay, this particular program or this particular fellowship is for students, entrepreneurs, right? That kind of thing is one of the challenges that students face because it's one thing to have an idea to be a business. It's another thing to see how do I go about implementing or executing this idea that I have. I know I want to have this fashion brand on campus. I'm a good tailor. I learned to sew after SS3. But how do I now move from just being a tailor to having a fashion brand as a student? So you need that capacity building to take you from that state of your idea to execution to build a brand that can scale. That's one thing I think face. Another challenge I would say students face is funding. And I feel this is for students that have started business. So when I say funding is so, for example, still in my fashion entrepreneur business, I have a fashion brand. It's me, just a hypothetical example. So, let's say I'm a student, I have a fashion brand, right? And I'm looking to scale. Look, I'm tired of sewing from that seller who sells. I want to start sewing for people that are outside of the student environment. I mean, it's pretty good. I can do your bridal store for you. I want to move out of there, but I don't have anyone to scale. And I think this is where ships come in. So, I know a particular student that graduated Futa some three years ago. And she got into the Illuminati Foundation as a student, and it really made the business book. That was a turning point for our business. She was a Fulterian, and she got that. So that funding really pushed that business from just being a normal DCC. Right now, she launched that company, and that was a really good thing for her business. So she gave her that opportunity from the Illuminati, went to other fellowships and other stuff. So I think capacity building and funding are two like major problems that students face, and these are ways that can um, 
challenges. Thank you very much, ma'am. That that was really beautiful. Capacity building. I personally think every other thing still boils down to capacity building, accessing funding, grants, everything boils down to capacity building. That was really nice. Okay, so um, because of time, we are going to have to like speed up. So the questions I'll be asking now will just take like one minute to talk about them. So the next questions will be going to Mr. Shei David. Would you mind sharing some examples of successful enterprises that originated from campus environments, maybe globally, and at some point, you want us to note in how they built? So basically, we are asking if you know about um, successful enterprises that started from um, campuses, you know, and then sharing with us how they actually started, how they got to wherever it is they are now, like a recap, something like that. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I would also be practical about this. And first thing to notice, uh, maybe I would not talk about the enterprise. I'll talk about the entrepreneurs, the people who actually built those enterprises. Because one thing is you should take note of as students is that what you start off with on campus might not eventually be what you will end up um, building, right? And what you will end up going into. I'm a practical example. I'll start myself, right? So I started up on campus. Oh, even before I got on campus, I started making shoes. And when I got into campus, so you must understand that you, you are on a journey. And your journey needs your deliberateness and understanding that you are actually on this journey. So I was on that journey. I got to when I was in three, 200 level second semester, I think. Um, I had a job from Abuja, a mass order of food choice. And while working at night one day, of course, go to class in the day, during the day and come back to work at night, I became tired. And I didn't mean, I'm not talking about physical tiredness. I was like tired of the whole process of um, what I was doing. And um, it's not because what I was doing was not um, going well, but I needed something extra. I knew that shoemaking was not what I wanted to do with my life right but i understood also that it was a journey for me to learn different things so it propelled me and uh, I, I began to work on other things like she said capacity building it's key it's very core of everything that you need to do as a student so um eventually i would not bore you with uh because of time there's a lot of story around it so i became what you call non-academic student of the federal university of technology and why is that because eventually, as I was a lot, I became a student lecturer in 300 level. So I was lecturing EMT students, EMT 302. Hello, Futurians, uh, you are here, right? So there's this course, of course, you know EMT 302. And then uh, I went for a competition. I think Taslim was in that competition. So the second person I'll talk about is Taslim uh, on that, where he introduced, that was when he introduced OpNepa app, right? So Teslim is still in the industry today of geospatial, geo um, whatever he's doing currently. And he's a big name in Nigeria, not in Akure, in Nigeria, and of course in Africa, right? So um, those are examples. So I got into um, Center for Entrepreneurship and uh, as a shoe uh, maker teacher, right? I was teaching my mates how to make shoes. So, Eventually, that transitioned me into becoming an enterprise developer because while I was teaching them shoemaking, I was not just teaching them shoemaking, I was teaching them business, right? Because I started shoemaking since in pre-degree. So there was a trajectory I was on. I had left the space of skill development, right, of shoemaking into the enterprise part of it by the time I was engaged by um, the Center for Entrepreneurship. So that transitioned me into becoming an enterprise developer, amongst many other things, which I'm sorry would not permit me to talk about. And eventually, by the time I was leaving Futa, I had left shoemaking that, to the extent that when I go back campus, still the highest ever, with over 4,000 audience at 2.5 auditorium. And that was in 300 levels, second semester. As a student, you can I was- if you want to. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't, this is to tell you, I wasn't a course rep. That's like the lowest 
position you can hold right on campus not to talk of class rep or governor of any school i was just a regular student like most of us and i was engaged with the center for entrepreneurship because there was value in that stream and eventually when i finished i uh, i think before i finished uh, i started running evolve hub which was one of the first hubs in ondo state right one of the first hub in ondo state today we are continually running at a point we shut down and then we are we're back right and today i am head of entrepreneurship development for the ondo state entrepreneurship agency it wasn't my certificate that got me there right so this is to tell you that uh there are several or there are a lot of them there's this person also we were in that competition together and i also say please build meaningful relationship they are okay. in the uk now sorry just it's called main stack you can check them out ayobami it's called main stack he also started on campus he built a platform called placement.com for IT students on campus. And that trajectory was what he was on till now. They are, they are funded, like huge funding, main stack, like just like pay stack, right? Main stack for, uh, I, I can't really remember what it is for, but pay, uh, main stack, you can check them, out, right? They started also from Futa. Taslim is also uh, one of the people I know in that. Uh, there a, a lot of other people. Um, Ulushola Amuson. Uh, who is also now a uh, uh, vesti, right? There, there's a bunch of a whole lot of these guys. There's Quack 2 or something. This is a logistic company. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, so before we even proceed, and else this is for the audience. If you are tempted to clap, please don't hesitate to clap. Your hand is itching, like, just clap, okay? Because these are really inspiring people. Yeah, so that was just by the way. Um, Mr. Dami is prepared to answer the question, but we'll not be taking you this time around. You're you looking over prepared. Actually, so actually, I have to answer the question because you people are repping for that. Yeah. Um, so let me let me tell you about just two people, right? Two brands and two people that built from OAU, right? From Ife to the world, right? Um, okay. how many of you know Bumper? He recently raised four million and he said something. Most of them don't even scale what they built from campus, but they actually built something that gave them the capacity to build what was bigger outside campus. Bumper built a product called Kelvin Umejuku built, which is my mentor, and I'm proud to say it everywhere I go. Um, built a platform called Voice App, and it was um, utilized by over 4,000 students. So that gave them the confidence when they left school. His co founder also built a platform called Irepo AU. So they left the way you then. Um, and went to raise over four million dollars um last year how many of you know who they, they are now number right they started from OE. they built a product called Songo, and it didn't scale but they then actually was sent raised about well over six million dollars so yeah thank you that, that was a very beautiful addition thank you very much sir. thank you for not we told in it <laughs> all right so let's have miss okay and I'll be asking this question. We are still coming back to you, sir. Um, no, not the same question. We have a lot of students who are in school and they don't know what support structures are available for them, you know, in school. They, they have ideas. They don't know where they can go to, maybe for creation of their ideas or whatever the case may be. So the question here would address that. What support structures and resources are available within the campus ecosystem to nurture and facilitates the growth of student-led or faculty-led startups. Okay, so um, I think one of the most common support structures I'll mention is communities. And um, Atemi mentioned that when he was speaking, communities are one of the strongest structures that will ever exist in universities. And that's because nothing can wipe out communities. I mean, they don't need anybody's permission to exist on campus. So no politics, no VC can come to them and say, I don't want you on campus to get your permission in the first place to start. So communities are part of the strongest support structures we have on campus. And aside from just having a set of people that you have common interest with, what communities give you is access, right? Communities give you access to people, the kind of people that are in that community. If someone is coming to um, launch something in Accra, for example, or something for entrepreneurs, they're going to ask what communities do you have in, on campus. And when they get to reach out to those communities, you're going to be among the first people to know that 
something is coming, something is existing, or something is going to work out for us. So communities are one of the strongest support structures that would advise you to join. Find a community that aligns with what you are doing. Find a community that you can join and a community that supports your growth, right? Don't be in a community that you are just there and you are not growing. Find one that supports your growth. The other support structure I would say exists aside from communities is um, yeah, different kind of communities. And I would say co-working spaces, hubs, innovation hubs. They might not be located on campus, but they are located around you. That is where you begin to leave your primary ecosystem of campus and then interact with the outside ecosystem and say, okay, there are innovation hubs around us. There are co-working spaces around us. And these innovation hubs, these co-working spaces, they offer a lot and a lot of free stuff. For example, this is free. Nobody paid to be here today, right? So this is free. Imagine the people you will meet here today when you come. Imagine the people you will hear from when you come. Last month, I organized something. And because of the fact that I was in January, rather, because of the fact that I am a Futerian, I reached out to an ex Futerian at Google. My first reference was, hi, I'm an I saw you an ex Futerian. I'm also a Futerian. And I need this, 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 this. That common ground that we had, that we were both Futerians, he cleared out his schedule. He was supposed to be in work that morning. He cleared out the morning just to be there for the Futa community. And that was because I found out he was in GDG community when he was in Futa. And I'm currently leading the GDG community. So I was like, uh -uh, our community, two of us now, we're there together. So that was an access that community gave me to. Imagine mentioning someone randomly on LinkedIn. I've never met him in my life. That was my first message to him. So that community and also the innovation labs around, they offer a lot of stuff from co-working spaces to innovation programs, incubation programs, acceleration programs, access to funding, a lot of that. There are also research programs that go on on campus. They might not be as popular as communities or as popular as innovation hubs, but there are a lot of research programs that go on on campus. For example, in Futa, there's TechPIC, Technology Innovation Park. Most people don't know about it. It's right opposite CSC lab, CSC department there. And there are a lot of awesome stuff they are doing at TechPIC. I mean, it's an opportunity for you if you are into the research space to do stuff, right? Because you have access to resources from the um, university to carry out your research and all of that. So these are structures that I think are already existing in campus that can support your growth as either a student or an entrepreneur and all of that. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Like I said, if you want to clap, clap. Don't resist that temptation. All right. So basically what she's saying is don't be a loner. There are a lot of people that are here that are introverted. And they tell you, in their mind, they are like, this thing she's saying. She's right. Don't be a loner. Um, the next question will go to Mr. Dami. <laughs> it's looking like, let me see if you know me today. All right, so um, how do you think campus-based enterprises can navigate the challenges of funding and investment, especially in the early stages of development? Can I take a question again? This is, this is a problem that we have been advocating solution for a very long time. The truth is, um, the reality of um, campus venture building that most of the VCs um, perceive campus ventures as something not totally serious. And they are permitted to make such assumptions because of. I mean, like the experience thing that I mentioned earlier. But one major thing that I believe can solve the entire, we don't actually even need VC funding. Um, one of my very respected um, colleagues in the ecosystem wrote a book, um, Venture um, Capital. It's more of focusing on um, the future of Africa and how venture building can start on campus, Bam Deleto in Batel. I mean, and in the book, he wrote that most of the VCs out there are looking for um, ventures that will give them immediate returns. Campus investment would not give you immediate returns. It takes long to. So, this is what Damla Mogaji would always, would always advocate. I would say government and school need to start thinking of how to, and that is where um, part of the work that you do. Right with government, government needs to start thinking of how to make 
pond available for students to experiment because that is the kind of font that we need. We don't need rush me font where a VC gives you money and they expect returns in a year, six months, or three um three years. You should be able to get grants to actually build products. You should be able to get grants to actually try out ventures, right? Test the market. But the current structure for funding in the ecosystem is a serious structure that would be tough for undergraduate to and um I mean, I can give you all the English and just hope you that, oh, we can actually get this funding. But the truth is, in the reality of things, if you look at the factors that consider, um, that investors consider to actually give you this funding, we don't meet those criteria. But the government can actually mitigate that by actually providing funding for students to experiment. For, I mean, imagine that people like voice app had access to such funds it makes their building journey more easy and the truth is we would actually build that sense of um that we will be the experience eventually if there's funds to actually experiment and that is why um schools abroad mit and the likes can build from campus and scale the difference is that they have access to resources from campus we don't have access our own reality is that we are expecting venture cash to build from campus, and that will be tough. So government funds to mitigate that campus building, I believe that would work um, Thank you very well. So Thank much. you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Luckily, we have somebody representing the government here. So everything will be <laughs> saying. Governor Lucky, I that's why he's here. So we expect that very soon, before the end of this month, they should begin to work on <laughs> okay um thank you for raising that but i'll also drive your minds away from government <laughs> yes that is the truth um i am building a platform personally right or rather not building we are continuing a platform called entrepreneurs award and it's actually also to tackle what you just raised. The reason why I said I want to move your mind away from government is because even before I got into government, I understood the challenges that that can come up from. And it's called what we call the tenural system in Nigeria. A four year tenural system is not going to do good in building any structure, except we have policies that says. Whatever this government started of before this next government uh, can scrap it, it has to do this, 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 and this, right? And I'll give you a, an example, which we tried on campus, and it did not work. So while I was on campus, the then director for welfare in Futa um, called us together and some other guys to form uh, a tri-portrait, just like what Akure Tekov has now, and they are still having that challenge right a tripartite uh, agreement right so that we are able to form a, a an institution called vote vote means vocational team student vocational team on campus the idea was that we have students who can paint we have students who can weld we have students who can but the school whenever they want to renovate goes to call people from outside right so we want to sign up I have these skills, I have this, they can earn. So we call it also a learn, work, and earn scheme, right? Where students would then register um, under that body and they are able to now take up um, um, contracts from school, like plastering, like painting just that walkway or whatever, whatever, whenever they want to do uh, what's it called, convocation and footer, they always do this kind of renovations. Now, what happened? and advised them i remember advising saying that let us sit this um, body up on the three arms of the students which is number one the senate number two the student affairs division and number i mean that student affairs rather number two is um the student union government and number three is the center for entrepreneurship right because they are also going to help so that when 
a challenge in student affairs division. They cannot just come and say, okay, we're scrapping this. There has, has to be an agreement between the three bodies that that uh, uh, organization is sitting on to say, okay, we're scrapping it. When there's a student union coming in, you are not just sidelining it. And that's the same issue we are current. I'm sorry, should I say I'm sorry, to, to actually also bring it up. Now, the, the, there is, uh, a credit Corp was on track okay, we're going to, have to wrap up this session. with the government, the school, and the uh, partnership and innovation. Right now, partnership and innovation within the government sector is is shaking. It, 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 it's it's actually because with CETA, okay, I was actually thinking it was with partnership and innovation. So, but then, why did I not want, need to shift just in one minute of capping up? Shift this mindset is to say that every tenora system will always bring in new stuff, right? And since we don't have policies that drives that kind of uh, rearrangement. Whatever, whatever is being set up on it. Um, this is not also to say, this is also to note that whatever you want to bring in that regard, is either you strictly privatize it, right? Or you have it sitting on that tripartite agreement, the government, the private sector, and I don't know, maybe the organization or an individual that can actually then push it because every I mean, government have their own focus, they have their agenda. And all of that. So, why I'm pushing it back to us is that rise up, just like we are we are doing with NICE Awards, Nigerian Student Entrepreneurs Award, and create that system, right, where people can actually give back. So, what NICE Award is doing is to reach out to someone like uh, him to say that ah, we are we are in OAU, and you you are you are a product of OAU who is actually doing great. So, no matter how it is, whether you came out with last class or whatever it is, you are a product of that school. <laughs> and so you are doing very well in your industry right now. We want to connect you with startups or with uh, students in this, com I mean, in this institution that are in the line of what you are doing. Please come help us mentor them, not just mentor. A, a little hundred dollars can actually also help fund some of these, their ideas, right, to go that extent. Then partnership of course with centers like center for entrepreneurship development can actually really go a long way so thank you in a very nutshell, much, sir. do not depend on the thank government thank you very much we appreciate thank yeah. you very much sir. so basically you are trying to like create a community like she said of those that have gone ahead helping those that are coming you know those that are upcoming that, that's a very beautiful story. okay we don't really have much time do you still want them to answer questions all right so let's do it like this we have only three questions to go and please when you hear my voice just know that you just say thank you very much if you have other questions we'll be after the step. and give the mic to the next person so mr shayi david okay do we have questions from the audience oh two questions because i need a i need someone here Let's see your hands. We're not taking any other questions apart from these two. Are we clear? If you have other questions, you come and pay later for consultation. All right, let's have them. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much, panelists. That was a very insightful um, conversation. I have one suggestion and one question. So the suggestion first as to the question of um, policy tenure issues, like you mentioned, I, su I would suggest probably there should be more engagement with legislators because I feel when executives make policies, it tends to, I mean, it's normal in Nigeria, we are in Nigeria, but if we lobby more with legislators and you know, probably these policies get codified into law and the agencies probably, uh, to be funded, you know, uh, let's just say you have to fund these agencies, then probably we might see improvements in that regard. And to my question, um, I just want to ask again as to you are talking about building enterprise from a campus setting. Do I finished from school a few years ago, but I, there yeah, are students. We, 
you know, balance because they have caused greater pressures. Parents sent the children to school to learn, to study. And you are in school, your parents are, you are doing something else. How do you handle the prayer of moral law school or new first class or face business? I mean, someone mentioned he graduated with third class and all that. Some of us to our parents, they were on us that at least do one, you know, things like that. So how do you handle this prayer? Thank you very much. So who are you throwing this question to in particular? Okay, so we have a volunteer, Mr. Dami. So I have a cheat code, yeah? And everybody that has used this cheat code, it has worked. The reason why your parents are trying to tell you to do something is because they believe they know best and they want the best for you. So what you want to do is you want to give them the confidence that you know what you are doing. The first thing, see, your parents don't perceive you as somebody who is matured enough to make quality decisions. You will struggle with convincing them. So the first thing is make sure you're matured in the way you carry yourself around the house and the way you get results. The outcomes of your decisions, if they consistently generate quality results, trust me, your parents will trust you when you say, I think I want to do this. But if they don't trust you, they will argue it. And so far your parents have used it, trust me, you are going to have troubles. You need their support. So once you are able to like convince them that, hey, I know what I'm doing, you acknowledge their love for you. The truth is the reason why they are trying to tell you what to do is because they love you and they want the best for you. So you want to acknowledge, trust me, if you do those, those two things, first acknowledge that mommy, daddy, thank you so much for your content and your love. And respectfully communicate what you want to do. And trust me, African parents, they are done. I mean, they are good. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I really want to add to that. Okay. As somebody that has faced that issue, and I'm still facing the issue at the moment. So I want to, I remember something like when I got into campus, I attended a meeting that if you know Jeff Dow, Keeper, I think he has left Keeper now. He said something. He said that the fact that you are an entrepreneur on campus does not mean you cannot make a first class tip as a student, right? And I took that very personally. I knew that my parents sent me to campus first. I was disobeying them doing computer science. I chose to that intentionally because there's no medicine in school. First, they were angry with me on entering campus. Now I got to campus 200 days, but I told them that I'm doing tech. Second problem, right? So I I strived to make sure that I had a good result. So I knew when to focus on this is my tech life and this is school life. As best as possible, whenever I have a good result, first thing I'm doing, I will snap that sheet of paper. That is CEO and see the child. Tech is not affected. I will put my particular results in red like that. I like it and say my father. Immediately they put it. The A, 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 B. It's only one B I got this semester. It's only one C I got. I will try next semester. That kind of thing. So I respect the fact that they are caring for me in that aspect. And I'm also striving and making conscious efforts not to just take my academics. Like, okay, just play because I'm not making money in tech. Academics can go. They are paying my school fees, even though I have the money to pay my school fees, but they are still paying it because they feel they are responsible for me. So they are paying it and I owe it to them to say thank you for paying my school fees at the end of the semester. So you can also try that out. Wow. Thank you so much for that contribution. So basically, balance. Balance your work life and your school life. The next question, please. Right. Thank you very much for your insight so far. Say to um, everyone. Yes, everyone. I think I noticed a particular challenge. Most of the capacity building programs that have been created in school. Well, let us give example like the programs that will allow students to register their startup ideas. They have been given some prizes, especially those who are winning the competition. Now, we are always emphasizing on the capacity building, but we forget that there are some individuals that actually have ideas that are very ready to bring it up in the markets. But because they don't have that capacity to present themselves in front of the judges, and that is the main reason why they don't have the funding. Now, what is this capacity building organization doing to those kind of businesses, those kind of startup ideas? Because after when they finish the competition, that idea ends. 
to get that at their ends. So it's just that particular, and the honest thing is that these people that win this competition, they don't maximize that fund into that project. They just want to get that money. So I think I want to just ask, what is this campus building organization doing to follow up those who win this award, this competition, and also the other um, startup um, owners, uh, yeah, startup ideas owners, what are they doing to support them? And how are they making sure that they come together to actually um, act on these ideas? Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Right. Ah, okay, I run platforms on campus, so uh, I'll answer. Um, so that is exactly one of the problems that we are solving with what I run currently as NICE Award. Because after, uh, so what prompted me to run NICE Award was I won a campus, I mean, I won a competition on campus called Futa, Futa uh, Got Talents that year. I think it was in 2016 or 2015. And from there, I've won several other uh, uh, this thing on campus, right? So, but that particular one then took us to a mini boot camp. After the mini boot camp, we were sent down to business school Netherlands to have a business academy, right? And after then, that was all, right? I really wished I didn't win on global level, right? But I had wished most of what I then. I told you I I I I, I did um, asset management in Futa. Today I am in entrepre entrepreneurship or enterprise development. As a result of the crash course that I did in business school, Netherlands, right? That was what helped me build what I am teaching today to understand better, right? So, um, but when we came back, we we lost track of that. Right, only for some of us that were very, very passionate, uh, not just passionate that we understood that this is what we wanted to do with our lives, and this is where we are go heading to. So, um, I would say that a lot of them um, depends on the structure that they set in place or they set on ground, and that is why they operate like that. Uh, but I will just talk about how we then uh, make that change within NICE. Right, what we do is to then have communities before they i think that was before the advent the community became a buzzword so currently we have lots of this um, competition on campus that are curating communities so the competition is only a part of it more like the front runner of what we do back end right so but back end what we do is to then form communities and also to take note of this because a lot of all these ventures do not then put into consideration um, some other aspect of business. At NICE, what we do is that we also consider those into sectors like music, entertainment. It doesn't have to be just tech. We consider even startups in NGOs, like you want to run NGOs, right? So we also have platform for them. Then we have um, many experiences like this that comes up on the campus. That means we have campus presidents that organizes all of these um, events. On if that is the, uh, the structure we are putting in place. So yes, there's a. Okay. Okay. What okay. are they doing to follow up? So what we are doing? We sorry. Recently, we concluded our 2023 to 2024 session, and what we do is we continually evaluate you. In fact, we don't give you that money that you want, right? We first evaluate your business as to what is the next thing. Is it branding? Why is it branding? What is it going to do for you? Then we release the fund for branding for you, right? So that follow-up continues until we are sure that you are able to start, until you finish school, and then you can come into the larger community. Basically. All right. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Sheyi David. Um, Sorry, can I add something? I think there's a particular, okay. I don't think he has a solution yet. Okay, so we, I want to address, to address to something. I think there's a personal experience that you had, right? And you mentioned something um, by saying, some people have ideas, brilliant ideas. I mean, the business can work, but they can't present it. But other people who 
don't have quality ideas can present so they come out and present and eventually they win because they can present see you don't have to be the one that, to sell your ideas i led odd price how many of you know odd price i led odd price in nigeria i left odd price in oau two years and i led odd price in nigeria for a year one thing i would tell you categorically every campus i, I went to 56 campuses every campus i went to i tell them on the on campus event i say if you don't win does not necessarily mean your idea is not the best or your okay. idea is not quality enough all right just sir. know that the best best thing one but to mitigate your experience get somebody who can present and co-found you don't have to be the one that would spare it. i mean get an operations lead somebody who can confidently sell the company you don't have to be the one that will present the idea maybe you have the brain of the business and you can code get somebody who is good with presentation who can write all the slides who can write who can communicate effectively and you'll be right. sure thank that you, very you go much, to competitions sir. and you win thank, thank you. you very much sir. we appreciate we will not be we have to um wrap up this session now because we have other panelists who are here so um if you have other questions because this is what campus innovation lab is all about meet with the experts after the event whatever questions you have please take it to them um we appreciate mr shay david mr dami and miss Oge. thank you so much for being here we really appreciate you. Please clap, clap if you want to clap. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, I ho really hope you guys enjoyed that session. And just to add one or two, uh, this is why like a lot of problems and solutions that has been discussed about here, this is why we are having this summit. This is why Campus Innovation Labs is going to be open to everyone. So if you have any idea, come to Campus Innovation Labs. Let's work on it. Let's see how we can improve and let's make it something big. Uh, OK, so we've wasted a lot of time. Let's move on. So the next space is a physical speaker session. And the title is how to balance between being a researcher and an entrepreneur. And this is going to be taken by Dr. Baba DJ Macaulay. Please let's give him a round of applause. I would like to, first of all, thank uh, my good friend <laughs> for inviting me. I hope you guys can hear me. Okay, sorry, the mic is now by my mouth. Okay, so first, I want to thank my good friend for inviting me. Um, this is my second time here, I think. And I'll be speaking quickly because I have just 20 minutes on um, how to balance between being a researcher and being an entrepreneur. But before I say anything on that, I've been enjoying the session. So let me just say two things quickly on what I've been hearing. The OAU, okay, we are not going to drag it with you at all. And I'll tell you why. There is data to show that the highest number of founders in Nigeria are from your school. So we are not going to drag, don't worry. <laughs> and um, Yes, so there was this, when I listened to the first panel, Patwal, I noticed that most of their, did you see that they had different advice based on personal experiences? And, um, and one of them said, define what your success is and chase it. Okay, so me, I'll see my own now. <laughs> I felt somehow like the guy, Your first class, so blah blah blah, and somehow me class because I made it. Okay, so everybody will come with their own and make. I'm sorry, I'm saying this, but I'll say it too, because of my own personal experience too. I made the first class. I built two startups, and I'm doing. You know, many people that made first class, and they built startups, and they are doing well. So take it off your mind.
that if I must build a company, then my academic must die. No, it's a mindset problem. It is you. Okay, so that's my own reality I had to share. So let's come down here. Okay. Um, how to balance research? Okay, being a researcher and being an entrepreneur. Let me start with Google. How many people know um, who founded Google? You should know now. Two so guys. Who, who founded uh, Google? Larry Page and uh, is this second name? That guy is always hitting. He's the Larry guy that's always on screen. Okay, so who is the second guy? <laughs> Who's the second guy? Okay, let me just save time. Surgeon Green, P R I N, Sergey Green, eh? Sergey Green. I know that you look hmm, interesting. It's because just as he said, you don't have to be the one pitching everything. Find someone that can speak and what co-found. In this case, these two guys were researchers, PhD. It's funny because that's how I started my second company as well. Okay, it was when I was doing my PhD. These guys were doing a PhD project, the two of them. And then it was a PhD project that ended up at your Google today. So they turned it around from just theories in a lab or in classroom in the lab, and they gave it some practice, gave it some features, added some value in it, and converted it into a product like service and then people are able to use it, pay for it at a price, willing and able to buy it at a price. And today you have a company, Google. Okay? So, but the problem we have with researchers today is that not many researchers are wired like that. Researchers today are usually on campuses. Most of them are lecturers, but they are not wired to be entrepreneurs. They are not. I'm a lecturer at FUTA, so I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so they are not wired to think business. They are wired to think publish or perish. <laughs> you have to publish, just publish. And you see them, the competition is always, I've published 300 papers. Check me on Google citation. My Google citation is high. The impact, the impact factor of my paper, they are on the same path. Where there is a deviation is that a researcher his goal is to solve the problem and keep it as a solution. Then he goes away. <laughs> but an entrepreneur would solve the problem, add component parts in it because it will, it will turn it from theory to practice and then add some value in it so that it becomes not just a solution, it becomes a product or service that people then buy. Okay, so there's always profit the moment it comes to entrepreneurship. I remember I was speaking to one of my senior colleagues on campus here in Puta and a professor, and he was telling me, no, 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 it's not our job to make profit from anything that we do. No, 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 it's not our job. And I said, okay, sir, and I left. I can't tell my yoga that taught me when I was in school, because apparently I finished from here, so he taught me as a student. I can't begin to look at him and say, sir, no, you are wrong. But I understand that where he's coming from is the way they were groomed. Okay? The way a lecturer is groomed. It's almost groomed like, no, you don't end that, not your business. Your business is just show us that you find, you, you saw a problem, you created a solution, you published it, and you told your peers that, uh, you see, I was the one who discovered it, and you publish and you tell the world, and that's it. Hence why most of them don't end from the wonderful innovations they created. I'll take two examples, but I won't mention names <laughs> before, before I get sacked. Okay, so one, okay, don't let me mention departments. That's, that's too deep. You will just know straight up. Okay, so one is a professor in this footer. Maybe use plant extracts. Extracts are just substances that you um, use. How do I make it so simple? Almost like you are squeezing 
plant juice, squeeze that plant juice, and there's something inside that juice that is useful, medicinal. So he got this plant extract, and then he treated this plant extract on uh, mice. Okay, the singular is mouse, the white one. It's different from rats. Some people don't know the difference. This is not a class. Don't let me go into that. <laughs> okay, so he treated it on mice, treated with a drug that has induced ulcer in that mice. Mice is a lot. So it has induced ulcer. That means they fed that mice with some stuff, and then they realized that the stomach is already having lesions. And so they were able to check that, yes, now these mice, they have ulcer. Then he then started feeding the mice with this plant extract. And then he was looking at this mice for like three, for 30 or 60 days. And he discovered that it was healing. Oh, yes. Yes. And then he published it. He's one of the most published. Oh, no, don't, don't let me go that far. Okay, because you, you will catch it now. But it was an amazing finding. Guess what? I will, it will shock you to know that that finding is just in a very beautiful Elsevier journal. And it's sitting down there. Yes. The truth of the matter is, if he was trained to become entrepreneurial in his thinking, two things can likely happen to him. It is either he knows the value of what he has, and then he patents it first, then signs a deal with a commercial company that are into, you know, oh, there are many med, uh, med firms now. Lots of them. They call them the pharma company. They will latch on it instantly. Okay? He can sign up with them, and then you'll be getting percentages from that. Percentages. So he doesn't even have to be the one to create the company, but you'll be getting profit from the work of the brain, or the work of the hands, anyone. That's one way. Or he goes straight up into launching a company. He knows the active ingredient that is responsible. All he needs to do is to know how he's going to do that in large... Um, in volume, yes, and then he begins to package them. First, he can put it inside something else and sell so that they can use it. Because sometimes to sell a drug, you need a medium. See, the med that you take is not the entire thing that is the drug. That white thing that you, sw you swallow is the medium. The drug is inside it. Because the drug itself can't stay on its own. It needs something to hold it together. So sometimes they use capsules and throw the powder inside, the capsule is the medium. Sometimes they use tablet. Tablet is the medium, the active guy inside. Okay? So all he needs there to do is to probably put it into a formulation, maybe a food or formulation, package it and sell it. Then also put the dosage, because that's where NAVDAC will come from. So he needs to also put the dosage and everything required to function um, in as the body weight of whoever is going to take it. And then you have a product. You see how you move from a theory, sorry, from an idea to a theory to go into the lab, you have the solution, and then you have turned it into a product or sell and people buy it. So that's the gap that we have. But I don't know. Most researchers are not trained that way. And that is to lead me to the second example. Also in Futa, a professor. This one is in my department. Also, plant extracts, there's so much in the forest. The reasons why our forefathers live so long. My grandma lived a hundred and eight. She just had to put her one to bed. They didn't know her age. She didn't know her own age. But that, it was that long. Okay? But these days, how long do we live? It's coming down now. 90, 80, 70. And back in those days, they were living longer, and that's what they were so dependent on natural products, plants, herbs, and all that. Stuff. Now, that's why these guys are going back to those plants. People before in my department also extracted some items from another plant, and then he fitted it on grains, cereals. So, some of you that love complex, where do you think it comes from? Complex and golden ones. Complex, 
Can you raise your hand? Team Complex. Team Golden Mod. Now, my guys, did that. I prefer Golden Mod. If there is no stress, they don't match them already. Just swallow. What is all the mastication? What is all the mastication? Exactly. So I, I, I like that. Where did you think it came from? From what? Yes, what type of cereal? What type of cereal? Yes. Beautiful. Do you know that one reason why entomology, the study of insects, is so important is because in one day, locusts can eat an entire farmland of meat. One day. So the study of insects is key. In Kuta here, we do it for people. Uh, what am I doing with insects? We we'll understand that when you go to a country like the United States, you will bore. You will bore because acres upon acres of farmlands, they partner with researchers in this field to ensure that nothing happens to their meat so that you can continue to eat your complex and go demon. Okay? Do you know what this professor did? He discovered that there is an extract from a plant that once you just sprinkle the powder, just sprinkle it on the maize grain. That's after you harvest it. And then you have the weed is disturbing. They can, they can finish everything and you get to sell it. Once you just sprinkle, it's a repellent. It won't kill them. It sends them away. They just leave the grains. And then you can easily sieve it up and take your grains away. But guess what? It's sitting in a beautiful Elsevier paper. Yes, where he's very proud to tell you that. Yes, that's my work. I wrote it, yes. I discovered it. Yes. But that's where it ends. Okay, so I decided to be different. <laughs> and to be different, oh, that's, that's my yoga. You are very, very welcome, sir. Now, to be different, um, I had to go to school. You hear when one person said, you have to learn to earn. I had to change this mindset because me too. I was just like, I was almost like, but I knew that there was a problem. So I had to go back to school. So I ended up in this school called Nigerian University of Technology, NUTM. I was there for one year on scholarship. And they destroyed what was inside and replaced it with something else. Inside the dead, I know. Cap will not let you see the dent. The dent is somewhere. They destroyed it and put something else. So the moment I was leaving that campus, I wasn't just leaving as a new man. I left with a startup. I left with the startup, okay, because it's a school, an entrepreneurship school, and you will not start building that startup now. So one of the tasks was, find a problem right now. The 60 of you, put yourself in group of, of five, that's 12 groups, and then find a problem and solve it yourself, and come and pitch it. So I put together my group, my team, and I told them, when I was doing my PhD in Manchester, I discovered something. When I sit in front of my screen and I want to use an equipment, let's say the SEM, scanning electron microscope, there are three of them on my campus. There's a particular one I like to use. I want to know if it's free. I don't need to talk to anyone. There's a platform where I just go and I'll know the number of people on it. I'll know the days that they put for it. Everything is just tech driven and so convenient. From my seat, I know what is happening. I don't need to go and talk to anybody. I'm, I'm going to be very yeah, just I need, I need the, the, the microscope for, for two hours. You don't need to beg anyone. Everything is right there. And then when you find the time that you like, you slot your own name and you book it online. Also, when I need reagents to do my work in the lab, I don't need to go anywhere. There's a platform that is like the Amazon for PhD people. You just go there, you see equipment, you see the agent, you see anything. You begin to pick them one by one, put them in your basket, and you purchase with your bench fees. You have access to your bench fees. You have a code. You put it there. You remove the cash from there. You sit down in that same lab, the material will come and meet you. So when I go back to Kuta, don't forget, I'm a lecturer. I said, something needs to change here. And I quickly spotted a problem. Again, it's my job as a researcher. I find a problem. What was the problem? I noticed that my undergraduate student, if I give a project, this one even happened like, okay, check for microplastic in bottle 
water. Okay? Water doesn't have the equipment to detect it. Where are we going to get that equipment? That's when I realized there's no platform to even search and say, I'm looking for this equipment. Where can I check? Nothing. So I realized there's that gap. Then you begin to depend on word of mouth. Then somebody said, ah, it's at ABU in Zaria. ABU, no, no. We sent the samples to ABU, and this student paid 100,000. I had to support him with 30. It's more, why well, try? Have you not tried? Because uh -huh. I know some professors that way. Okay, let me just continue. I, I think I'm safe. So I supported him with 30K, and then the samples got there and came back. The following week, I heard that there's a lab in Lagos that has the FTIR. There was no need for us to have spent 100k taking it there. You would have just spent like 40k. All that cost went to logistics because it was so far. So I knew that we needed a platform that would aggregate. Most platforms we just aggregate things. That's it. That's it. Uber doesn't have a car, they aggregate. Same thing. Anything you think of today, most of them they aggregate. Most of them. So that's how I said, okay, I will aggregate labs. And I called that platform Wadi from Yoruba in Wadi to investigate to Wadi in Kong. Okay, so Wadi was now created, and how it was created was I, you know, I was still in the school. I called those five guys. I told them about it, and it's the very good thing. Let's all do it. So, but it's a research tech, and it's new. Most people build health tech, fintech. What other tech now? A Greek tech, oh, edu tech, yes, yes. People would have expected me to do an edu tech, but this was different. It's the research tech. On the day we pitched, some white people were there, they brought in some very important people. Oh, my heart was here and down. By the, I can lecture, but I can't pitch. Okay, they are not the same. But there is this 21 year old UI graduate that is so good. Let me mention his name. That guy is a genius. He's a first class geology student. That's why I said, what is you can balance. He's a first class geology student, but his IT brain is on another level. I had to pitch him because many groups they wanted him in that school. I had to pitch him into my group. Thank God that he has been following me on LinkedIn and he has been sir, sir, sir. So when I just came to pitch, I'll I'll follow you, sir. That's how I had him in my group. But this guy can speak fire. In two minutes, he's done. I, mean, I probably need 30 minutes to explain it. He needs two minutes. He knows the game of pitching. So I put him back beside. And we pitched this thing as a group. And we won. And he came with a cash prize of 2.5 M. So we did not even bootstrap. From there, we just got 2.5 million to start. To register the company and then we started everything. After that, we now got the confidence. And then when we left the school, we now started seeing all these grants. We just went for another. You probably know that's the one that they called you on to become a judge. Yes, yes. We were the first people that won the last, the first set. Yeah, we got 10 million. Funny enough, I wasn't even there. He knows my my partner, the girl that pitched. I wasn't there. I wasn't put there at the pitch. But my girl did it at the pitch. And she won the 10 million for us. That means I need to digress a little bit. If you are here, you have an idea. Money is not what you need. Capital is not what you need. You need a team. Okay? So, but the problem is this. This is how you create your team in school. And it's wrong. You will sleep 5, 5 a.m. You have a good idea. Ah, God, I thank you. God, I bless you. You just carry your phone. Tell me, Takwe, please come to my room. Uh, Johnson, come to You'll be calling your friends. Everybody will come to your room. You now say you have an idea. You will now want to build with your friends. It will fail. Okay? You are not trying to form a friendship goal. It's, not a, it's, not a, it's a business. And let me tell you how the founders will form, will form you. Do you know why we won? When we stood in front of them and we pitched. One woman just said, I'm impressed because no young person has pitched on research ever. I've been listening to young people. It's always been there for research, and they don't know is the bedrock of development. So she said, because one of you must be a researcher to do this. 
So don't ever think you are ready to be a solution provider if you've not been a victim of the problem. One, or if you are not near the problem, there must be something that will make you confident, and it is your what? Your proximity to the problem. If not, it judges down your confidence. They will think you don't understand the problem enough to create the solution for the users. In fact, there must be a researcher among you for you to even understand the language so that when those labs are telling you this equipment, that equipment you will not be saying, ah, which, which equipment? Let me Google. So I immediately say, I am. I have a PhD. I'm a lecturer at Kusa. She's fantastic. You look so young. They took me so young. It was all I needed, and that was it. And it keeps repeating itself, because they keep asking, who is the researcher amongst you? So if you say you want to solve a problem, the question I'll ask you, have you been a victim of the problem? I'll give you another example. Smart Farm, Smart, S-M-A-R-T, Farm, T-H-A-R-M, from pharmacy. Okay? A friend of mine, she created that. Why? Because her uncle died from cerebral malaria. She studied pharmacy. Why did the man die? They got to the hospital and they said they needed a the particular drug, but it was scarce. So they said looking for the drug from pharmacy to pharmacy. He don't finish. He don't finish. He don't finish. He don't finish until the man died. So she went on dejected. And some of you, you go to, to Twitter and curse the country. Ah, this is the worst time to be in Nigeria. I will never why did I even come to this country. You can't take your pain and turn it to solution. That's what she did. She took her pain and said, I need to solve this because I'm not the only one that must have suffered from this. Can this end? So what did she do? Her background is pharmacy. So she felt that she needed to solve it. So she thought of designing a platform to aggregate what? Pharmacies. You see, it's easy the moment you find the gap. Any the gap is what you have. She just started aggregating the pharmacy. And then, at some point, she knew that they would question her based on her competence and intelligence, or her competence and knowledge. So she said she needs some tech skills, because she's just a pharmacist, right? So she wrote to me and said she needed a scholarship, because that's what I do as well, a scholarship to learn something called digital health. And she won it in 2022, because her argument in her essay was this. The experience she had with her uncle that died, the inspiration to build a tech driven solution. But she's a pharmacist, she needs to balance the digital gap. And then she wants to now go to school. She got it. And I'm sure she will build it when she's done. Okay? Now, I know they've been looking at me that, come on, see only lost, stop it there. <laughs> so let me, let me wrap up. To wrap up, I'll mention one other experience that is recent. I didn't want to mention it, but I don't know why my spirit man is saying, let me just say. It. I will just say, it. okay? You know, I told you I was um, at NUTM, right? I had to pass four interviews to get in. So the fourth interview was by the management board, and they are powerful people in Nigeria. A very powerful. Let me tell you how powerful. Former ministers, CEOs, MDs of oil companies they are the owners of that. Okay? So, and they are the ones that will interface with you live on Zoom. So, I was sat with this man. That's why I said he looks rich. Nobody is him. There is no different, in fact, there is no distance between the head and the neck. That distance, you see the same, my own T, T, that means I still have a lot of work. As the money is coming, that is how to naturally close it to So I saw him, he looked really influential. I didn't know who he was. And he just started, hey, so do you want this scholarship? I said, explain it. I have this something called Ipinia, it's an edtech, help people with scholarship. But I noticed it's not growing in me. They are trying, but in five years, I think it's a bump. 
reason why it's slow is because I think I have the technical skills to get people the scholarship, but I don't have the business skills to expand the company. Ah, okay. Then he asked me a question. Look at how this environment. If you are the because he checked the CV, so that what I did is the environment. So he said, if you are the the minister for environments in Nigeria right now, what would be the first thing that you do? And I said, well, the first thing I'll do is um, I will first of all do an assessment and prioritize the problems first. The number one issue that affects the largest number of people is the one I'll solve first. If it is the issue of flood, that's the one I'll solve first. If it is the issue of waste, that's the one I'll solve first. But it all depends on the one felt by the highest number of people. I'll prioritize them. Hmm, okay. The real one that caught his attention. So right now, if there's a problem you want to solve in Nigeria, what problem will it be? And I won't lie to you. On my own, you know how you are a concerned Nigerian and you see a problem and you always be telling yourself that this problem, I wish I can. In Lagos, where I come from, it's everywhere, middle of the road, the center of the road, where the car will park at night. <laughs> it's everywhere and it's always irritating me. Then to make it worse, the government will take a long time before they come and pack it. To now become an ISO for weeks. All that used to bother me. So I shared that experience. Then he said, So how do you want to solve it? I said the government is solving it the wrong way. They are looking for landfill to dump it in a state. That has the smallest land size. It doesn't make sense. So, what do you want to do with the weight? Weight is not weight. Weight is the resource. You use it. Stop looking for landfill. Start looking for products to generate out of it. Okay, what do you want to generate from weight? Biogas. People are already taking the plastic and using it for something. People are already taking the metal scraps. But the organic weight that smells is the one that you got. Mm, they'll throw it away. That is the one we need. For biogas, cooking gas, electricity. Mm, thank you. And that was the end of the interview. Later, I got an email that one that I'll be going to the school. But another email came again from the man, and he said, I want to have a one on one conversation with you on that biogas. That was when I went to Google his name. Then I did, oh my God. Oh God. I won't mention his name anyway. But this man is powerful. And then he called me, and that day, I remember I was pacing around my room. I was pacing as I was talking. He just said, Tell me more about the biogas plant. And I kept talking, talking everything I had in my head. And then he said, I see you've done a lot of work in this area. Can you write me a business proposal on biogas? If you write it and I like it, I'll fund it. Let me call the long story short. We've been on it now for two years. Yes, success takes time. Many of you are in a hurry. You will not make it. Because if you rush, you will crush. Calm down. Do you know that this man is a very big man? So sometimes I will email. He will not respond on the after three months. Get used to it. Yes. So it took two years before we got to where we are now. Get used to it. He's a busy man. He's the kind of man that to be talking to him now, and he will tell you, yesterday, I was in Spain for a meeting, and he's back in Nigeria already. Yeah, he's that kind of man. So he's that man that you send an email, and you'll be waiting on him. <laughs> Let him know. You think it's you that he's thinking of? On his agenda, maybe you are number 25. You will exercise patience. And you know what? Eventually, and then I sent kitchen in his office in Nikoi, high rise building, topmost floor. His boardroom, only me and him. Sometimes when I'm teaching in front of him, I'll be asking myself, you are just a lecture. How did you get here? I don't know how. I did it eight times. He will pick another appointment. I will go there. He will sit down alone, only me and him. And I'll be teaching because he was giving me assignments I was doing and I was showing him what I was doing. And the reason why it took so long is because. Before he responds, another three months. But at least there was progress. So in two years, I can confidently now tell you, he now got to an agreement. And now, there now looks like a company that he now finally said, I will fund. 
The only reason why you've not heard much, why I've not said anything, I'm sure it's coming as a shocker to most people here. <laughs> because I've not said this is the first time I'm saying it in public. It's because of the equity. Okay. We are not they fought me. His school has fought me. I'm utilizing the skill upon him. <laughs> because the moment he came to me and telling me equity, he gave him one amount. He said it's too small. Now we are dragging it. And you know, it takes him another three months to respond. So now I'll be patient. But you know what? We are going to do this. Why? Because every time I speak to him, he tells me, I know this is taking a while, but I'm not going anywhere. We are doing this. So the assurance is there. But can you be patient as a person? Many of you are not. Okay, now why I cited this example is that it's a clear case of research. I have done this research as an undergrad. Do you know when I started the biogas? It was a seminar talk. Some of you, your second semester 500 level seminar, they will ask you to come and do a presentation. You treat it anyhow with levity. Let me tell you the roots of the biogas issue. When I was in school, 500 level second semester seminar, I just thought interested in biogas and i read the it still and when i defended my lecturers with it, 14 of them they kept they kept going back and forth it was so interesting my seminar score was 85 8 because i did my homework that was 2009 do you know when it counted do you know when it counted for me 2021 because when that man asked me and the knowledge of 2009 i was teaching out and the man, this guy knows what he's saying. And now, in 2024, that's not into a soon become a business. So, what I'm saying is this take research. Look, like he used to say, the man used to say, he used to tell me that, do you know why I want us to take our time? Look, if we miss it in the place of research and development, no business will succeed. Guarantee. No business will succeed. That's true. And do you know why? Biogas is the kind of business that. If you don't get the waste mix right, you will not generate any gas. And so there's a lot of work going on on the waste mix, the type of waste, the inherent amount of methane that you can get. Because what is the point? My point is not to prove that it, that it has gas. My point is I want a high volume of gas because that's what I want to sell. So I need to choose the right waste mix. So to conclude, okay. So to conclude, because I know that my time is up. To conclude, if you are here and you enjoy research like this, beautiful. The only thing I'll ask you to do is can you balance that excellence, curiosity, with also an idea of how to profit from it? What is the point if you can't profit from the work of your hands? At least the Bible says that if you have your talent, the talent is supposed to open doors for you. Have it? It's supposed to open doors for you. So why should it just end? It's of a paper. Why should it just end in a paper? I'm not asking you not to publish. Publish that paper, but don't let it end in a shell, on a shell. Let it become a developmental chain. Turn it into a product or service that will serve humanity and then earn you some money because you need money. I mean, you don't need money. <laughs> you need money. So, any questions? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So, thank you, sir. So this question is personal. For someone like me, who is not particularly interested in reading, like I can't sit and read for long. You can't sit and read for long. Okay. And actually like research. Like I would rather sit and listen to. Some actually read those papers. How can someone like me engage? Somebody wanted to buy me a gift and chose to buy me a book. And the book is an academic book. It's not even a spiritual book or a leadership book. It's an academic book because in 13th, now put I did. 
<laughs> he doesn't know that. Look, the way I pull up is through movies. I've watched all the movies on Netflix, everything. It's not true reading. If you think you know me, oh God, you are so far from it. I'm glad that my speaker is there. I used to call him my speaker. When I was on campus, I was extremely political. So that is how you know that I'm not that kind of, I'm not a football. He was my speaker. And the president then was Rebo. I'm glad that he's doing well in, in Oshun State now. He had a fantastic together. I'm telling you. And that set was a unique set because like 30% of us and we're in SRC. I don't like to read for long, so I take short. Once I'm reading and I'm tired, I just read, I come back. As a matter of fact, I prefer documentaries where I watch than reading. So I'm always on YouTube. For example, I love history, but I will not get the history book. No, 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 no. I prefer to Google. And they are all on YouTube. Google the World War II, World War I. In fact, scenes, the scenes, they will show you the scenes so everything sticks because it's audio visual. They stick more than just text. So if you have that problem, it's not a problem. Do you still like the set? That's not a virus. Because I'm like you, but I'm succeeding in it. By the way, around you, that's it. Thank you, sir. That answers it. You're welcome. That's so one more question. Okay, the question. Okay. All right, sir. Um, thank you very much for wonderful insights you've given to us. Thank you. This is not my first time of seeing you talking, but it will be the first time of seeing you physically present, listening to you. Oh, really? Yes, then you talk about scholarship, scholarship, scholarship. But this time around, you are actually talking about entrepreneurship with um, academic research. Now, I found out that a lot of lecturers actually find pride in giving their students a particular topic and their project topic. They work on it. Then after that, the lecturer will be applied for grants on that topic. Topic that was not worked on by him, but by the, by the students. Now, is it fair enough? Because it's actually things that have gone rampant in almost every part of the of the institution in Nigeria. Now there was a period of time when you shared by um, um a screenshot of a news on your Facebook page. Me? Yes. Oh, where wow. University of Zurich <laughs> where University of Zurich stopped um, their lecturers okay, okay. from publishing because it's feeling like they want to in terms of um, ranking. Now what is our school especially doing because since we are more attached to the glory of third position in the um, third position in Nigeria, in Nigeria, third position in Nigeria. But are we actually mm. doing the work expected of us? Because even that is, yesterday or day first day, there was um, there was um, protests, and the protests actually um, was given because of the lights. Ecosystency in, in the uh, power supply. But what is this school doing with the research that is being published every day by day? And also, why is the lecturers using the students' glory, uh, students' work to make a name for themselves, to make uh, collect grants for um, from different uh, portfolios to just for their for their own benefits? So, you as a lecturer, I just wanted to share your opinion. Okay. Um, I know you said two, but I really want to say. I know that they said two, but I really two. But before she 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 speaks, let me quickly address. Let me quickly, let me quickly address this question. Before I take yours. So quickly, I I sympathize with you because to be honest, that is the wrong practice. A lecturer in my department got some grant. I think it was two million or something. And then he immediately called two students in final year, took them to the HOD and said, he wants to work with these two people. Please give them to me because they're the ones that work on the grant that I got. Do you know that this student did not pay anything because their project was towards that grant? So they used the money for the grant. 
you understand, to achieve their project. So the benefit to them is they did not have to pay anything for the project. All the analysis, they were covered by the money from grants, but they needed to be there to end that. It is normal for a lecturer to get grants and use students to execute the work. It's normal. In fact, that is why you get GRAs in the US. Because when you apply for graduate research assistantship, the professor has gotten huge grants and then he's looking for students. You now make announcements. In those announcements you see on Twitter, I'm looking for a student that can do this. He has grants. The normal thing is that when he gets the grant, he uses the student to execute. The difference from what you are saying is that when they get the grant, they just take off the student office. Like the student doesn't know anything about it. That's the part that I do not also subscribe to. They need to involve the student. In fact, they need to pay the student stipend if the student is on the project. Because there is money for all of this in that grant. So it is wrong. It's a wrong practice. But please, I want you to know that it is normal for a lecturer to get grants and use students to execute the project. Normal. It's not a professor that enters the lab. Professor, he will get students, whether masters or PhD, and they will execute while he will do what he will supervise. So it's normal. However, where they exclude them and then not even pay or do anything, and they want to take all the glory. In fact, when they publish the paper, they have to put the student's name on that paper. But a lecturer that tries to exclude the students and put on it is totally wrong, it's wrong practice. And I can confidently tell that in my department, Department of Biology, we don't do it. Because it passes through it. Women, you win. We are now sitting in the board. I was the secretary of the board for four years. So we are now sitting in the board. And then everybody now knows. Then we now know the people you want to use. The, the PhD, the masters, or the undergrad. And those students won't pay a dime. As long as they are working to get their degrees, they won't pay a dime. Because all the analysis that needs to be done can be covered from the grant. Okay, is that fine? All right. Can we? Thank you okay. very much. Okay. Just want to make a little contribution. Normally, when you uh, win a grant, the grant normally specifies what and what is covered in terms of execution what and what will be covered. Some funders, grants funders, normally require capacity building to be part of the deliverables of a particular uh, grant. So if capacity building is one of the key elements that the funder wants, then it means that the lecturer has to recruit students to execute that particular job. Okay? Now, most grants may cover uh, consumables and supplies and payment for some access to some facilities that you need to carry out your project. They may not cover fusion. They may not cover bursaries. So what they may cover is just what will enable you to be able to carry out the bench work. So it all depends on what uh, the terms and conditions of that particular grant is, okay? So that's just a little contribution I want to make. I think on the cake. And we take the final question from mommy. Okay. But there are more hands, sir. Time has gone on, we take them. There are two more hands. Very short, okay, sir. All right. More. Uh, I'll fight. Happening. And advancing beyond limits. This was two topics. Very Men is thanks for the developing world. I am staff in FUTA, in physics department. I'm Dr. Mrs. Haromika. So, uh, 
I'm so delighted to be here. And that's a question uh, from the first speaker who spoke about what makes great paper. You know, uh, all my career, yeah, I've been plagued with what is being addressed by you particularly. Uh, So that to uh, um, be and the impact in our out of our and I had to be time ago of the inside like that. So I really feel sad when I see this kind of things as and we say technology for safe reliance. Look at the amount of Tend with in the system, the one we discussed on Monday, the issue of power, so that he raised. So I actually wanted to comment on that. That uh, your speak is about um, between being a research and an entrepreneur. Invitation of active researcher and lecturers to the I came, you know, I was expecting a lot of lecturers to be here. Oh my head, though, but I expected it more. So I thought I saw that we can invite uh, we should encourage our students to come to. I sent it to my students, uh, my new set of uh, uh, students. Uh, I, I was unable to meet them physically because of the crisis, the demonstration, and all of that. So I said, let us have a, I quickly have a virtual meeting without even having met them physically last night. I told them to be here. I saw both of them indicated, uh, I think others are here. So I, I think I am having a similar experience as the one you had, even though I've been in academics for much longer time, I graduated in 1997. Uh, I'm having a similar experience as the one you had. Uh, my quest is being, you know, uh, met. Uh, fortunately, last year in May, I was nominated by FUTA to attend a research for impact workshop. And that was where I had an experience that is similar at the university you attended, I saw that this is what I've been thinking, you know, all along. This is what had bothered me long. And what I learned there, I used it for immediate set of a project students. And I saw how lighting up they were, how excited, how motivated they were to be able to think of a problem by themselves, starting from the SDG. That was the way. You know, launch this new set of students to read. So, all in all, I would say that you are doing a very good thing here. And I read something online a few days ago that by 2075, uh, five what economy in the world, they say that part of what's going to contribute. Is being used for, and this is what I've seen. I think I'm taking long. <laughs> oh, we have that shop. So I think through what is happening here, I'm going to relate. The lecture has to be at of their students to this kind of. Uh, yes. uh, thank, thank you very so much. much. Thank you so much. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I just want to contribute to what Madame has said before the other. One. Uh, I must appreciate you, ma'am, because when you said you are in physics, 
electronics, something just comes in my mind that we used to know in those days that physics lecturers are one of the most saddest people in Futa. They are not even one of the most. They are the saddest. I don't know now this again, but in those days, when you hear physics, you know it's called to saddest. So because one of the biggest challenges that we always face with interfacing lecturers and students has always been this issue of ego. You know, it's only in Nigeria that a lecturer will carry his bag and the student did not take the bag from him or her that the student might likely fail. It's only here. Even in South Africa, in other parts of African countries, state lecturer students calling themselves by first name. So there is a cultural challenge, cultural fundamental in Nigeria, which we expected years back that academics, education should have erased. But unfortunately, religion added to it. So it's complicated things. And so it just only needs few of you people that are just thinking towards this. Because if we, just like I said, 500, that's maybe one or two, three here. So if we have to wait for the larger house of these lecturers, we may wait till Jesus comes. So I, I just want to give that thank, encouragement. Thank, thank, you thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we are going to be getting your contact directly. So we actually want to, we're going to be affiliating with your group. I also, I also speak with the VC. The VC is interested. So the VC is interested in what we're doing and we'll be working with you as well. Everyone for coming around, we appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Let me also add that the VC is actually aware of this because she created an entrepreneurial committee at the university level somehow my name was spotted in so i'm on that committee i'm the youngest and we meet concerned about the products when they leave they are looking for jobs she wants us to start making them think of how to solve a problem so how do yes there is the sense there that is helping but she feels that there is something else we can do to aid the sense to make sure that the graduates, the moment they leave, they start thinking. In fact, it's so deep that we are thinking of those interested in farming. For example, we will give them land. If it is the fisheries thing, we will connect them to FAT. FAT will give them some fishes to start up with, train them for one year or two. Once they are good at it, we give them some capital that they pay back after a while. That is the design. I'm on that committee. So she's thinking about it. All right. Hey, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Babajide. That was a really lovely session. Thank you so much once again. So um, time is fast spent, so we'll just try to wrap up. So the next space is a virtual panel session, and the title is How to Build Products that sell and scale. How to build products that sell and scale. And I will be moderating this. And the first speaker with us is Nifemi Olu Boyede. And the next speaker is Fumilayo Ojeyele. And the last speaker is Fan. So you can just switch on your video. Hello, hi, good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you completely. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll be starting this space. Um, so my name is Taufi Kaola and I'll be your moderator for this. So, like I said, first phase of the topic is how to build products and sell and scale. So, the major issue here is we have products, we have a lot of products that don't put our sell, and even if they are selling, they are not scaling. So, we are yet to this problem on how to mitigate it.
All right. So the first question is for Nifemi. Um, what would you say is an ideal product that can sell and scale? And scale? Are there things to look out for when building these products? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good, good evening. I'm just checking. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. So if I got your question correctly, you said um, what would be an ideal product, if I'm not mistaken? And the second part of the question is what, sorry. Okay, so the second part of the question is, are there things to look out for when building these products? Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, so one of the things that I would typically like to talk about or even teach about um, in product, um, we hear one of the most common terminologies you'll probably hear when it comes to product is um, product market fit. Um, and typically, as opposed to trying to define product market fit, I would usually like to run product through some form of checklist. And that checklist helps you to identify exactly where your product is. Um, so typically, first question you're asking yourself when you're working on or whatever that supposed ideal product is, is does it solve a specific problem? Right. If you answer that question around whether it solves a problem, and you know you check that list, the next thing you're asking yourself is, this product that you've just created, right? The people who it solves their problem, are they able to find that solution? If you have your answer to that question, another checklist, uh, another item on the checklist is unchecked. Next is. If they find the solution, how easy is it for them to be onboarded on that solution? Because it's one thing to have a product that I can see, it's another thing for it to be accessible or usable, right? And the next thing is, after I've onboarded on that solution, on that product, does repeat usage come naturally, or is the product designed in a way that repeat usage has to come through incentives, right? So you're building a product with the mind that repeat usage should occur naturally. Next thing is, when these users have used your product, are they in a position where they start to tell others about your product? Because if your product is good enough, if it solves a problem, people that have that problem would gladly share the solution they found to that problem, which should be your product. And the last thing you know on that checklist is that naturally, the usage of your product grows. Right. So one of the things that you then find is, yes, you know, it solves my problem. I can find this. I've onboarded. I'm using it. I'm telling others, but I still keep using it. And, you know, I find more use cases for such a product. And if you're able to run whatever you're doing through that checklist, in my opinion, at the end of these answers that you find, you can then see whether or not your product has attained a market fit or not. I think I'll rest there. Thank you so much for that. So definitely, um, the ideal product that can sell, um, to get to your product, you need to find the why of your product, the problem it solves, and how you want the product to continue to scale. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Nifemi. So the next question is for Fumi, and um, the question is, what is the difference between customer support, customer experience, and customer success? What should startups focus on? Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, shout out to all authoritarians in the house, uh, because yes, I'm a proud Futa alum, so I'm uh, very excited to be here. Okay, so um, to the question, um, customer support, uh, customer experience, and customer success. So what we find right now is that some of these terms are used interchangeably, and I also maybe add ignorantly in some cases because 
of course customer is like the you know um, common factor between these three uh, items but in terms of the methodology or the mindset behind um you know these these particular rules they differ and they actually achieve different things so i'll just I'll attempt to um differentiate and just explain what each one means um so for customer support the easiest way to understand this is like customer service which you all understand for example we all use uh, we all like have a traditional bank account and you know that you probably go to a bank when you have issues or let's say for example mtn uh maybe you use any other telecom that you use if you have any issues you call you know a line a particular line has been specified for you to call to get answers to your issues so essentially that team is like the front line and reactive team or reactive role that uh, addresses customers issues and answers their questions so it's reactive um, you wait for customers to call you, customers to escalate issues before you, you know, um, tackle it. So it's not that you're preempting the issues or reaching out to them. So what issues, issues might you have? So that's for customer service or customer support. So for customer experience, it's um, a more strategic and holistic um, method or approach to designing the entire customer journey. And just sort of, I think three things basically, designing the journey in terms of the pathway that you want the customers to go through to interact with your business to get your product and second thing is to design the experience you want the customer to have across all touch points so touch points mean every time the customer needs to reach out to you either they are interacting with ma your marketing um assets in terms of your maybe your advertisement or they're interacting with your sales team or your support team or they are trying to resolve a payment issue interacting with finance just regardless of the touch point you want to design what experience do we want customers to have across all of these touch points that's number two number three is what impression do we want customers to have of our brand based on the interaction with all of these touch points so that's customer experience so it's actually more holistic and strategic in terms of designing that um that journey and that experience for the customer then customer success um on its on its own is is relatively new as a role and it actually started from software as a service companies whose business model was subscription based so what that means is that uh for example like a slack or let's say um microsoft let's use google, let's say let's assume that google meets is charging us and then we have to renew um monthly so it means that because you've acquired me as a customer in january does not mean i'll be your customer in march because i can cancel my subscription it's not a product i'm buying up front and i'm paying for the entire license so i'm paying i'm paying like uh my rent like i'm paying rent month on a monthly on, or on an annual basis so that was actually what brought about customer success to say okay we need to retain customers and for the long term to be able to recover our acquisition costs on that customer to be able to really maximize the lifetime value that we can get from that customer so that role is a role that is very advisory in nature very proactive in nature and very um collaborative so you're trying to, you're trying to walk that customer through that journey of Oh, let me help you get on it on this platform. Let me help you get set up very well on this platform that you have bought. Uh, ideally, again, like I said, software was how it started. Number two is that let me help you. Let me understand what you want to achieve with this. I think that's even the first thing. Let me understand the, the problem you're trying to solve, the needs you have. So I bought this software and let me help you with that on that journey of using that product to solve the problem that you need and then get into the outcome. That you want to see and of course i, I want you to keep renewing keep buying and also refer people so eventually so but what we find in, in nigeria because a lot of these software companies were not existing in nigeria maybe like five ten years ago so we imported the role but what a lot of companies did which of course is very um i mean it's not it's not entirely wrong because we all want our customers to succeed but it's just a change of mindsets and method that we needed not a change of the role so a lot of companies changed their customer support team, the name of their customer support teams to customer success. So it's like, I mean, yes, it, it doesn't do any harm, but in terms of what the world is meant to do, it's meant to be that proactive advisory collaborative role that is trying to create a win-win between the customer and the company. So essentially, you see that it's different from support that is just reactive to customers' questions and issues. Um, so for a startup, I would say um, knowing which ones to maybe roll out first or what to do with would depend on your business model so the first thing is are you serving consumers directly or you're serving businesses so are you b2b or your b2c uh if you're b2c i would say invest heavily on your customer on a world-class customer support um team and also so there'll be like invest in the humans and invest in the tools and technology 
that helps to drive that whole customer support approach where customers can reach out to you. There are different options to reach out to you. Um, you know, you give them options like that's what they call omni channel um, interactions. The number two is you give them self service options. Uh, so not all customers want to have to call before they get quick answers to a problem. So give them self service options, create resources that they can interact with on their own to get um, to be able to self serve and also be able to. Um, and once they reach out, of course, have the method in place to be able to uh, solve their problems and also be able to convert all of that data in terms of what our customers saying. What are they complaining about to also be able to you know go back to your product to make it better because again um, a great product is the best customer support strategy you know if i want to put it that way because if the product is very glitchy and I'm, i think i'm speaking more on the technical side but let's even maybe it's fashion for example uh, i order a dress and i need to like you know adjust it like 10 times you know that's already a bad process but if you have very great product that's already um a great customer experience and the the team would even do less work or they will probably do more high level and strategic work than than that so and then if you're b2b if you're serving businesses enterprise companies maybe you're trying to deploy the next um slack or microsoft teams or something you're dealing with um, businesses they need to have a dedicated approach to um supporting them which is what some people will call account management banks call it um rms relationship management and about most recently it's called customer success management where you're um interacting with customers on a high touch level supporting them um you know to get value from the product that you have bought and just for you as a business as well to keep getting their business and just driving that continuous value so that's um how i would differentiate it and just my thoughts on what you as a startup can focus on so i don't know if that i believe that answers the questions happy to elaborate more on any aspect of that thank you so much on that that was really well explanatory i hope to our audience um so um to the next person that is fanto what do you think people unconsciously miss out when designing products? Yeah, um, first of all, can you hear me? I hope I'm yes, we can. Okay, so I'm down with flu, so I just want to beg your pardon in case I keep coughing throughout my discussion. So hello, everyone. Hello. I usually like to take the storytelling approach, so I think that's what I will use to answer this question um, about um, um, things that you know, product designers unconsciously you know miss out when they're designing their product. So um, there was this kingdom um, where they like to eat cheese, but unfortunately they didn't have like a good machine that can. It was actually like in the mid um, medieval area where um, they were struggling to get like a machine that actually help them slice the cheese into small portions. So then um, the king just put out this call for anybody that can be able to solve the problem. So there comes this innovator. His name was Barnaby, by the way. And he designed this machine that can be able to cut the, like easy for them to cut the cheese and have them. And so the king called him for a demonstration to come and demonstrate this in his invention. And then, well, he brought some of the community members as well. And then he came and then he started demonstrating. Unfortunately, he found out that when he caught the cheese, the cheese cannot like shift or move. The machine that he designed was just focused on how to cut the cheese. And then I think the, the queen was the one that called his attention that, okay, where is the cheese going to go after the machine? This is your machine that you've um, invented. If you cut it, where does it go? And that's when he now remember that he designed the machine, but he didn't design like a plate, like a container for the cheese to go after the machine, like cut the cheese. So I think I'm kind of related to so many um, designers when they design products. Um, some of the things, just like whatever, they, they forget the most important <laughs> which or features which the product needs that will make the product more useful. Because a lot of time, a lot of product designers, which I've seen, focus more on the technology, the innovation, and the features of the products instead of the actual use of that product and what problem is going to solve. So for me, I think one, um, the basic one which I'll start with, and I think designers often forget when they design products is the uh, um, the problem solution fit. Is it solving a problem, an actual problem, or is it just a fancy solution and fancy technology which you can display? Um, about a few months ago, there was this, um, somebody I know that designed um, 
this fintech. You know, a lot of people are giving fintech solution. And he said the solution people can buy tickets to go for a movie or show. And I'm like, that's something that people can buy online. What problem are you actually solving? So it's fine. Oftentimes, there's a misfit in terms of answering the whole question, which is, are you actually designing a product that is solving a problem that people are actually having? And then the other one I'll talk about, which I think the Femi already mentioned, which is the usability testing. Oftentimes, we say we find people just designing products, and the next thing is they want to take it to the market, start selling. They believe it's already okay. My product is good, it has the right technology. No, I think this usability testing will give you the ability to actually um, get users to test the product, test it, and then from there, they can be able to actually identify challenges with your product, which I will give you more insight on how to design and get to the nitty gritty of the important features that are actually required for the product. And then another one I will mention, which is the last mile. The last mile, in this sense, is more of, I'll go back to my story. Where does the cheese go? I mean, the, after sliding, like, where does it go? So the last mile is more focused on how the product integrates into the workflow or the environment of the users. I think this one is easy to just forget. Like, yeah. After all, I'm designing something that I feel they can use. But does it, can it integrate into their workflow, into their daily life? Is it something that they can actually use? So yes, um, I think with that, I'll be able to share more insight. But for now, I think those three key ingredients or components are what I believe um, a lot of designers do, um, sort of like a miss site when they design their product. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So my next question is, do you think researchers on campus can build products that will sell and scale? What three tips will you recommend for researchers on campus? This is for everyone. Anyone can volunteer to just pick up on the topic. Okay, um, let me build the cards. I hope the others will um, chime in. So, um, absolutely, researchers should um, view because I think somebody was saying during the, I think it was during the elections um, that we have, there's really nothing any maybe new president wants to say, uh, wants to invent over the solution to Nigeria's problem. I feel like we already have it sitting in documents, in research papers, you know, in different quarters so i think what uh, what we need to also focus on is the execution of some of our ideas and all that so i would say that absolutely yes um but maybe three things number one is anyone researching right now should also not be fixated on their current yeah. research but to also like um consult past um research you know what has don't try to reinvent the wheel you know just look at what has been done before uh, please excuse me one second you know, to be able to see what has been done um, before, I feel like, for example, in Futa, I did, I know I did a project, we all sort of did projects, and we did great prototypes, and some of us didn't actually convert that, those prototypes to actual projects, actual products to take to the market. So I think that's a place for anyone in the, within the school system right now to think about what have we even put out, what have we turned out in this university in the last 10 years, for example. You know what can we what can, can we just look at that data and see what we can collaborate with other you know stakeholders to see how we can bring it to life but that's number one number two is that um for anyone researching maybe you have like a great product idea i don't believe everybody would would need to build something um and that's where collaboration will come in my current company um what is started with what the founder who is very business savvy started with is not what we are currently selling today because was able to spot a very tech savvy co-founder and that sort of just took the company to another level. So I, I would say, you can have the idea. It doesn't mean you have to be the one to build it. Okay, try to hire. You might not even be able to, uh, because idea. Uh, I think was just I was saying is that idea is not. I mean, it's, it's not all that you need to actually thrive in the market. So it's about that process of bringing it to life. And you might not need to do it alone. And you can't even do it alone. Um, in that collaboration piece as well is to think about what other solutions exist in that space. So. For many things right now, I feel like yeah, maybe there are, for example, if you're trying to solve logistics problem, there are already some uh, existing solutions to a, some part of the problem. So if you're trying to come in, you want to see how you can complement what is on the ground and not try to maybe do 
um, everything from the start. Or so, so just I think I'll want to also mention it. Just find find a way to fit into the ecosystem that is already existing, both uh, as an industry and in, within within the customer space that you're trying to solve for. Number three for a researcher would be that um, you don't have to, if you also want to build, you don't have to jump to maybe starting a company or trying to get into a Y Combinator or Harvard Innovation Labs immediately. I think you can also join a startup, you know, intern. Um, the, there are so many founders of great companies today who you, if you see their profile, they actually worked, maybe they were CTO somewhere before or they were head of whatever, head of product development. They just actually had um, experience in a real company that is selling, that is making revenue, that is scaling before they kind of begin to um, venture out into their own um, things. So I think that's what I would say to any researcher in that. Um, you know, currently doing that today. So, thank you. Miss Femi, do you want to jump in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just going. Okay, yeah, um, I'm just going to um, add without uh, reacting most of what you said. I think you. Um, you're muted. So, I need me, we can't hear you. If you can hear me. And the ones you've never heard of, um, oftentimes, is how well they've executed. Um, so, yeah, thanks. I'm sorry, Mr. Nifemi, we missed like everything you said. Can you just come back? Thank you. Hello, Femi. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so we missed everything you said. If you could just like ah, okay. take yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I was saying that um, the key word here is execution, right? Um, a lot of people have ideas, a lot of ideas. You know, you guys will understand. You have this fancy idea. Maybe you know how to write code and you just start coding and whatnot. But the difference between that really brilliant idea and that really wonderful product that gets to the market is execution, right? A lot of people have similar stores and it's it's evident, right? I work in financial services. You probably heard of a lot of digital banks, but you know the difference between the ones that are cutting it and the ones that didn't do more than two thousand downloads on the app store is how well you know the team has executed and i always like to use the likes of the money point as an example right money point came into the agency banking space some 2019 thereabouts there were a lot of players that were ahead of them so sometimes even first mover advantage is not always an advantage when you have the right execution so my word to you guys would just be that you know no matter what that idea is as lofty as it might seem execution is very important and if you're not pressing to be able to drive it, like Fumi said, and I think um, one of the guys on the previous panel before the last speaker also mentioned that even if, I think he was mentioning that in the context of you know, putting your pitch together, if, if you're not good at it, getting somebody who can help you put together a really nice pitch deck or even present it, it's the same thing, right? The spirit of collaboration is recognizing the limitations of your gifts or of your capabilities and getting people who are good you know in that aspect so if you have somebody who can execute better than you by all means you know give them the floor and what's most important is that your business grows and you know your users want to keep going as your business grows um yeah for me i think um, the advantage you do have is the fact that they're researchers so that gives them like the leverage to be able to delve deep in understanding the problem and be able to find solutions. Um, the two things I'll add, I wanted to add collaboration, but you already mentioned that. Um, one is the business acumen, because I see a lot of times people have the technical knowledge, which is great, but you also need that business acumen to be able to navigate production, sale, marketing, branding. It's very important for you as a researcher to get insight into that as well. So you, you know that you're building a product and you have the, um, the skills or you have support system with the business acumen, the business know-how to be able to navigate um, building the product and how you get it out in the market. Then the other one is still misunderstanding the market. Make sure <laughs> you're actually getting to the nitty gritty, which is understanding 
the the problem you understand the users what they like what they don't like what's really the problem is asking your why okay why this how then the other why for example if it's okay um uh, uh, especially for let me say for this our banking sector now you say you want to build a product for um saving for people in um, rural communities or businesses in rural communities so you want to ask yourself why 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 do they need that product what is the problem um is the problem saving or is the problem they don't have a platform to save or is the problem they don't have people to save so you know you you want to understand what the users are and what's really the problem so i'll say the business acumen and understanding the market it's uh, and then collaboration i also emphasize it is so important because especially in um interdiscip um, interdisciplines it also helps to give you more insight into the problem you're solving or the product you're trying to build. Yes, that's my thing. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, the audience, do you guys have any questions for the speakers before we move to the next session? Okay. So seeing none, thank you so much again. Um, Nifemi, Fumilayo, and Funto. Please do have a lovely hit and please let's give them a round of applause thank you thank you so much for that session thank you. So, uh, very quickly we're going to be having a virtual session uh the person taking it dr craig uh Omotiosi, is in australia and it's 1 a.m already over there so we just want him to quickly take his session it's actually a very important session and after that we'll be having the panel of uh, Professor Laname, Professor uh, Daramolan, and uh, the other one. So let's have Dr. Craig come on board right away so that we can have a session and then he can go and rest. His session was supposed to have come up earlier. Thank you so much. Is it, is it not on the call yet? Okay, so um, I think we're going to have the panel. Um, so let's, there's the panel of Prof and um, Doctor, so you can just come and do the announcement. Here. So um, we'll be having the next session is a physical panel session. And the physical panel session, and the topic is building the bridge building the bridge research and entrepreneurship. And the speakers for this session is Professor Duni Daramola. Please let's give her a round of applause. The next um, speaker is Professor Kenneth. Please let's give him a round of applause. And the last speaker is Dr. Babajite. Okay. So the moderator for the session is Dr. Babajite Makoli. Ah, it's not fair what you've done. You brought me to moderate. Two hefty professors, directors. It seems that you don't know who you are looking at. So let me do a simple introduction. The one on Brown is a professor in Futa and also the director of Sarah. So hands, ah, you are looking at me. Okay. And our mommy, a professor in Futa as well, and director of Saint. Like a powerful man, <laughs> all right. So it's a pleasure, sir. Sir, so um, he told me to do the Lord's work, <laughs> and so today we want to look at bridging that gap between entrepreneurship and research. There is a large divide, it's almost like we are not speaking the same language. In fact, that was most of the things I said 
today before you both came in, but I think he met um, the later part of my discussion. Um, so my first question to the two of you, Sam, is <clears throat> this gap that exists between researchers, primarily lecturers, let's call them that, and then the entrepreneurial world that almost looks like oil and water that doesn't mix. What can we do in 2024 to resolve this gap? So I will start with you, sir. Yes, sir. So thank you for inviting me for this uh, program. It's a quite a laudable one. And uh, seeing that uh, you have majorly youths, it's quite uh, uh, you know, very encouraging it's because the, uh, the youths have the future of uh, innovation. So uh, to respond to your question, um, to bridge that gap, the first thing is to look at uh, fundamentally what are the requirements for elevation of researchers. Uh, research essentially is for knowledge production. Uh, knowledge, pro knowledge production is essentially what research is all about. And uh, when you produce knowledge, it's intended to solve one problem or the other. But the way academic systems in Nigeria particularly is structured, uh, dissemination of research outputs mm. majorly tailored along publications. Either you publish in journals or make conference presentations. So that is the motivation for elevation. If you want to be promoted, if you want to uh, move from one uh, data to the other, you need to uh, have these uh, publications. So conducting research to produce papers is then considered an end in itself and not a means or just an aspect to what is considered the end. Very little emphasis is placed on technology transfer or translating research outputs to marketable items. So one way I feel we can address this is to go back to maybe the promotion criteria. If you go back to the promotion criteria, try and see how you can bring in components that encourage entrepreneurship, that encourage technology transfer into the promotion criteria. If you build that into the promotion criteria uh, from a very young age, a young academic, a young um, researcher, the psyche is kind of altered to have this balance of um, science communication and technology transfer. So that is one way, a major way of addressing that. And I'll give you an example. Um, in our system, majorly, you are, so, you are expected to have in particular number of publications before you can move to certain cadres. Uh, by the time you are getting to maybe the professorial cadre, uh, maybe if you have grant attraction, that is considered uh, a plus for you, for you to be promoted. But if you look at most of the Asian countries, a good number of them, they want to find out, do you have any patents? Do you have products? Do you have technologies that have been commercialized? They build this into their promotion criteria. So it is not enough for you to just have paper publications to be able to strive in their own system. So I feel fundamentally, this is one modification we need to make to our own system to help to bridge that gap between um, you know, research and uh, entrepreneurship. So I will say one or two others. See. It. All right, sir. Thank you very much for that elaborate answer. Ma, I want to hear your perspective to the same question. Thank you very much. I want to appreciate you for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Analeme, for that. I will just add some things to what he has said. From what he has said, I'm sure we understand what uh, research is. And we also need to understand what entrepreneurship is. So if research is about um, producing knowledge, 
then we will know what you do with the knowledge that you have had. And that's where entrepreneurship comes in. Entrepreneurship helps you identify the gaps and helps you to translate the research output to solve real life problems and then create value addition. Value is very, very important. So when we understand what entrepreneurship is, then we will know, like he said, we don't allow publishing to be the end to the main. And we need to move further. That vision that we have been able to create, what do we do with it? We create products, services, and whatever from it. And then we use it to solve real life problems. And you are, the question is, how do we bridge the gap? It's not only in Nigeria that we have a gap. I was reading an article uh, about Canada. We were talking about gap between researchers and entrepreneurs. I was like, wow. So it's not only in Nigeria. And the article was published, I think, middle of last year. So less than a year ago. So you will know that is a current issue that we are actually doing. So what we are saying is this, there is definitely a gap between research output and um, entrepreneurship. To build this, I think the first thing where to start from is to create awareness. We really need to create awareness that those solutions are not meant for shelves. Those solutions are meant to solve real life problems. So how do we now convert it to real life application? How do we convert it to things that can generate values and then bring about profit? That's where the entrepreneurs come in. And that's where everybody, we need to create this entrepreneurial mindset. And that's where the awareness comes in. Last year, we had a program in Futa. We called it Akada Premier 1.0. We are planning Akada Premier 1.2, I mean 2.0 this year. Akada Premier is a program that is intended to make academics aware of the fact that they can go a step further by coming out with products that can be commercialized. So we don't want the research outputs to be on the shelf alone. So last year, we restricted it to a number of invited people. I think we had like 50 people. But by the grace of God, this year, we are taking it further. We're going to have more. We brought in a professor and at the same time, an entrepreneur. So the reason why we did that was because we wanted them to know that for the fact that you are an academic doesn't mean you cannot be an entrepreneur. Because in Futa, that same last year, I was discussing with some of my colleagues about entrepreneurship, and they were like, what business do we have to do with entrepreneurship? That uh, have we finished with uh, our researches and whatever? And I said, these researches that you are doing, if you put it on the shelf and you cannot convert it to something useful, then it's of no value. And that's where the world is going. So we want those research outputs to solve real life problems. And that's where our, I mean, the awareness is very, very important that you cannot stop at that level of publishing. You have to take it further. And from there, you create at least minimum viable products and then you use it to test the market. You need to understand your market. You need to understand the gap. You need to be able to identify those gaps. So if you are able to identify the gaps and then you understand that this product will be solving this particular problem, it's going to add value to the society. And from there, you can generate um, profit. You can do a number of things with it. That's where the awareness comes in. So we need to understand that you don't have to keep your research outputs on the shelf, but you need to take it out to the market understand the market gap, and then bring in this, your product or services to solve these problems. Like from our ENT302, we have a number of products. You will, you will it will be interesting to know that some of our trainers are also professors in FUTA, and they come up with, I mean, 
exhibit that they bring out during our exhibitions and we look at it. How do we take this to the market? What do we do to this market? How can we come up with products that will meet the needs of the society? We have some of this research output from our labs in Futa. They can extract oil from coconut, from leaves, from this, from that. They can come up with a uh, Abba soaps and whatever that will be able to solve one ailment or the other. But how do we now take it to the market? That's where the problem is. It's not sufficient to just do all things because we will, how much will it cost you to produce this? Then if you sell it, how much profit can you make? Then will people be able to afford it? Because when you do research, you spend so much to get a particular product out. But when you want to commercialize it, you need to get to the point of how many can I produce with so, so, so amount? How much can I sell it? How much profit can I make? And we address the particular problem. If it's not in a particular problem, find it from you. So we really need to understand that. And that's why we started with that awareness program, Akadapino 1.0. Wonderful, man. Thank you. Please, a round of applause. Please, I want more, more me to answer this one. Um, so, I'm aware that School of Agriculture and Agricultural Technology, SAT, um, some years back, they used to do this exhibit thing that they bring out food and then it's very FST. That was the birth of Puta Bread. And then Puta went on to construct a proper company. A bakery, and now we have the star bread that even outsiders buy, and they testify that our bread is even better than many breads that they do out there. What is, uh, is it not true? <laughs> it is true. It is true. <laughs> okay, that's so, very correct. And we lost the quality at a point, but the quality is back. So if you have not tested it recently, <laughs> please go back. <laughs> Uh, why did we lose the quality? Say something is government business. We know how we handle it. But if it is your personal business, I'm sure you will maintain it to the extent that you want to keep your customers. You know, the lady the other time on the screen was talking about a customer, whatever. Uh -huh. There are things you do to keep your customers. You understand? So you don't want to reduce your quality. Sometimes there is a trade-off, probably because of cost of production and a number of things. So you want to trade off, but never you trade off quality. It's very, very important. Because if you like what you just said now, if you trade off quality, by the time you have the quality back, many people, many of the customers you have lost will not come back to come and test whether qu that quality is back. You understand? So that's the danger in it. So you were yes. saying something so, about... Yeah. So the question I wanted to ask of that is, is it not possible that some of these products, since you've already pointed out now that government things totally different, it's better to have it as a private-owned thing. Can't we then partner with some students that are interested in further developing the product and a partnership there, then we can enable the students to go on, have its legs and build it into something. And that department can get some percentage equity. That's, from a, very, it. that's a very good idea that you have brought up. And uh, actually, I'm sure Futa is currently interested in partnering with students. A few weeks or months back, the vice chancellor's a message in text message to me that I should get the list of students who are on sure some of you probably saw that a uh, message sent out a Google of next on campus. You tell us the type and you tell us whether your is registered. I want to know whether you are registered with CAC or not. The essence of that is we are looking at a situation whereby some of these 
jobs we give to outsiders can even be given to students on campus who have registered businesses and who can actually work with us. And there was a time we were doing something like that at the Center for Entrepreneurship years back when we were sewing lab coats. We had some of us who came on board to sew with us for a token. So it's like a work study of a thing. So actually possible and it's a very good idea that we can bring up because if it's somebody's business that somebody will make sure that that business does not collapse but if it is our business you understand we know how we handle our business but if it is my business i'll make sure that my business doesn't collapse so it's a very good uh, idea that we can actually bring up and i know that it will thrive because like the fsc thing you are talking about there was a time they were producing juice Many of us who go to that FST lab down there and will buy fresh juice, we take and very refreshing. So if students are, I don't know who is handling that in FST, but I know that under that uh, F, I mean, School of Agri Building, we used to buy it there. I'm not, I just see selling it. Yeah. So like what we are saying, we can actually bring up the idea that to partner with students for a particular percentage. I'm sure that student will run that business very well. The department will get it. So, so it's going to be a win-win situation for the department and even for the students involved. So much, Ma. Wonderful. Thank you, Ma. Okay, sir. So to you, um, my question will be along the line of patenting an idea or a solution. For example, I have a good example. There are, professors, there are professors in my department who have been able to get plant extracts to control insect pests of cereals. But it is painful to note that they ended up in a high impact factor LCBR journal. That's it. High impact. And when I say high impact, I mean like 18. And that is what he's proud of. But my question now is, is there a difficulty of moving the idea, the solution to commercialization? Because you can't commercialize if you don't pay them. So I just want to ask if you know about the patency processes, how difficult is it? Is it easy or is it that it is so difficult? It's not the fault of the lecturer or is it a case of information they are not just aware thank you uh, it's more of um, awareness and as i made mention in my earlier submission motivation now if you make having a patent a requirement for you to be promoted and it is called very high it will motivate the lecturers or the researchers to want to see how they can obtain a patent. Now, the patent, the uh, the process of obtaining patents uh, is a quite an easy one, and it is something very important, not just for lecturers but also for students. When you have any solution, before you start to talk about uh, commercializing that solution, the first thing is how do you protect that solution, and that is what. Uh, intellectual property is all about. How do you protect that solution such that uh, nobody can copy that uh, solution or that technology because you have spent a lot of time, energy, and resource to develop that particular technology? Why most products fail or they have a sh short lived lifespan is because once those solutions are uh, obtained or achieved the first thing the person thinks of is how do i take it to the market no the first thing you do is how do i protect it so if it is a soft solution maybe uh, it's a software uh, maybe it's uh, maybe a, a book you've written or an app you obtain a copyright for it that is what is that is the intellectual property applicable for such solutions. 
Now, if you obtain a copyright, it gives you exclusive monopoly to exercise uh, right over that part, uh, particular technology or solution without anybody copying that particular solution. And most times, if you are looking for investors, that is the first thing they want to find out, whether that particular technology is protected. If it is not protected, uh, they will be very skeptical about putting their money into it because if they invest and somebody else copies that technology and refines it and starts to make money out of it, they will lose their investment in that particular uh, project. Now, if you obtain a copyright, it gives you uh, exclusive right over that te technology or solution for a whole lifespan and 70 years after death. So you can imagine if you have a solution, maybe an app, and uh, you have a copyright over that app. So all through your lifespan, okay, you will be able to exercise more if you even commercialize it or you, you sell it to a particular or you license it to a particular company, you continue to receive royalties on it all through your lifespan and even 70 years after that. So you have something to leave for your, maybe your, those who are, who are your dependents. Now for devices, if you have devices or you come up with a new process or a tangible product, the intellectual property that covers that is patents. Now, if you obtain a patent, the, the way you obtain a patent is to come up with what we call a written disclosure. The written disclosure states exactly what that invention is all about, um, summary of the invention, the key elements or the key innovations in that particular invention, and the claims which you intend to protect. That is, what are those things that are essential, essentially unique about that particular product or device or process which makes it novel and which is exactly which is essentially what you want to pro um, protect now if you file it uh, our office at the center for research and development takes uh, helps both students and their staff to file in for patency so we also take care of that so with your written disclosure it goes to the uh, patent and the industrial design um, registry. There's a registry that takes care of that under the Ministry of Trade. So they will review your particular invention. And if they find it patentable, that if they find the innovation outstanding, then you'll be granted a patent, a patent certificate. That patent certificate grants you exclusive right to exercise that technology without any form of infringement from any third party for a period of 20 years. So we, over the years, for the past, um, before 2019, say about 2018, uh, the university, we just had one patent. But as of 2024, we have close to 30 patents and a number of copyrights. So it is more of, so we are trying to put that. So it is more of um, awareness. So if you have the awareness, the process is not as tedious as what you go through when you send maybe your papers out to very high impact journals. So thank you. Thank you so much. I want to use this opportunity, sir, to plead with you, you using your good office. I'm a lecturer at Twitter, but I didn't know this. So it's an awareness issue. Can I bet, sir, that periodically you could just give it to the PRO of Twitter to publish on all the social media platforms of Twitter, the procedure to apply for this patency. But some people have it, don't know what to do. I'm not even aware that this process um, exists in Twitter, yes. So please, periodically, just to remind us, maybe. <laughs> yeah, now, we, we organize a number of trainings, both virtual and physical, on it. But it is uh, attendance that is now the issue. 
So we organize a lot of trainings in that regards. You are right. <laughs> we have to attend. We have to attend. Okay, so my final question to the two of you would be, okay, so someone just asked from the internet that do lecturers have the right to establish an independent company of their own since their work is like a public office role. You are working for the government, especially those of us working in a federal government institution. Um, does it go against the ethics, our employment conditions? I don't know if the question is clear. Okay, question is clear. All right, the, the condition of service, okay, for uh, public servants generally and for academics places some limitations with that in that regards. However, you can um, normally, let me put it this way. If you have any, if you are a government worker and you have any technology, uh, by the patency law and existing laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, it is assumed that if that particular solution or product, it is in line with your area of uh, professional expertise, that particular solution belongs to the university and it is not yours. However, you exercise first right on how it will be utilized because there are two rights to solutions that you create. One is a moral right and the other is an economic right. The economic right is most cases ceded to the institution and then you, the inventor. But the moral right, most cases, resides with the inventor because you it is your solution. You can't determine how it will be utilized. So what normally is workable is for uh, maybe an enterprise to be set up uh, built around that particular solution. And in that particular uh, enterprise, uh, there are profit sharing formulas that are agreed. It's flexible between one, the inventors, two, the university, there may be three, the school or department uh, that uh, the inventors emanate from, and if there are any other external partners. So with that, uh, it is run like uh, a, a corporation, not you exercising exclusive right. monopoly over it so that can i clarify so you have to isolate the department from the university you don't treat them as one now this is how it works uh, in the intellectual property law of the university there are the way there is a way it is stratified you have the department you have the school uh, then you have the university. In fact, it is applicable in so many, uh, so many internet, in so many universities even outside. Yeah. So, a particular percentage may be very little. Okay, may go to the school, a small percentage to the department because it is believed that while you are doing that work, maybe you have shelved some departmental responsibilities or the department has relieved you of some responsibilities, but to enable you to you know, carry out, undertake that particular work, you may have used some of the departmental resources uh, in the course of uh, arriving at that particular invention. So it's a small percentage, okay? But the bulk goes to the inventors, okay? But you cannot uh, exercise it or monopolize that particular uh, technology or solution as the case may be. Thank you so much. This is a real eye-opener, especially for me. Thank you so much for this. So the final question for you, Ma, will be, um, I'm glad that you are the director of SEMT, and so our graduates, we are doing well. Many of our people here, they are already entrepreneurial from part two. But many of them will tell you that they need capital. Even if it is interest-free loan or small loan, they will tell you, I can't start, I need capital, no matter how small. And to a large extent, even though we say, no, you don't need capital, you need, you need a team. We know that at least to start off, they need a bit of capital. Is sent doing anything regarding, even if it is to give 
interest-free loans that they pay back after a stipulated time, he sent thinking along that path, or whether they've even started something like that. I'd like you to share more. Thank you very much. Along that path. And recently, we had a meeting, Center for Entrepreneurship Board had a meeting, and part of what we discussed at the meeting is how we will help those businesses that are not registered to be registered with TAC1, then how they can get a small grant for takeoff. Because um, this last, this week, NUC came around to assess our center. And one of the questions they asked is about commercialization of products and what are the major challenges that people are facing. And one major thing that we wrote in our report is fund for takeoff. Because if you have a very good idea, even as, I don't know, which business can we say it's small? Even farming, you still need money to buy those things, seeds that you plant, and then you need money for chemical and whatever. So if you don't have it, if you plant, when it's time to probably spray chemical and you don't have the money to buy the chemical, you can forget whatever you are expecting from that farm. So fund is an essential part of any investment. And that is even what we, what do you invest if you don't have funds to invest? So you are investing resources. So fund is very, very important. And we are already working and thinking along that line and partnering with any willing organization that can assist us to fund startups, ideas, and all of that. The one we had last year, the lead way pitch at some that we had in Futa, they gave a little token to those three business ideas that were closing. And then they also uh, in place mentorship programs for them. They are still on the mentorship program. So with that, I'm sure they will be able to take off, at least stabilize the business to an extent and then move on from there. So even the university too, we are looking at that. Like very soon now, we are bringing, in fact, it's all to be out. Maybe before the end of this week, we are sending out our flyers for talent hunt. And the talent hunt, what we are planning to do is to pick the three best business ideas and then fund them. Not just give them the whole cash. We will fund them. Probably they'll get some in cash. And then some as tools that they can use to take off. So I don't want to mention the amount now. But I know because by the time the board met, we put in a small uh, amount. But the board looked at it and they said, in this economy, this <laughs> amount is, too, is very small. And they jacked it up That's even good. by 400%. Wow. Put your hands up. A round of applause. Put your hands. That's the point you have. <laughs> so I want to add to okay, what please, uh, yes, Prof has just said. Um, the university presently is trying to identify some outstanding technologies from the university. Uh, some two years back, uh, one of our inventions, a plantain, full range plantain processing uh, plant, won this uh, LNG National Prize for Science. I think that was uh, two years ago. So, and uh, the uh, inventors are from uh, industrial and production engineering, engineering department. I think I read the news. So, uh, the university now is looking at how to provide venture capital. Venture capital, most times, is the key when you talk about uh, commercialization. Um, the raw or crude research output, before you can get it or make it market ready, there are a number of processes it needs to go to or go through for it to be refined. And most times you need that uh, venture capital to be available for you to refine that technology to the point where you can take it to the market. So I'm very glad to you know, inform us that uh, the university is selectively trying to identify some of these very viable technologies 
and seeing how it can put some little money into them to refine them uh, and also create startups around uh, them. Okay, so yes, sir. So, 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 hold on. There is a question that just came in now, and I think you are in the best position to answer. So, someone is asking online. He finished from this school, but he's now based in South Africa, I think. Okay, he's one of our top top people doing so well. So, he's asking that: Is it possible for him to fund an idea? But the idea is owned by a student in Futa. He will fund it, but that he will then own the exclusive right. Will Futa still want to have the right because the student is in Futa? Since he funded, I don't know if you got that question. Yes. Now, if okay. the if the um the project, let me call it a project, is is an academic one, is an academic work that would result to maybe obtaining a degree in one form or the other maybe if it's a, uh, maybe a bsc or msc or a phd okay. he cannot exercise the exclusive right okay. no he can't now if it is something by the side that does not have any direct bearing on his academic progression exactly then um up he also cannot exercise exclusive right over that technology because the, the yes the idea may come from him but there is that uh, intellectual production which has gone into it which the student has put in and is domiciled in futa and is domiciled in futa so what what will really normally uh, when for example you want to process a patent you can have the inventors okay not inventor so he will be part of the inventor he can be the principal inventor now there will be a legal document uh prepared where the terms of profit sharing if that particular technology is sold out completely or licensed to a particular uh investor or uh, investor organization so in that legal document, we state that, okay, because I provided the funding and maybe the idea, mm -hmm. maybe I will take so, so percentage from the, um, the whole uh, profit that accrues from it at the end of the day. So if it is something that is agreed, then it becomes binding on all parties, but he cannot exercise 100% exclusive right No, it's, it's not possible. Absolutely. Even the even the patency law of the country does not allow that to work. Okay. Now, what he can do is this. Now, after the invention has been protected, he can reach an agreement with the student to buy it off. Yes, he can buy it off the student. Okay. So if he buys it off the student. He cannot exercise full exclusive, ownership. yes, full ownership. That is the only way that can work out. So if you have a solution, it's just like the way uh, maybe this, some of these uh, uh, software companies, they, they, so you can choose to license it to them. They will be paying you royalties over a period of time. Yes. Or you may choose to sell it to them outrightly and collect bulk money to do something else. So that is a, a route which he can explore. Okay, he may choose at the end of the day, when the technology is ready, it is protected. He can agree, I mean, he can reach an agreement with the student to buy it off, okay, for a particular amount of money, okay, which will be something that is fair to the student. So the only reason why the school will have ownership rights is if the student is also a co-owner yes, of the solution but the moment the student sells then that goes off yeah no but again uh, the, the institution you cannot the, the institution cannot be completely out of the whole process now once you are um, filing for things of this nature you need an affiliation 
which affiliation is the student going to use? Is he going to use number seven in Moiwa community? He will use the Federal University of Texas. So, because those things also are very important. They add credibility. To the credibility, yeah, yes. And solution. there is no way the university will not get something out of it. But whatever the university gets is very modest, very little. And the university, uh, in conjunction with the students, if the, uh, the external party is willing to give a very good price, they can decide to sell that technology. It's not out of place. Okay, but what is important is that even when it is sold, remember the moral rights still rest with the institution and the students. So it will always be there that this technology emanated from Futa. It cannot be eroded. It's closed. <laughs> Thank you so much for that deep enlightenment. Thank you. Please, a round of applause for the panel. In terms of time, we won't be able to take que uh, questions. I would like to thank my panel. Thank you so much. So much um, experience that you cannot buy. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much, sir. All right. So that's it. Thank you. And so put your hands together for them once again. These are, these are information that really we, we never know existed, you know. I mean, there are some that I know because I've been in the academia and all that, but quite a number were not aware. I love that question, you know, uh, Dr. Craig asked. Very, very solid. I mean, it's been a very amazing question. Thanks, Prof. Alaname. Thanks, Prof. Uh, uh, Thanks, so let's just put your hands together for them again. Thank you so much. And um, just also quickly note that the reason we're establishing Campus Innovation Labs is to actually ensure that these kind of things are easily solved. So we're going to be, and that's why we're not doing it in isolation, just come and establish a club. No. The goal is that we can partner with the institution. We can bring in individual investors. So one of the things that um, CIL will be doing is something like what Dr. Craig was asking. I can bring in individuals that have projects and they can actually come into CIL to say, you know what, we, I want to fund a project in solar energy. Right? Do you have, can you get students that are interested in this area? They can actually do it independent to an extent of the school, but we're going to ensure that they do it with the school at the level so that the infrastructure support, research labs and everything are made available. But we'll have a convention with the university where we support an idea there is a percentage equity. By the time we bring an external investor that has this research to do, there is an equity. And we will now be like that body that is able to help them sort out you know, this ownership and everything very well. Uh, by the time you go to Harvard and major Western universities, these things exist already. But we want to build that ecosystem across all campuses, and we are hoping that we can succeed there. So once again, put your hands together for the profs. We really appreciate your coming. And um, it's been an amazing one. So I know you have to take your leave now, but thank you so much. So uh, just without wasting our time, uh, I was supposed to talk about what Campus Innovation Labs is about, but I think we've already gotten an idea of what it is from all these conversations. So if you have an idea, interestingly, very quickly, we have a grant competition we're hosting in Ondo State right now. And we are targeting about 5,000 SMEs, right? We have Sterling Bank on board of this. We have a lot of about five major organizations on board of this, and we are giving some millions out in grants. So if you have an existing business, I'll also be speaking to Center for Entrepreneurship to send all their enterprises into that. If you have an existing business and you have, even if you have not registered before, you are willing to register, you, open, you are willing to open a corporate account with Sterling Bank and other partners. We are bringing insurance partners and all that to work with you. So that program is ongoing. It's also by the Growth Hub. And all, all our partners are on board. Some millions are going out in grants. But more importantly, you get a business school standard training for the whole three months. It's a three-month-long program. So as many of you, you can tell your colleagues and friends, it's already out. Please be a part of that. Is that okay? So very quickly, um, I want to bring on board uh, Dr. Craig Gomotu Yossi. He's going to be talking about something very important. And um, we've talked about a lot of things, but we have not talked about how can you really do your research in such a way that it can attract money? You know, how do you design the research itself? How do you build it out in such a way that it can attract funding and it can even be commercializable? 
So very quickly, we'll make welcome with me Dr. Craig Omotuyosi as he presents uh, his speech. Let's put hands together for him. Dr. Craig, over to you. Dr. Craig has been a very good friend of mine. He's in Australia. It's about 1 a.m. in Australia, and he's doing this in the middle of the night. And I really appreciate that. Uh, we, we worked together in Futa in 2011 on both our projects. So we have been friends way back since undergrad is a pretty great day. Thank you so much, Craig. I really appreciate it. Please, over to you. All right. Good morning. Um, can, can they hear me? Yeah, you can. All right. Good morning. I also greet the speakers. I've also learned a lot. So, um, Victor, thank you so much for being an amazing Nigerian and African, as I'll say. I mean, everything you've been doing has been so wonderful. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. I really can you hear me? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it's a privilege to be here and I don't take it for granted. Um, yeah, the question I asked, I asked that question because I was thinking if, for example, as it's done all over the world, if I use MCN in Nigeria, for example, if they have a problem and they want to solve it, sometimes they always want to have ownership. So I really appreciate it. I also see my honorable speaker sitting down there. <laughs> I greet you, sir. <laughs> it's good to see you and everybody here. So straight to it, uh, how can you conduct research to make money? See, the first mistake we made, I think the idea of the panda jam that I invented or something actually went to uh, a lot of the victor to get <laughs> to get the design of how to go about it but one of the things we didn't know is my friend we need money no matter how passionate you are no matter how smart you are i think money talks and it's very it's one of the things we were never taught and there's a way that you can also do research to actually make money yesterday i was speaking at a global mining conference and i was speaking about something new that i just done it's called a smart ring right uh it's just because i noticed for example if you if i was to bring that to nigeria and i've started my talk so you can just follow me um if i was to do the ring in nigeria it's, it kind of uses biosensor like you wear the ring it predicts or tells you on your phone like an app through your phone to tell you if you are doing well if your health is good or if your health is bad it came from the idea of using a smartwatch to do your exercise and something like that now, because I'm doing that in Australia, the first thing I thought of is what are the main problems in Australia in terms of health? In Australia, that I've lived and in South Africa and the rest part of the world, one of the major problems they have is iron deficiency. All right. So I did all my thoughts is okay, I have a lot of plants. If I was living in Nigeria, I would have done the ring to be measuring high blood pressure and diabetes. And we all know whatever measures that, imagine you are wearing a ring that tells you, my friend, the blood pressure is low on your phone, you get an alert, or you st stop eating sugar, enough of sugar, something like that. We know in Nigeria it will sell, right? Uh, but because I'm here, I targeted my market, which is also one of the things um, some people have been doing in Nigeria, but we need to do more in order to actually attract funding. So I grouped my talk into three. Really late, it's three after two, so apologies, my brain is slow. Um, the first part is I say, what's the trend? What's the trend? When I started my life in food, I started as a mechanical engineer. I did a machine, but we didn't know about commercialization, like I mentioned. Everybody wanted to go into oil and gas. I went to oil and gas, right? And then when I left the country, I only found funding in renewables. And I was able to have some inventions and innovations there that was commercialized. Now it was raining, it was trending in the places I was, I could get funding for it. The market was ready. But as I moved to Europe and I understand the trends of time, I knew that renewable energy was getting to a particular stage. So I understand the market. I always like to be ahead of the market in terms of my research and my, whatever I'm doing, right? People who have not been close to me would not know that I've actually left the journey of renewable energy over four years ago. Because now I know like, what about the materials that are used to mine, I mean, to, to build those renewable energy, right? In terms of, I saw windmill, I worked on solar farm across the world. I noticed like, you need to mine more copper in the next 10 years than the one we have mined in the last 500 years. So I'm like, oh, okay. 
why don't I go into mining? Because a lot of people are putting money on ground. And so that's what made me do the switch. So I now balance energy and mining. And I will attract fun because I know that's the trend, right? You can rope it around net zero. There's a bit of fight in this world. You don't want to also be caught in parties. So I try to follow the trend and understand the trend and stay ahead of the curve. You also need to identify a champion for your study, which I'm sure I've seen uh, Prof. Jonathan here. I've seen the people here, I've seen even Dr. Agu. I know people will do justice to this. There's a feedback here. So you also need to demonstrate impact in whatever research you are doing. Um, I'm being careful because I know we've been speaking about entrepreneurship, but my topic speaks on research. So I'm trying to mix both of it up. So if you are going to do a research, uh, you also need to tailor it such that it shows the, the demonstrate the particular impact you're doing. I'll give you an example. The place I currently work uh, is the largest mining, uh, is the largest private company in Australia. Now the owner is like Dan Gote in Nigeria. So she's the richest Australian, right? And I'm just two steps away from her. So, but I see this person is very passionate about research and stuff like that. So what did I do? I tried to look at what is she passionate about, right? I tried to do enough. So I always believe when you are a researcher, one of the things, and that's what I'm glad for. I'm not sure if he's still there, but from a colleague earlier spoke about identifying who, who was the best person to call the shots, to make the speech when they were doing their pitch. And when I say identify a champion, you know who can fund this, which is done by research. And you always ask questions. There are people here on this panel that can answer almost all your questions. So once you have a champion, that champion can help you. It could be one of the people I reached out to that helped me in the early stages of my life uh, is the MD of Crystal Laurel. I didn't know him. I just used LinkedIn very well. That was in 2011. I was looking for a job initially. I told you I did Pandel Jam, I did this. I did biodiesel, that's where I started from, from Jatro Fast Seed. And the guy was like, I can't employ you. If I employ you, I will, I will cage you. Now, instead of me to be offended by what man said, I became friend with him. And that guy has connected me to almost who is who, where is where in Nigeria. To the extent that last two years, I think, forming a, a company called Cruise to, to revamp all the antennas and masts all over Nigeria, which it's also an opportunity. So sometimes the research doesn't have to going towards the end. The research doesn't have to be cutting edge. When everybody's speaking about innovation, 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 the idea is let's face it, you still want to make money, right? Sometimes you stand on shoulder of what is there. If you go to Futa Museum, for example, there are, are thousand projects that can actually change the world that are lying down there. It's a matter of checking it. I don't know if we have repository now of all the thesis. If we don't have it, I think that's one of the things that um, I'm uh, noting also. Find that research. Look for the champion who was the supervisor, who was the student. You can reach out to them. And you can actually base your knowledge on that. And you can save the world. I was going to ask a question. That's why I was asking if they can see my, if you can see my screen. But I see the TV is small. So I was going to ask a question. Last year, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of patents that was filed at the European Patent Organization. Which university would you think would be among the top 10 that filed that patent around the world? Will anybody be able to, to answer me? Or maybe any organization, just off the top of your head. I won't waste time. There was no university in the top 100. So it shows you that innovation is done a lot in the industry as compared to the university. I was an academic at some point in my life and I thought we were doing research. I lead the research now for the company I said I am, even though I have my own practice. And the patent, for example, that who are we submitted last year? Uh, I don't know if I could share my screen, but. If I can't, um, the patent that who are we shared last year 
alone was more than 30,000. Now, that they, they built, that's Huawei, the company itself. I don't know. Yeah. So it shows like there are millions of research going on in the companies, which means if you have an idea, sometimes you just need to find the right people that need the idea. They are also able to work with you. And thank God for the things we've had today. You still own the moral right. The moral right definition is you can see how this thing is going to be done. For example, what I said I was working on, I've decided that because I know I'm testing it overseas before bringing it to Nigeria. Once I bring that technology to Nigeria, the first thing that the Christian world will say is I'm the one bringing CC6. Because you can stamp it on your hand like this. You can stamp it in your ring. And I'm expecting people to say, ah, this is the CC6 we are talking about, right? Because I know like there's a ticket for it elsewhere. If I've seen that there has worked, then I can bring it home. Let me finalize. Um, one of the problems I've seen, when I joined this organization, I tried to form a consortium with three universities, even though these are top 40 universities in the world. I've not been able to sign an NDA with them, like the non-disclosure agreement for the last three months. And that's from their legal team. That shows it's easy for, I know the professors that spoke now, it's, it's sweet when we say it, but really in the real life of it, when you want to actualize it, so when it comes to legal work. So you need to understand that. And I put this because I thought I would be able to preach this to the university. So you also need to be open to things like that. Have your NDA ready, read about it, such that when you are presenting or finding an investor, you, you, will, not, you will not be wasting time. Last part of it is I want to give an idea in terms of research that can be commercialized in Nigeria. The truth is there's a jackpot syndrome, either we like it or not. Everybody here has one or two people that has gone to UK. Let's start, let's stand alone in UK in the last one year. There's no Nigerian that doesn't know someone that has gone to UK. Now, when there's mobility, there's need for food. The greatest lacking thing outside Nigeria is Nigerian food, okay? Some people have broken that route and they are millionaires in pounds and dollars. Now, we have not really optimized how we have been doing our things. So while everybody is talking about IT, smart this, smart that, how about you doing a better way of frying dry fish? What I mentioned now, you will be shocked. I bring in palm oil from Nigeria to Australia, right? Uh, one keg, I can't even remember. The whole thing that I used to, to buy 200 liters, I think will be like maybe 200K. That thing will be sold for like 2.9 million in Naira. Okay. Now, there are systems that you can optimize. So when we say invention, when we say research, sometimes it doesn't need you to start something from scratch, okay? Process optimization alone is research. And that's why we're in school. And that's why people like Victor and other people, great men here that you can speak to as mentor can guide you. You don't have to have the uh, Albert Einstein mind in order to actually make it. Because I changed my view. I realized like, no matter how smart you are, if you don't have money, when you get a particular level in life, you become nobody, okay? No matter the million ideas you have, is the ones that you're able to commercialize that will make you fly. So think outside the box, identify the relevance, do internship if you can, and then stay persistent. People will say no to you. And of course, we need a good show, if, which I know uh, Victor is doing, and this is my advice to the new hub, the growth hub, if we can find funding and do a road show, I've mentioned two to him already. Road show is like traveling around the world, seeing two or three places, see how they do it. It makes it easy for them to also want to come and visit. And then for people like us that can facilitate funding, it also makes it easy for us. So the idea is follow the trend, identify a champion, tailor your proposal, and you don't have to be looking for cutting edge technology. Ordinary catfish changing how it's packaged and speaking to the right people, you will be shocked how much you can make. If you think about food, think about IT, and of course, understand the legality around it, and I'm sure we'll be all right. 
So apologies from here and there. It's like three three thirty. But I will be willing to answer any question maybe by LinkedIn or any other platform. So I appreciate you guys for what you are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's put our hands together for him. I mean, that's super, super amazing. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Craig? All right, we have how many questions? Okay, two. All right, so um, I think they're going to pass the mic around, so they're going to ask you the questions right now. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Craig, for that um, conversation and I hope now it was that conversation was actually I hope now for me seriously. Thank you, sir. My question goes in this um, aspect. I I don't know. He was talking about we exporting Nigerian um, foods to abroad, and okay, actually, precisely, I'm from Benue State, Doma, and we produce foods a lot. Um, or different things, and one of the challenges I see here is that these people they don't have that. Uh, there's this kind of challenge that they don't have that access to to take these goods to outside the country, and there's this kind of maybe kind of fear or I don't know. So my question is, how can we bridge that gap now? How can we? Okay, how can we? Is, is there any, any drums and Okay, how can we overcome this uh, this challenge? Yes, this challenge, so that we're able to export these materials. Okay, do I answer straight, or I should listen to the second question? The answer first. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. You didn't mention your name, but thank you so much, my brother from Benway. Um, straight up to it. The truth is. There's more challenge in actually taking that food inside the country than taking it out of Nigeria. Taking it out of Nigeria is not a problem. The roots are ready. And that's why I'm saying people like Victor, this is why this hub, I believe, it's for, right? Um, for example, what we did, I what we did is try to share butter, Ori. I don't know if you know it. It's a big market outside the world, outside Nigeria, huge. Now, share butter. We have a lot in Nigeria, but you don't even know who is who, how it's called. But now, what your people can do, let me, before I give you an example, is you need collaboration, like corporate, like a cooperative, like group of people. Because it's easier if you have like 10, five farmers that are doing this thing, and I'm guarantee of supply, okay? Because for example, the palm oil is packed in Nigeria. I don't take it out in cakes. It's packed, it's labeled, everything is done before it leaves Lagos. So it comes in the container, Test, I already do all the tests and standards in Lagos. So when it gets to Australia again, then we do the quarantine and the other stuff that we do. For your people, you need to, which you can do. You don't think you are too young or too, you can, you can actually champion it. Go there, find 10 to 10 people, for example, that can work together. You can be their mouth. Because one of the things I do and I'm passionate about is my grandmothers were farmers and I know they were ripped off. So it's even on the bottles that says like 10% of this proceed goes directly to the owners and the growers of that produce. Okay, like you go apart from that, the fact that I bought it from you, but because I've made so much profit, I still give back 10% directly to the owners or those people that grow it, which is a lot of money for them. Imagine you selling a Congo of rice, for example. Um, I don't know. They call a bag of rice. They say bag of rice. I don't know how much is that. Let's say seventy thousand naira, and then somebody is buying that seventy thousand and selling it for two hundred thousand, and they are buying it for you for seventy thousand from your village. You don't have to take it out. If you understand what I'm saying, so it saves you a lot of cost. At the same time, they come back and give you extra twenty thousand. If I can guarantee like that product has not been adulterated and you are selling your original. So that's how to do it. We can't do it individual. You can't deal with individual farmers. If you can form a group, it's easy. Then that representative of the group, who could be you, you don't even need to know a lot about it. People like Victor will guide you in terms of how to organize people like that and then how to be their face. And then you can interface with people like me or he will bring the direct people that you can speak to and then 
you yeah. can't get commercialized. So that's that would be my but the challenge is not taking it out of Nigeria. The challenge is meeting the standards out of Nigeria, but it can be done. It's already been done. Okay, thank you very much for the session so far. My name is Victoria, and there was a part where you mentioned teaching when um, I'm looking for funding for your research idea, that you mentioned that you should look for someone that is confident, that can answer all the questions when you are pitching. So I don't know if you are familiar with like a platform on YouTube, they call them the lions, that you pitch your idea. So, and most of what I see, in terms of equity, you can have this, okay, you already have your equity terms. And when they slash it for you, you are like, do you want to collect my business from me? So I don't know, is there any way you can stand your ground in terms of equity or it's just like that? That's how it has been done in the business world. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Victoria. They are actually called the sharks, not lion. They are called the sharks. And they are called shark because shark eat fish. Uh, the Yorubas will say, the truth is, rich people are reapers. Take it or leave it. If you really want to be extremely wealthy, you'll be ruthless. One of the principles that now that we're exposed to it, one of the principles we'll find very wealthy people using is this, all of them read this for ten minutes of power, right? If you read that book or listen to it, it's free on Spotify. You will see that this is what every rich person does in the times of they want to rip you off and they want to take advantage of you. But you can position yourself in this in a state where I need their help, but they need me more. And that's why you need to create value around your time. That, I think that's what this growth hub is all about. They won't just leave you hanging, right? So one thing I believe is you don't sell an idea that is not sellable yet. Okay, there are you imagine you finding the biggest diamond mine in the world. And then you just quickly took small and then you say, me too, me too. People will rip you off generally, but they will coach you. But what I'll tell you is if you have sold something, it's as simple as this. I think one of the popular saying in Nigeria is the difference between someone that says, I took 100 naira and when I, I use 100 naira to make this product and I sold it for 200, I've done a wonderful job. If you are doing that presentation to me, I'll just say, okay, can I pay you 2,000 and um, I own 95% or 99% of your business. Now imagine someone who has come and said, I bought this product and 100% in investment, I, I turn it around to 200% profit. That means, you know, just by saying that, the way I'm looking at you is already different from how I'm looking at the other guy that is in the era. And you see a bus driver that will tell you if you interview a driver, a, a cab driver, if I'm a cab driver and I want to switch to DHL, when you're asking me what's my experience, I can tell you I'm the one that decides when people and materials start from place to places. I determine the destination of places. I determine the comfort of my clients. I determine, I, I engage my clients in an interactive position. You see what I'm saying? I'm still saying I'm a driver. I do timely delivery and you, you create so much package. At the end of the, how many years of experience? If you want to go by tenure, um, it's, it's, it's unlimited. I've been covered all over the globe. I've been spent so many hours on the job. Because you need a lot of hours on the job, especially in traffic in Lagos. So you see, you see, having have to walk through stress period and having encountered very difficult clients. Those are hard bureaus, right? A very difficult clients. Be able to navigate this situation and have scaled through. Now I'll be like, oh, this is the kind of person I need for my logistic business. I'll make you the manager of my logistic company before they realize that you were a driver. <laughs> and someone else would have said, ah, I drove Tipa from Abeoguta to Akure. The road was tough. I faced a lot of food lumps on the way. I have 10 years experience as a driver. I can manage logistics. There's difference. And I think those are the things they will teach you. Those people that are ready to eat, you also know like you can come back next week or next year or next 10 years to buy them off if your idea is actually worth it. And I pray God will help all of you. Thank you so much for that. Let, let's put our hands together for him.
It has been so, so, so amazing. Uh, thanks, Dr. Craig, for that. Um, really, really appreciate the time. I know it's around 3 a.m. there in Australia. I mean, it's it's crazy. But thank, thanks for that. Let's bring us together once again for him. So uh, uh, just a quick one. So uh, we're actually working with a number of uh, partners uh, on the Campus Innovation Labs. So and um, he himself is also part of those that are working with us too. So the interesting part of Campus Innovation Labs is very funny. Uh, we are planning to partner with some major uh, universities across the globe. So we'll likely be having exchange programs. Uh, e is actually part of those that we're working together on that. And um, we're also going to be working with some major hubs so that we can have some exchange. Interestingly, we're likely having something with CC Hub and some other you know, hubs in Kenya and the like, so that those that come to the program are really, and they are really, really good. I can actually send you on, you know, the roadshow and even exchange programs, you know, for you to go and learn a lot outside of the country. So it's not just another, you know, program here and there. It's actually like a very, very solid one. Somebody asked me and said, why are you doing all this? Can I just carry your money and be okay, you know? Because we're actually investing a lot. Apart from building a hub, you know, you're trying to work on partnership, you're spending money. But I think for me, the thinking is, I grew up from here. You know, I did undergrad here. I started business on campus. It's been 17 years on the road. Uh, we, we don't have all the money we're looking for. I mean, I don't have all the money that some of my guys that are looking at me have anyway. But um, <laughs> don't mind me. So, um, I mean, we've tried, you know, in building stuff, but the least we can do is to also like raise, you know, the next generation. But it's beyond the next generation and party thing. Building real businesses is good money, right? If you build a good business and it sparks up well, very good. My hope is that we can have very serious young people, you know, uh, that can actually come to this program and be amazing. So uh, we have just two sessions more before we end today. Are you tired? I mean, I know people are tired. I know people are tired. So, uh, but the interesting thing is, majority of people that come to speak on this program, if I want, if we want to pay them, you know, we likely be paying about average of five hundred dollars an hour. They're about to each of them, minimum, like minimum, because that's like what I charge on a normal day. So, you know, but um, uh, I appreciate the fact that they are here. We still have two more sessions to go. Uh, so, but again, it's it's going to be something very useful for everybody. So I have um, Dr. Agu. Dr. Agu is the pioneer director of research and development in NITDA. How many of us know NITDA? So NITDA is like the top most agency in the country in terms of technology development. So he's a pioneer director of research and development. He's going to be on this panel. And then we have Dr. Bolu, uh, Bolu Tifea Oluwadele. And, Olu and um, he's, he has over 20 years experience in finance. Right, is a major consultant. He, if you check, I don't, I, we can't count his number of articles on Business Day. I know they ask a lot of opinions on that. And I think we're also going to be having Professor Onye Kweli join us. Um, you can just let me know. Um, is it what you check? No, it says that we should let him know when he's not fine. So, all right, Professor Onye Kweli is there. So, I'm just going to be taking this very quickly. All right. So thanks, uh, professors and doctors, for, for having this conversation. And um, we're talking about, you know, attracting funding, attracting funding for R&D and um, for, you know, uh, commercialization. There are two other persons that are supposed to be on this panel, Timame Wanyoke. She's in Kenya, but, you know, she had to leave office because we had already delayed in time. And um, also, Dr. Craig has to go and sleep. But I think we have amazing people here that will trash this conversation for us. So my first question will be to, do, to Dr. Agu. You know, um, I knew you when you have not retired. Meanwhile, Dr. Agu just retired a month ago from public service. So I knew Dr. Agu when he had not retired. And um, when it comes to championing robotics, you know, um, what's called PI, you know, development of technology in Nigeria. It's not the foremost platform. In fact, they developed the first platform in Nigeria to test run, you know, um, hardware engineering online, live. It was the pioneer for that. Now, I want to ask you, Dr. Agu, what do you think are the challenges um, that you've faced in terms of funding R&D, uh, both from the private 
the uh, you know private collaboration aspect and then the government you know funding availability what are the kind of challenges you faced and what do you think those challenges still exist or what do you think should have been done about it that we are trying to work on this now can benefit from so let me start from you dr ago on that Uh, th uh, thank you, Tunde, for having me, and uh, congratulations on this uh, laudable initiative. I think um, you, yeah, it deserves a lot of um, I had that with the kudos. Well done. Um, you know, so uh, uh, just want to mention that I'm uh, the pioneer and the director. Yeah, yeah. I'm currently the chief digital architect of uh, TD4 Power IoT Hub, uh, but because of time, I'll just move straight. Um, you know, uh, see, one of the challenges of R&D, I think, uh, let's go to the basics first. Let's go to the basics. One of the challenges of R&D is actually commercialization to a great extent. And that is why most of these products they lie on the shelf. So the big question is, why do they still lie on the shelf? First of all, it has to go now with our mentality of having, you know, there's this spirit of consumerism we Nigerians have, but general Africans, we prefer foreign goods. And thank God that the government has risen you know, much and they develop what they call the local content policy, where people are compelled not to really want to patronize, um, you know, uh, our, our products. Because we know without that, there can be no innovation. It's that Randy that actually drives uh, uh, innovation. So the first challenge we have is what they call local patronage. You may have a product yeah. you have developed, but Nigerians will look at it as being inferior. We call normally use the word outdated, evil minute, those days, okay? Meaning inferior, or they'll tell you, maybe Taiwan made or what have you. So that mentality now is already going away. And uh, and it's because you know, they got government has taken up a local, con uh, local content policy. It's so serious that even if that, we put it for the all NDAs. And we actually look at the local uh, local content of any scope of work uh, you're also bringing it. I'll let you to Tarant is what we call funding, okay? I, 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 I can't think of any bank in Nigeria today you will go with an idea and they will give you loan. They will ask you to bring document from God, or they will ask you to bring collateral, and so on and so forth. So what we call the VC ecosystem is not fully mature, though we are doing gradually well, that's internally. Then again, the angel investor atmosphere is not fully mature, that's where we can have individuals that can bring up their money and then fund your ideas. That landscape is gradually changing, thank God. People are beginning to invest gradually, but it's still very, 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 very slow. Then another thing is what they call skills. Uh, currently, I'm chairing the Technical Working Group Research, Development, Innovation of the Nigerian Content Consultative, Consultative Forum under the uh, Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board. Most of you must have had this institution. Um, it's uh, a regulator in oil and gas industry. And then the discussions we are having now is how do we be capability in emerging technologies like Internet of Things, AI, Big Data, for us to educate people on how they can use such skills to, you know, conduct research and then start developing solutions to our products. I mean, to some of our challenges. So skills are very, very important because we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. So how many people today, sorry, including professors, I have to mention that, have up-to-date skill sets? And that is why under the Nigeria Society of Engineers, I've been up, up advocating for upskilling and reskilling of the workforce in line with the tenets of the fourth industrial revolution. Without that, most I bet you most of the professors at the university may not know what is called IoT. I'm not trying to underrate them in any way. My dad is also a prof. They may not know the full concept of AI. Okay. So there's need for us to re, you know, reskill them up, you know, create workshops where we can create awareness in these areas. And then they can see how they can apply it in some of their daily um, daily um, uh, daily act, act, act activities. Another another big problem is what they call collaboration. Collaboration, your know, cooperation. These are things that drive R and D. How many academia, how many universities have partnership with external organizations and working on a particular project? Do we have any part of a problem solving initiative that is assessed to a, an institution in Nigeria or assessed to research um, uh, a research organization in Nigeria? So these are some of the because of that these are some of the key problems and you know I have identified yeah. and they're going for that I'll try to give an advice of sources of funds when it comes to especially hardware. Hardware is actually the driver of most of this technology today. Unfortunately, Nigeria there's a big vacuum we, we are which TD Papa is trying to address. Thank you very much, Tunde. I think I'll leave the floor for other people because of time. 
Amazing, amazing. I, I mean, um, I know, I know the kind of work you have done at City for Pi, and uh, a, a lot of work you did at Nida, and we are hoping to consolidate on that as we partner on, on this journey as well. Um, very, I, I want to ask Professor Yekwelu this. You know, Professor Yekwelu was the, he was at some point the director of the Business Development Center in Futa, Futa BDC. And um, at some point as well, you know, I mean, he is also a professor, you know, a researcher. Now, I, I want you to tell us how you were able to balance between attracting funding for the various initiatives you have tried to build by yourself. I know Professor Yekulu is, a, is an investor himself, invested in a number of businesses. What are the approaches you have adopted, you know, to be able to raise funding personally? for the businesses you have interest in and taking a look at, you know, an institution where you led as well. Were you able to attract external funding maybe to drive BDC or other things you wanted to do at the time? I don't know if, if Prof can take that up. Prof, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me. Um, let me start with, um, with BDC. Um, I was in BDC for four and a half years. And um, with BDC, it's um, it's a typical typical business company, just like another business in Nigeria, um, but down domiciled in the university. So attracting external funding in this case does not apply. But what we did in BDC was to upscale the businesses that we have in the university, and to make them run like um, like independent business. So. Uh, the first thing we did when I got there was to separate the business from the run of, the run of the university. We had to tell the vice chancellor that this is a business, a limited liability company uh, with its own board, with its um, responsible to FIRS and to all the other bodies. We needed to pay our tax, we needed to make profits, we needed to also manage it like a company. So we diversified for the university. Um, I asked the university to withdraw their staff, all the staff working there, and then we need to employ our own because if, uh, if, if I use the university staff, while I'm going to have a lot of lethargy in that place, many of them will not do work the way they do it. They will resume by eight and by two, they will go, they sit under the tree. So we need to do it like real business. And then the university withdraw their staff and then we had to employ our own staff. And then we give them the terms of engagement. And then we, are, we also became uh, profit driven. Okay. We set targets for each of the businesses and then expanded the ones we can. So we started with what we have and we grew the company and expanded it. And then before I left, it became a very profit um, oriented company, um, uh, paying all the staff and then giving the university. 25% of our profits, running back to the university and also doing some projects for the university and the profits were running into millions. And then we also established some other aspects or some other business. So um, it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it was a, it's a pure business and then we're still doing it that way. So um, run it like the way you run a normal business, um, um, set target for yourself and then achieve the targets. Now, um, as a researcher, yes, I have attracted uh, funding from outside Nigeria. In fact, um, I would like to say that all my, my, my research funding came from outside Nigeria. Um, our, my friend Collins was talking about partnering with universities. Yes, I have partnership with some universities outside Nigeria. And then we do projects together. Uh, the only thing there is um, we need to... We need to grow up in Nigeria. I like the way uh, Mr. Agu started. We don't believe in ourselves. And that thing is a very big problem. Now, we would rather believe in product that come from outside, even research out, out from outside, than the research we do in Nigeria. And I know that we do some great research. Um, investors would rather put their money in product from outside Nigeria than product that is developed in Nigeria. But one thing we must know is that product development is incremental, okay? I may produce, he was talking about made in Taiwan. In those days, 
made it all made in China, things you don't buy. But they mm -hmm. built on what they have and they increased gradually. And today they have very beautiful products we can buy. So we must believe in ourselves. We don't believe in ourselves. So even the research funding that is given to Nigeria, Nigerians by Ted Fund, I tell you, is nothing to drive to drive good research. Research is expensive. You know, um, we don't have people giving endowments. I I studied in Germany, I did my PhD in Germany. And I know that companies, okay, endow billions into research every year. Now, I have colleagues there who are also professors, and the amount of money they assess to do research, it's, it is enormous. So they, they, they cannot fail. So you find that somebody applies to a TED fund, and TED fund gives the person maybe 30 million, and it's a big money. The question is, how much fund, how much research can 30 million actually drive? I still mm -hmm. know it. It's, 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 it's a little money. So um, I, I had a partnership with um, the Technical University of Munich, and uh, we have attracted fundings, and we have done some research that uh, have produced great results. And um, um, there are some of them um, in the university have established some plantations. I'm a forester. So we did some work on um, on um, uh, domestication of some fruit trees, and then we see driving that and see going that. So um, yes, there are opportunities to attract funding, and then we don't have much in Nigeria. Actually, we're supposed to have companies come to university and endow, okay, endow chairs, endow uh, uh, research funding. And when I when I the second time I went to Germany on uh, postdoc, the company that sponsored me coming to Nigeria to do my um, my field work is actually uh, steel. Steel is this company that produces this um, um, uh, this um, uh, chainsaw machine that used to fell tree. They also do um, lawn mowing machine. They also do tractors and everything. Those guys endowed billions to the Department of Wood Technology in the Technical University of Munich. And they're the ones that sent me back to Nigeria to come and collect data, you know, for, for the research we're doing. So, well, let me round up. You all said, yes, I'm also an, uh, uh, an entrepreneur. I'm also an investor um, because I, 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 I believe that um, for us to make impact, we must also go beyond the forward of the university and uh, also do some things that will get us money to also drive a lot of things. Um, to also sponsor people, I have sponsored and still sponsoring many people, and I know my salary cannot take me to that. So I ventured into a lot of investment, and I'm still doing that. And um, when I retire, like uh, my my brother Agu, I want to retire into a place that will you know, have fund that is uh, revolving, so that we can all be relevant in the society. So I think I'll rest there. On if you have more, I'll, 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 thank you. Yeah, well, I'll see. I have one question back for you, Prof, on this endowment because this is one of these I want to tap into for Sir Campus Labs. Um, I, I want to go to Dr. Bolu Tife. Interestingly, you know, I, I brought elderly, very elderly, amazing people with experience on this call. Um, Dr. Bolu Tife, um, you have been in the funding space for years and in the finance space for years. I literally met you on this, you know, and um. I want to ask this. Do you think that there are some hacks, like hacks, I'm using HACK, like hacks, you know, that we can assess or that we can leverage to attract both R&D funding and commercialization funding? I mean, from your wealth of experience, what have you seen so far that we can just play, you know, some tight games, you know, according to your own experience, that can make us get funding for commercialization and for research itself. Uh, Dr. Bolutife. Thank you for having me on this platform. Uh, I think the basic thing is like our attitude has to change towards uh, R&D. That, that has to be a wholesome uh, paradigm shift, you know, in, in the society as it were. Uh, again, we, we also have to learn to do things collaboratively. Most of the thing that the challenge we have is like somebody wants to do the research, somebody wants to, um, you know, develop the idea, somebody wants to commercialize it, somebody wants the same person wants to sell it. 
So there are times what you do is do you develop, you patent, and you sell, and you move on to another thing. But mm -hmm. this, you know, this mentality of we want to do everything by ourselves creates a lot of, you know, it distracts us from, uh, you know, being an expert in anything, we want to do everything by ourselves. Is the way our society is structured. Again, because we are busy doing everything, we become a bit unbackable. unbackable. See, yeah, again, I have that problem again is more of uh, in the banking sector. Our banking sector, unfortunately, do not put money in, in things like this. They are more interested in buying and selling. I give you money in three months or two months, you pay back your money. So they don't they don't finance something long term, which is very bad. They they give money to those who want to import, uh, or they give uh, the open die of credit if you want to export. Again, even our exporting, there are a lot of challenges that are here, here and there. So we need that paradigm shift where we need a orientation. Then we need to bridge the gap between industry and researchers. In the the normal thing is for industry to go to the researchers for product development, for product upgrading. But we do there is this gap, I mean there is this gulf between them that the industry and the researcher they are they are operating a different world. It's like a, a parallel line they, that we never meet. Then you you, you see government, it's like government just uh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm not an anti government. They don't seem to have done the, their work very well. Their policy, I don't know, on uh, uh, industry it seems to be a little, a bit awkward that they just throw money at things they don't know what they are throwing money at. It's just, it's not just a case of we are putting 30 billion naira down to do this, to, to do research. To do research on what? I, I have written with one of my books that look, if the, the kind of manpower we have in our university today, Nigeria should be able to solve our electricity problem. If we if we want to harness the brain, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and all sort of allied uh, study that we have in place, if government is truly determined to use our resources to solve our problem, I mean, I think I wrote article, I don't write for business day. I usually write for uh, premium times and the guidance. I, I was one of those that were criticizing okay. the white brain in cement to fix our electricity. Why not put half of those money? I mean, put I mean, three or four universities and bring them together in the collaborative effort. So look, we want to, we want to develop a modular system for our electricity. So by, maybe by today now, we would have uh, resolved those problems. So there are, there are so many fundamental issues uh, that makes even funding itself become very difficult. Then the guy that is doing research, they lack sometimes there is insufficient documentation. There's there so many things. I think earlier on, I had somebody saying, to you, when you want to pitch, the fact that you are developing a process, but you are not good at pitching, rather than hiring somebody to do the pitching for you so that you know, uh, somebody who can speak better or speak very well to the product. But we, we have this mentality, I want to do everything by myself. I usually give this analogy that, in Nigeria, we have to own a rabbit to be to to be the full owner of a rabbit than to be to share maybe a head, I mean a, a cow, and they give me a head of a cow. You know, a head of a cow you can get about four or five rabbits from it. But an average person, an average researcher, want to own a rabbit so that he knows he's the only one that is doing it. So all this bottleneck creates problem for you know, with with uh, with funding. Then our Talking about the endowment, even before Professor mentioned it, I've noted it in my in my daughter here. That look, we need a lot of endowment. What are our wealthy men? What are they putting money on? Sometimes, me, let's say you you um you go to hospital and you take your loved one there, the electricity went off, and or something happened, or an equipment failed, you you lost that person. You say okay, because of the pain you. you your experience. You want to now put money in that university, that is your hospital, so that what will occur to your relative again. This is how this happens elsewhere. People uh, are challenged by a cause that is dear to their heart and they put their money there. But what does what will our people do? They would rather spend money on politicians in party. 
it's a part of our culture. It makes us, you know, live well. It makes us smile. I'm not saying those things are not good. But then, we, 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 if you can channel part of those things to endow uh, good research work in, in every area, in, in agriculture, somebody, the guy was talking from Benny, the other, other time was asking questions. The yeah. enormous wastage of uh, farm produce in Nigeria. This is an area that calls for serious research. How can we unless this? We are not unnecessary even our efforts. So there are so many gaps that are there, but then we are not doing this properly for even for it to be financed. So why should we always develop? I mean, they, they depend on foreign donors or foreign um, organization to fund our researches. Look at what um, uh, Prof. Jonathan was saying. Down to that, he and I had yeah. to send him back to Nigeria yeah. to come and do research. So, what are money? What are they doing with their money? So, and our <laughs> back, why is why why do they focus on short-term businesses, buy and selling? Yeah. No. So, those are the challenges. If our charity begins at home, then we'll be able to expand further beyond that. So those are the issues, those are the critical yeah. issues. And, and, I'm, and I'm going to be asking so that we can. Sorry, can you hear me, Pro? Can you hear me, Doctor? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, so, Fine. I mean, this is a very valid, very, very valid concerns. Very, very valid concerns. So what I want to do is to ask Prof. Jonathan, uh, Prof. Yekwile, a very interesting question, um, especially around the endowment funds. Uh, we are trying to set up an alumni funding, right? An alumni investment pool, but we're also trying to assess endowment funds, you know. Um, Prof, how do you think should be the best approach to gathering a lot of endowment funds, uh, especially if we don't have maybe professors like you in those universities? Is it possible for us to just approach a university and say, we want to partner with you as a third party you know, research institution or research entity, you know, that uh, is operating in Nigeria. What what should be the ideal approach to getting this endowment fund if adventure we want to accept from a third party angle? Is it even possible in the first place? And what, what are the likely you know approach? Thanks, bro. It's um it's very possible and actually it's one of the one of the major right ways to go. Um how do you do it? Um, normally people do endowment. Sometimes, actually, they would not, let's say, for example, um, somebody who is very wealthy and he decides, okay, um, I feel I want um, people to do uh, research on climate change. And then he comes to a university and endows um, some quite amount of money and say, this is, for, this is for this type of research. And then he can call it a name, he can endow a chair, um, um, alumni, partnering with alumni is also a possibility. Um, in this case, it has to be probably you come to the university, maybe you come to FUTA, and then you ask that the university should um, uh, establish a, a kind of an endowment fund where people are going to put pool of money, but then it must be well managed. And uh, because one of the things that people don't like is where money is endowed, and then people misuse it. So there has to be a kind of a board, a kind of a board that's going to monitor it. And there must be people with impeccable character. People that are uh, the society that people believe in, they know that they will use the money for what it is. People that will not work on sentiment, okay? To say, okay, just like sometimes we do with debt fund, I will say that two people got it from Southwest, uh, two people from Southeast, so two must get it from the north. Even though those two people are not that qualified, they don't have that, their research idea is not as good as people from the West. You say there must be further character in doing that. In um, in um, an endowment, it doesn't work that way. And once that endowment uh, succeeds, other people will put into that. Uh, so there could be an endowment fund that is a put people putting money there. Okay. I will give, I'll give an example of one they do in Germany. Um, they call it um, friends and partners of tomb. Now, friends and partners of tomb is an endowment fund, an endowment fund that was created by the university and the alumni. And the alumni people 
put in money there money. and then the university the university will um we give it out for 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 research for development and for whatever okay so it's still running up to today um as an alum as an alumnus of the university i get news, newsletter to that effect anybody can contribute to what amount now these friends and partners of TUM have done quite a great deal of work uh, i mean the money they contribute they've done quite a great deal i have been a beneficiary of it um the first time i when i was in my phd they sponsored me to come to nigeria and do and my data collection okay i got that from friends and partners of tomb from the endowment fund okay so it's very possible and it's the right it's way very to go and yes but please before i leave that there's something some three points i will want to uh uh, uh chip in uh, one of the big problems we are having that are affecting r d in nigeria is lack of enabling environment i'll give two recent experience i had um which we also all of us have those of us in futa we know that um two days ago the students locked up the gates because right now we ration power we ration light now as a researcher i don't have light to do my research I have to buy my generator if I have to do that. Okay. I, have, I just came back from, from, from a journey. I spent three days in a research institute. Again, I repeat, research institute. Three days. For those three days, from 8 a.m. to five p.m. When when they when they closed from eight to five p.m. There was no light. Now, I ask myself, how are they supposed to conduct research? It's not possible. So we need to put the, the enabling environment. And then secondly, please, there's a lie we have. Let me not call it a lie, but something we have, we have been saying for many years, that government cannot fund research. Please, I have always disagreed. 80% of research worldwide is funded by government. Some of you may have heard of DAD, which is the German Academic Exchange Program. You must have heard of um, DFG, that fund research all over the world. Okay, you have, yeah. must, have, must have heard of um, uh, EZR. Now, the government of Germany puts in billions in this every year for research. Yeah. So um, I just felt I should mention these two things. But uh, in addition to this, yes, one of the ways to drive R&D is endowment. And this endowment, all of us can actually be part of it. All of us can contribute. It is little drops of water that make your mind push. Thank you so much for that. Thanks so much for that, Prof. And we're we are going to be having you as part of that. I think I already told you for the FUTA uh, endowment, we're going to be having you as part of that. Um, I, I have one very, one uh, major question for Dr. Agu uh, because I know we want to round up this session. Um, from the government side, Dr. Agu, uh, I just just for information and for people that want to tap into this, uh, can you give us an idea of maybe some? I am aware of a recent policy that was established. You know, there is um, looking into R and maybe opportunities that researchers can tap into on the government side that you are aware of uh, maybe you can just give us a brief lay down of that if there are any well um um okay fine um i would okay i think i just have to mention this anyway there are quite some opportunities even um even need that organization where i used to work national it development agency sometimes um, we support research i wouldn't want to use the word funding because the amount involved is just too funny anyway you know but i said to support for we support i mean uh, r d yeah. where we have sometimes students write to us universities individuals they make a presentation of what they do normally for you know we normally support them not use the word funding okay but they have to say that you know we have uh, some very big players when it comes to R and D funding. Uh, Tech Fund has been mentioned already. I think basically every year there is a publication by Tech Fund really? where they identify priority areas or the areas of their interest for research papers or ideas to be submitted for funding. I think we have some funding up to fifty million. I've um, participated in some of those um, 
projects like the um, like the drone team of Unitos. I'm a member of that, and I've been funded by a TED fund. However, one of the biggest uh, funding government funding agencies for research and development is the Nigerian Content um, Development and Monitoring Board. I don't know if they'd be happy if I, if I mention this. Uh, they have an R&D fund of close to, let me just use the word, above $20 million. They have a fund. Last time I checked, let me use the word, last time I checked, they have an R&D fund. So you can go online, to, uh, go, uh, check their site, ncmdp.gov.ng. They have an R&D fund, but however, they normally fund the R&D activities that are oil and gas centric. So it has to be within the oil and gas um, uh, sector before they could, uh, you know, they, they, could, they could fund that. Then uh, generally we have like NIDA, we'll talk more about NIDA. We have what they call collaboration. Collaboration is that you can have a project that is ongoing, uh, you know, where NIDA can also support because the collaborative uh, approach. So I'll give you a typical example. Uh, right now, the TD for Power IoT Hub, uh, we're developing a system called Dark Remo. That's acronym for data acquisition and remote monitoring. So it's supposed to monitor things like uh, energy systems like your fuel diesel tank and also monitor all these uh, you know, beans, waste beans, you know, making it smart and so on and so forth. That very research is being uh, funded by NIDA through a third party. I can feel everything. However, I'm also digressing. One of the greatest challenges we have in Iran, this is you mentioned about government. I think I can talk freely since I've led the government. We don't have an accountability system when it comes to R&D. What I mean is I will have a lot of research agencies owned by the government, like um, places like NASDA, National, uh, National Aerospace Research Development Agency, NAPDA, Biotechnology, everything. So the big question is that, is there anybody that normally adds them what is the result from the money government government has put in the previous year or do they just go there and they open up a new topic and start defending and they get funding so i feel that the funding of yeah. r and by the government should be monitored closely and money should not be released immediately that is the mistake we are making this part of the world you release money in transits you don't release immediately you divide it to three parts, 30 percent work done the person makes a presentation makes a demo then you release the next batch of funding you release the next batch the moment you release the whole money people start marrying second wife as it has been raised already the money goes for something else uh i think i will stop here thank you very much thank you so much i mean that's in our way off i'm hoping that um, we can get maybe the list of those um, R and D um, funding sources, and we can publish it on the platform for researchers that are interested. So, my last question for Dr. Bolutifer on this: um, When it comes to corporate governance uh, for raising uh, funding for commercialization, can you give us just like maybe three tips in terms of corporate governance that should be in place for either R and D base or businesses that want to, you know, get commercialized. Just maybe three tips. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. The number one thing which I always uh, advocate for, keep good record. Keep good record of your activities. Then separate your, the owner's, the researcher finance from, if you, if you, are, if you are doing research as a business, make, make sure you register your business. Any money that is channeled through the, the company should go to a company's accounts. It should be in the bank. There should be a trace of, oh, you received 10 uh, million for such. It should not be in your personal account. So then you have to make sure that, I mean, your, your account is properly audited. Then all the all your processes, all what you want to have done has to be properly documented. Actually, these are the, one of the reasons that when you go to the bank, you approach the bank and say you are not bankable. Because they cannot separate between your personal finance and the finance of the, the, the investment that you are, you, are, you are doing. So these are the basic needs that you have to do. Documentation, keep proper record, maintain a separate account between uh, the business and the, and, the, and, and the owner. So when you do all these things, then you are putting yourself in, in, in the way that even when somebody, for instance, if you want to buy a business, you want to do your due diligence. If I come, if you ask for uh, a, a, an investment as somebody comes and say, okay, can I see your book? So what will you, you are not just going to go to give him the receipt or all that. You have to you have a proper book of accounts. You have to have your account properly audited. You have to be able to show a documentation of your process. 
then the assets that are owned by, by, by the business are separate from personal assets. So when you do all these basic things, then you 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 are in a position you know, to to be endowed or to be financed for 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 R and D. So it's not it's not a case about settlement. You may have the best idea in the world if you don't have all this uh, structure in place. If it, then it depends on um, how long you you are from. You may at least have a board. If you cannot have a board of director because you don't want to pay them at the minimum, have a board of advisors. So and let them. I mean, and there should be documentation about that. That okay, it's not a case. You just have uh, put people names as okay. These are my advisors. No, they have to be registered as as advisor. No, the the idea will be to have board of directors. But again, uh, we 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 like to cut corners uh, sometimes because we don't want to pay. We we want to have uh, free advisors. Then we have board advisors. Then our board of directors. Those are the kind of story you have to have in place. Thank uh, you. To be able to a transfer funding. Thank, thank you so much. I, I think we're having a network break. From here. We are hearing you. We are hearing you. Oh, OK. I think it's from Zen. Because he's speaking on YouTube. I can see him on YouTube, actually. Um, maybe it's his network. The, All right, there, thank there's you. A, so there's a lag and there's a gap between the director yes. and the YouTube. So there's some minutes, a uh, few seconds in tower. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And let's let's put together. Let's let's put hands together for the panel. Meanwhile, we we might appear small here, but we have a number of viewers on YouTube actually. So because we did it both virtual and physical, so I can see. A number of our viewers online uh, thank you so much i mean this has been an amazing uh amazing power pack session and uh, we're going to be having the last session right now let's bring us together once again so the the last session will not be like a panel panel so just be a normal conversation um and two things i want to do i'll just ask questions from the two people that are going to be coming on the board but i also allow for Anybody in the audience that you have things you are not clear about to ask, and then we will round up. Is that okay? So um, at the end of the day, the editing, some cutting, we're going to send to everybody, you know, so that people can actually rewatch some of this panel and learn a lot as much as possible. So uh, without wasting our time, let me put your hands together for me as you welcome Pankolo Laleko and then Mark Afolabi. Let's put as good as we have both of them to join me. Let's, let's have the second mic. So interestingly, they are very amazing people to me. So Pankolo Leko is my co-founder at Extra Mile Africa. Uh, for some of us that are familiar with Extra Mile Africa, we might know uh, is an, um, a very great business. We started as a FinTech and then pivoted into assets management, real estate. So if you have heard of Extra Mile homes and properties, or you've heard of, you know, extra farm and a number of other amazing things, extra cook. That is Bank Olalika. Let's put hands together for him once again. He's richer than I am, so I'm I'm happy to hear that he answered me to come around. <laughs> then on my right is Mark Afolabi. I don't know how many of us have heard of Vela Finance. Uh Vela Finance is one of the best, you know, fintech in the crypto exchange space. Or let me not just say crypto, but I think uh let's say digital payment, yeah digital payment space and then um, recently they were acquired by carbon you know so when i said that some people are here the other time they are almost maybe richer than me i know what i'm saying anyway let's run together for both of them and um, please thank you so much for coming around i really appreciate you know not every time do you reach out to people like two, one week before an event and they cancel what they are doing for you i really appreciate it thank you so much so we are supposed to take a session on how to approach growth business growth from end to end. We made it the last session because we, had, we, we expect that people that are participants of this will learn a lot. Uh, before we pivoted Extra Mile, I think the Extra Mile reached about, 100, about over 100,000 users and across about 12 to 16 states in the country. And uh, before Vela sold, I think you had over 50,000 users, if I'm right, yeah. So how do you grow something from little, from one customer 
with when you have 50,000 customers. You may be money point that has over 1 million businesses. So I want to start. Okay. I want to, thank you. I want to start from Mike, you know, uh, Mark rather. Did you think Vela was going to be that big when you're starting out? Yes, yes. So I think um, it was more of a mindset thing because obviously when you are thinking of an idea or you are creating a product, the vision and the goal, uh, so you have that goal and that vision that, oh, this product, I want it to be a global product or I want it to be a national product. So from the onset, uh, there was that mindset that, oh, Bella is going to grow. Uh, but uh, again, there was that exit plan as well that, oh, at a point in time, Bella is also going to exit. But when it was going to happen, and um, again, it speaks to plans at the initial stage. So um, the plans were there. Uh, but a lot of things changed. But the fact that we already had something, um, it's kind of put up, uh, put us in line and uh, we just iterated as we grew. Thank you so much for that. Now, um, Bankole, I mean, we, we started Extra Mile 2018, relatively, got a port fund in 2019. It was not all rosy. But I don't want to be the one to tell the story. When you think of growth today, would you say people should start and grow fast? Or you ask them to start, grow slowly, and look for stability? Looking at the fact that if you go fast, you can maybe raise money, make a lot of money, and you know, you exit fast. On the other hand, as well, you can also like die on the road. What was your approach to growth? I mean, in retrospect. Thank you very much. My ideology is simple. Share growth. Put that on you know that very blunt. Maybe you are growing fast. Maybe you are growing slowly. You are not to impress anybody. I'm not the type of person that shares after money. When other colleagues are using 20 million cars, people know I use 2 million in cars. So my own is this value. What value do you bring to the marketplace? Many young people, especially you see them in Lagos, that's why they don't leave Lagos to other states of Nigeria. Because they see the 22.5 million people in Lagos and they feel that it's a big market because they don't want to stress, just like it said. We traveled over 20, 25 states in this country. He himself traveled almost all the corners for HTML Africa. In the middle of the night, whatsoever, even people that know me know me very well that when I call somebody 7 p.m., that is going to Enugu 8 p.m., you're on the road to Enugu by 8 p.m., you are getting there 1 a.m. Because by the time you get there 1 a.m., me myself, I'm in Ebony by 2 a.m. I moved 24 7. So I don't know, maybe it's not going to lead to fast. growth or slow growth by uh, doing the right thing from the beginning. You know, uh, you start a business or a startup, what are the elements that you have to look out for? And quite a number of them have been mentioned here today. Raising funds, putting up your team together, uh, getting the right access to opportunities. And like one of my role models, we said, looking for uh, Tony Lumelu, looking for a way to democratize luck. Because Dan Gote said, for every business to grow, there is always a bit of luck. When we are starting extra mile, you do even know maybe we are going to raise funds or not. Well, even we if we know, <laughs> you talk about mindset. If the people that owns the fund did not give us the fund, are we going to put <laughs> knife in their neck? <laughs> but we will still do it anyway. We will still do it. We never plan business to raise funds. The way I see a lot of young people do it today. It's just like, uh, sorry, I want to digress a bit because it's also related. It's just like when I was a speaker of Student Union, I saw quite a number of them mentioning 
greeting me, the speaker. When I became a speaker of Sudan, you know, in Futa, I never planned that university would send me to the UK. No student leader has ever even gone to UK before us. Assuming student union leaders have been sent to leadership and entrepreneurship training outside Nigeria. Now, probably that would have been a motivation. But we're only going there to go and fight the management. No water, no electricity, to go and shout greatest Nigerian student. But we got there, we saw a set of leadership that are interested in student leaders, and we formed a partnership. If you are doing this, we'll be happy. And they started seeing us too as partners in progress, rather than shutting down the university and whatever. They sent us to the first training in Nigeria, second leadership training, third leadership training. They sent us to London. We came and we started doing what we know how to do best. Even the day we came back from London, the second day, we blocked the whole express route of North Gates. <laughs> no vehicle move from anywhere at this, to any part of the state. Yeah, just a day after we came back from London. So go and, and the vice chancellor there said, is this what we have sent you to go and do? That we sent you spending millions to go and learn leadership. We said, this is leadership. Do you know what? Because by the time we get to University of uh, East London, that day we got there for the seminar, leadership seminar, we also see the student union protesting. <laughs> they blocked their, they okay. lied to us that they don't use to protest. <laughs> you saw it live. They were protesting. The only thing we will not do is that we will not destroy anything. So we never anticipated anything. This is who we want to become, entrepreneurs. Interesting. And that is what we just do. That, that's an interesting perspective. And I deliberately actually used two different persons because uh, 2018, I think he had already started. And then I met him about one month into the whole plan. Oh yeah, I mean, you're doing this. Um, I want to do this. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I met him a month. I've never yeah. seen it before. We we had not met. Yeah, yeah. Just a month. I'm an outing person. I was just at uh, Akindeko. We were attacking. We met at Akindeko actually yeah, to, to type uh, that's 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 I always together. do that deliberately, so that because that is why talent are. That is the reason I always come out for programs like this, not to come and talk because of this talk thing for the <laughs> But that is how we met. And yeah. a month after. We already said, we're inside building, building so. started. So and, and I shared that story for two things because yeah, you can put your hands together. What we didn't know was that we were gonna meet, so we met that 2018, and I'm gonna use that to ask a question from you. We met that 2018. We got Taslim up Nepal that spoke earlier. Taslim was our developer, it was not available our first mobile app, you know. They didn't be like what I call yellow and red and all that, but we got the first set of users. And then we hit about 3,000 users organically. And then we got access to apply for grants and then we got funding, some hundreds of thousands. In all honesty, we didn't plan to have 100,000 users. And that brings me to the question to you because entrepreneurship doesn't have one way many times. Growth, some people plan it. Some people, it happens to them. In our own case, But they plan about in your own case, what are the deliberate? I'm using architectural, like maybe design, you know. Um, how did you pick it from beginning? Because it was almost evident from your exit that this was planned, even if it was, uh, I mean, because this was quite fast, relatively, and uh, there was a synergy already with some industry players that could easily say, I can buy this product. What were the design thinking or the design thing you put into the whole process? that brought about that exit fast. And let me, let me say the growth fast and then the exit fast. I thank you. So I think uh, growth uh, for us was, for me, um, uh, I'm more of a strategy person. So uh, it made sense to bring somebody that understands the streets on board. So for me, I'm a product strategy, Person. So I can tell you on paper, uh, let's go, let's uh, we'll do that X, Y, Z. So it made sense for me to immediately have a partner from the onset that understood growth. So you rarely see me online, my partner everywhere. 
it everywhere, attending events, doing all those things. Me, I'm in the corner of my room, just turning out some of those things. So, and again, growth is um, experiments. It's a series of experiments because you don't really know what will work or what will stick. So, uh, you talked about organic. Most of our growth was organic. Uh, when we started, um, we did beta testing where we wanted to validate if people actually needed what we were building. So this was around 2021. And um, so the two months that we used for our beta testing, we got about 400 users. And at that time, we were already processing. So it's, it's been tech. So month plus, we were processing about 350,000 ish from 400 users. So we were like, oh, people actually need this product. Um, people are using, we could see the traction. And so that motivated us to actually dig deeper, form partnerships. So because when we started as well, we did start with funding. You know, the product was just out. So what made sense for us was to partner with communities that had our target users in them. So uh, for example, in the beginning, we were more crypto-centric. So we were partnering with crypto communities on Telegram, on WhatsApp. So we meet with some of those found, uh, the community owner, we strike a deal with them, they push our product to their users, and that was how we got our heli users. And um, in terms of exit, I think um, from the onset as well, um, it's all about communication. So for communicating with investors, I said I was, I was a strategy person. So, um, I handled that part mostly. And so most of the, so if you look at FinTech, it's a lot of collaboration. Even your competitor is using your solution at the back end. They are using your infrastructure. So at the beginning, we were also We were let's try to get out there before we build our own infrastructure. And while we were doing that, um, there, are, there were leaders in the industry that were also, in a way, they started noticing what we were doing because the world was out there. Uh, we were mostly digital. We were not on the road like you, like you were. So it was mostly Twitter, Facebook, and doing all these things. So they started noticing what we were doing. And um, somebody just introduced me to the um, co founder of Carbon. Yeah, so um, it was just supposed to be a 15 minute call. We were on that call for over two hours. And we were just sharing experience. And it was, uh, these guys are big, but it's the same shaky that we were facing. So um, the synergy was just there from the beginning. And they later, they became an investor in our company. So at that time, we were sharing monthly investor updates. So again, communication, this is also growth because the partners and the stakeholders were also involved in that process. So every month, we will share our growth. This is what we've done this month. You know the way people will tell you growth is them month or month. Month one, you do that you say month two, 15. Month. So it, 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 you, know, you understand? So it was not consistent, but that communication was just there back and forth. Oh, we will meet them. Oga, we have over 3 million users. You've been in existence for over 10 years. How were you growing? What were you doing? You know, some of those things they get back to us. We go and implement. If it works with us, uh, we double down. If it does not work, we find other strategies. So I think that was what led to uh, our fast growth and fast exit. So, and again, we were iterating. So when something is not working, we quickly tweak our model. We were not hundred percent in love with a specific idea and say do or die. It was, um, the grand goal was building a financial product that solved uh, cross-border needs for people. So we started with crypto because it was easy to send USDT. When CBN was clamping down on crypto companies, immediately we quickly put out our circular. Ah, we are stopping the crypto parts of our product. Because at that time, we had um, partners that already believed in what we were building. So we were already having partners in the US that, we could um, we could hold Naira for in Nigeria, and then they just use US, their currency there to clear uh, stuff for us. So it was more of that product uh, that process for us. So um, what led to the acquisition was now when that um, announcement went out that oh we were no longer doing crypto, 
and we were only focusing on business banking because we've seen that a lot of our customers were business owners that were looking to do uh, cross-border transactions. They wanted to buy goods in Canada, uh, sorry, in China, in Turkey, the US, and we were making those payments for them. But the moment we removed crypto from our products, give the message from the carbon father that, guys, when you are ready, we are waiting for you. Like, what is going on? You know, and that, that was basically the story. The process took about three, four months. And um, here we are. Thank you so much. Let's put hands together. I mean, these are, you know, you don't, founders don't tell their stories, really, you know, because it's a lot of wala. You know, but when you hear them to share like this, you really want to appreciate it. These are lessons that are far beyond what you can pay for. Now, if you observe something, he said, um, they were able to. I mean, I knew when the crypto Allah and everything. I mean, it was so serious. Some companies actually closed, them. but instead of them closing down, there was an exit. So, I, I, I mean, that is a very serious one, and I love a lot of things that I share. And that takes me back to you, Bankole, because. Growth is like grammar, you know, is the action itself. There is the work, right? When it comes to building a business, you have done retail products, where pricing, you know, agricultural commodities, even before fintech, pricing is a key challenge. We have an economy where people are spending a lot. How do you think people should be able to balance between pricing? And driving growth and market share. You get the, the three dichotomies pricing, you know, market share, and the purchasing power of people. I'm saying that because we have real estate people here, we have fashion, online, we have some other people in tech. How do you balance that three? I mean, from your mind, from your own perspective. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Of course. Victor always do a job to break things down for me. Because he knows that I don't speak all those diagrams, market share, all these uh, techie words. For me, when we started, uh, my ideology is to leverage to build a tech like some people that they want to just build a tech company. But I believe even when we launched the uh, agromachant, uh, an agri-tech company, my idea then, even despite the fact that we are one of the very few people in the country that first launched an agri-tech e-commerce platform in this country, my idea was not the boost. God did the boost names. So that most actually because of this market share, valuation and stuff like that. If you have read the story of how Facebook wanted to buy Twitter, that was written by one of the sports co-founders of Twitter in those years, you would be amazed that Twitter was nothing. And Facebook was putting almost $500 million to buy out on it. At the, maybe at the second year, what led them to that is that probably then they saw them as a threat, or they are going to be a prospect threat. So that the way these people are going, and if you remember, there was this Yemen war that was brewing, just like we're having Israel, Iran, whatsoever. So they capitalized on that postulation of leveraging on Twitter to escalate that war in Yemen or some of these Asian countries. And these Twitter guys never for once, you know, I've had people talking about structure, system, whatsoever, but what I tell young people, start anyhow. Start anyhow. If you fail, go back home, take water, return back to the market, and restart. There is no harm in starting more than 10 times and failing more than 10 times. You know, the funny thing is that when this guy was they were meeting the founders of Facebook, the Masukabaks and Co. They were shocked to hear that Facebook was putting, giving them $200 million to buy them out, just like the way they hesitated. You know, in their mind, when they were going for that meeting, 
They were even taking maybe two hundred thousand dollars. But Facebook now said two hundred million dollars. You know what? That quickly happened. You now told Facebook that give us five minutes. I want to talk among ourselves that this thing is serious. So let's jack the price. They now came back and said four hundred million dollars, and Facebook said we are paying you five hundred million dollars. They were shocked. The reason they did not sell Twitter to Facebook that year was because when they went back home, they said that for a company to want to pay us $500 million, they have never seen $1 million in their life. That, that means that a very, this thing is very serious. And that was why they did not sell to Facebook that year. They never even knew that a bigger billionaire will come and even buy a $44 billion eventually. They could not receive that one, that temptation. You know, there are some temptation, everybody has a price. I wanted to be tempted to ask him that if that how much they exist. Most of them don't always tell me, even the ones that are very close to me in Lagos, they don't always tell me how much they always exist. So that maybe that will also tempt me to put a price on a uh, Maybe extra mile Africa and quite a number of the things we do to also exit. But what is more important is that pricing is based on market trends. What is determining the pricing of everything that is going up in Nigeria today now? Nobody can even say it is one thing. They say it's because of the law, it's not coming down. Price is not coming down. The petrol station have been holding their fuel for the past two, three days. Just because they had that price of fuel want to come down to 550, 580. They know they have already stocked. So they don't want to sell at that price. Why they do? They close their feelings station so that you people will be queuing and be begging there. Even if it is 800, some people are selling 800. Even in Ado yesterday, they sold 800 dollars per liter. Some areas in Accra, they were selling 700 dollars. Why? Because you know the rules now, the law of scarcity, the law of fear. Started real estate and we went to Lagos. He knows five years ago, if people tell me that I will do real estate, or extra my, I will tell them because people have been calling me, let's come and partner in real estate. I think nothing like real estate. Because in those days, we always hear that people that sell land, so that thing always stick to my head, to my head. But I think there was a trip I took to London, I think before COVID. I think a month, I came back a month after, uh, before, a month before COVID. And I think we had this conversation around real estate and whatever. And I saw the sweetness of house flipping, land flipping. It was like Tete can't go to them over there. House they refurbish, they buy a old dilapidated house, they refurbish it, they spend three hundred thousand dollars and they sell it for six hundred thousand dollars within one month. They have made hundred percent interest or whatever. And you know me too. I buy one or two, three, four, five plots and you know sell it hundred percent. I know something about Tesla is that we don't joke with assets. We buy. It is sweet that we will buy truck, we will buy tractor, we will buy cows, we will buy this. The reason why we are doing that is because if investors' money is going to tie in one corner, we will quickly use those assets. We sell assets a lot. Even we are bad sellers of buyers of assets and sellers of assets. And eventually we saw the land. Properties can also be very good. They say it's a bit against inflation. Abi said that, I don't know. And most land that we buy too, maybe two years ago, we sell it like 150 percent increase, 500,000. We sell 1.5. It makes a whole lot of sense. It was just gamble. I was just looking for because you know we gave a lot of loans outside, quite a number of them defaulted. So we are, and these are some investors' money. So we are just looking for what can we gamble on again? Diversification, pivoting. He used the word pivoting. He said, you know, they edited. But we bought it. So that helps us to also gain a lot of traction in market share. Uh, so when we got to the land, they said this is what they sell in this area. We just take one figure from our head too. Let's test it. It talks about experiments. Except you don't know how to put value on your products. Mm. I had one of the speakers talking about quality. I think the scent. Uh, woman, the director of science the other time, Professor Damola or thereabout, talking about quality. I also appreciate because quality to me is relative. But value, when you understand how to put value on yourself, you know how to put value on. Like me now, I told Victor some months ago, I said, what confidence do you people have that you always do this speaking? 
you want to do master class all this speaking and Victor will just say one person should come and pay 200,000 every <laughs> you know, as much as they know that I have been in this space for years but I don't have that confidence I will still be begging people to come and listen to me for 5,000 all free but you know, just look up and say 500,000 and I asked him are people paying him I said they are paying we show me the data just like sure. the data at the least people are paying <laughs> whatever yeah there is a land, a real estate in front of us in Lagos at Ibeduleki. They are selling a plot of land. Funny enough, is this is this topic that is on channels? One of oh, these presenters, yeah. this lady, five ladies that is talking on channels. I never knew that she's a big lady on real in real estate until of present. I just saw her signpost beside our own land. She put her own picture in the signpost. I was told they are selling their own plot of land for 25 million. We are selling our own for six million. It's just he said, this our own land, this our own land. Wow. All gambling. And if it was for her, whatever. If it's whatever, you know. So from there, you can now heighten maybe, oh, people are buying this. Mm. So you heighten, but it's individual value. Individual value. That matters. I, I'm going to take that same question from you. And this is very important because, you know, uh, in building business, want to build wealth. I mean, at the end of the day, even though we say solve a problem, solve a problem, if you are broke, you know, people send you back to your father's house, blah, 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 you don't go and do this. But I've observed that value that we attach to products, markups that we put, the pricing that we put actually determines a whole lot. I have a training for founders. People pay me as much as 500K per month to retain me, to talk to me. And they only talk to me for four hours a month. Some pay 200, some pay 500, some can even pay a million. But at the same time, I have people that literally most likely have done more than me. That they may not keep, like what he's even saying. So, what is your perspective on pricing versus market share versus growth? Because I know that at some point you did some things for free uh, free transaction, free transfer. You know, in fact, Kuda is like a bank of the free. Well, later now, now they are no longer bank of the free. Every <laughs> they now. Market share, customer ability, and making of well. Thank you. So, relative. It's a lot of price discovery. Just to correct, we did not do free transfers. <laughs> we did not do free transfers. Uh, again, free transfers is not free. It's yes, painful. Thanks for all of our products. Um, what we just did was ex again, experiment with the pricing. Was it too high? Um, or do we have willing uh, people that were willing to, you know, pay at this? And again, it depends on the value of the products that you have. So um, we were doing cross-border payments. Uh, I think we had about 0.5% markup, more than what was even in the market. But our transaction was very fast. Yeah, so people promised you three to five days. Because initially, because we were using crypto, it was instant. So if I delay your transaction for a day, it's just because maybe we are trying to understand, oh, is this not money, la money laundry and all those things? So um, it was more of value for the price. Again, um, in tech, market share is very funny because uh, you we quote a lot of big numbers and uh, you don't have those kind of people to actually support those numbers. Um, a fintech will tell you that um, 200 million Nigerians. I can, I can tell you that online fintechs will share the same customer. People are just who is who is who is better, who is giving me free stuff, who is uh, faster, you know, building brand. So that's why you see Opie, you see all these bigger brands building a lot of brand recognition, trying to come offline so that you can see them daily. You can resonate with their brand because they all share the same customers. We did uh, virtual cards. Even virtual cards, founders of the other startups that I will not mention, 
They go, what offer? What's working now? Which which provider? They work. You know, Bajaka was feeling at the at the time where you wanted to pay for it was not. We were using the same provider, so you say uh, this one is bad. It's a lie. We are all on the same infrastructure. So when one fails, your your competitor will come and meet you, Baba. Because at that time, they don't want to also lose their customers. So um, uh, pricing is is relative. Uh, what makes you stand out, especially in the crowded space, is one uh, your your product offering. So for us, we were not only doing card. Again, I've said that we were mostly doing cross border payments, which was a bit difficult for uh, some other players in the space. So we were just using card to supplement our revenue. Uh, if we are doing cross border payments, there are people that we also want to pay for subscriptions. There are businesses that so that was what we were using some of these things to do. And so we also had different price points. So we were we had about three products and they had different price points. So uh, this month, for example, uh, around February, cards will pick up around December, card usage, uh, you know, so there were seasons. It was mostly seasonal where uh, sometimes it, it is working for us. So when card is down, we just focus on people doing big numbers. Every uh, people will not uh, do shipping from China because it's China New Year. Is there so transfer to China? You and China was the biggest market for us. So transfer to China was going to slow down. We we'll bring virtual card. Amazon. So that was the price dynamics that we put into our product. So we were not really settling on one price. And again, we used our value. We were driving value. I spent more time negotiating with my infrastructure provider to get best offers. We signed SLEs. Okay, your service must not be down. We set up redundancy plans. If provider A is down, provider B is off. So uh, that's how you try to, even now, that Vela, we've shut down operations, we've migrated to carbon business. People are still, people already have their account number. They are still sending money. We've stopped the door, stopped the money inside this app. We had a man that came to us. It was very funny because the man was offering us, he was just saying, I will give you 20 million naira. This is your infrastructure. Help me, help me transfer it and give me separately. I don't want to. Put other provider since we already have it give me but uh <laughs> we, we already bound by agreement and other so the man still, he still has money in the app so i'm already fighting that let's lock his account let's frustrate him for a week so that he can even vex and and that is money and go so we created that kind of value and but still today we still have over a thousand people that have not taken their money off and so we set yeah, so we've set up that okay, so uh, after a while automatically by force we'll give you your money. Let us focus on carbon business. When that is when you build a product so good that you have done an amazing job. Um uh, I'm just gonna ask one last question from both of them and we are done. Um and do we have anybody in the audience that have any questions? Do you have any questions? You have okay, so okay, let me not ask them the questions yet. So let me allow external questions. So I'll take Lawrence first. I'll take um you second. Yeah, you want to ask a question before. I'll take you third and then keep it fourth. So let's have the mics for everybody. I hope it has been very useful for everyone. All right. So let's have a question first. Okay, thank you, sir. My name is Lawrence and um I was really uh, big by yeah, the level of growth here. I don't know. So I have two questions. When you are, when you are starting, when you are starting as, when you are starting from a level, then putting effort, don't necessarily do it. So my question is, if you are at this level, how do you differentiate and identify? Differentiate between putting in that latent effort and then wasting your time. Question number 
especially when you're business and uh, uh, planning how to how your growth is going to be, how you want to enter the market. I want to know between these two choices, the advice to just put in, just launch into the market and allow your audience to find your product or you go into the market. Okay. By the market section. Okay, those are two interesting questions. So I'll please take the first one. When do you know when to pack off that everything you are doing is not working compared to when you put in just a little more effort to make it work? So let me. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you for asking that question because for every speaking, I always have when they invite me, I always do a short note. So just put a perspective. And you know, quite a lot of young people these days, we always talk about passion. That I'm passionate about this idea. I'm, I'm passionate about this idea. I have God has dropped this dream when I was dreaming like uh, Joseph and whatsoever. And we are we used one statement the other time. We used the word do or die. It is only politicians that do do or die. In business, my suggestion has always been that to hell with passion. Passion doesn't do it. Passion can help you to start, but passion will not keep fueling your journey. Because not be passion go put money for your table. Not be passion go put food for your table and for your family's table. So immediately you have taken a little time. But how to define that time frame is not relative. But it's just like you are toasting a girl to marry, or you are uh, waiting for a girl to tell you yes or no. You don't know, maybe some guys wait for a girl for 10 years to wait for yes, that this is my dream girl. No, to, uh, no to any marriage except this. One year, two year, three year, four year, five year, 10 years, is the exact this. If care not taking the girl, will have married another person, will have given back, and you are still waiting for the girl. I think senses, common sense seeker. Fitness is all about common sense. If you have tried it for the even know me, after one, two months, it doesn't work. I more your idea at the experiment. He was talking about extra poop, extra extra egg of 200. <laughs> we don't bring any of this thing from heaven. I just told you five years ago we never thought about we are talking about it. There are some things we never thought about three, four years ago. Even before this uh, COVID, we never knew there was going to be COVID. We are started talking about uh, remote uh, e-wallets. We were one of the very few people that started e-wallets in this part of the world, uh, this country. You know, we started talking about, uh, he talked about virtual cards. We brought uh, extra cards. We brought it from China. We started doing, you know, we wanted to synchronize. So do an MVP. Immediately you do your MVP. Go and read Lean Startup. It's a very good book. It's a very boring book, but it's a very good book to start with. Lean Startup will tell you about MVP, minimum viable products, piloting, iteration, auto market strategies. Everything must be lean. It's not to go and seek for fun first. Start lean, 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 lean. So by the time you now see, just like you said, 3,400 uh, customers in two months. We have 3,000, maybe in a few months, whatsoever. And one bad thing about business is this. I remember when we started importing product from China during the, days, the early days of e-commerce. Maybe the G will remember. The early days of e-commerce, I started selling flash drive. Because my church member, five of them, put out people, 10 of them, bought my flash drive. Immediately, we exhausted that first tranche. We times three, we brought another product from China. We didn't send one. We have forgotten that it's only friends and family. 
because when you start hearing words like, okay, they can share support here. And where's my team? And let's encourage him because he's a young guy. He meet is a red flag. It's a red flag. If your product is all about, let's support him. And let's, because he's a young, I hate that thing. Immediately somebody tell me that I, I run away from such a person. Because if we buy once, it won't buy again. If we invest once, it won't invest again. Just like you said, some people forget, maybe they forget money in Bella account. Some people have forgotten money in our my wallet today. Because those days, some professor, ah, you are doing well, good. Oh, you got things like that. I will put 20,000. 20,000, enough people like you want. Want, want to help you do around one year. I asked professors, some people like that. Those are not your markets. Your market is your customer retention. When you give value, we have some investors today. They keep coming back without marketing. They will even be the one calling us and say, what other product do you think we can invest in? We, have we seen them before physically? We've not seen 90% before. Some of them are in abroad. They have not seen us. We have not seen them. So those are the, by the time your products start having some traction, that is not from pity. Know that you can do everything, your blood and water, putting in it. Even if it's not scaling at the early stage, it will scale. It's just a matter of time. But by the time you test it, I just one or two, three people. We opened a restaurant some months ago. I brought some people. I told him that we are shutting down. Do you know what? So many of the people in tech think they are the only ones that they exit. We have exited more than 10 businesses in the last two years. We don't talk about it. We exited the restaurants. We get money, even times two of what we have spent on the restaurant for people that want to run alcoholic business. But when the likes of uh, all these people did not come to eat, they say it's close to police station. Uh, we are, are not doing decorated whatsoever. I could do look for one baba that have money. He told me we leave the uh, the filling station, the restaurant, and we are visited. That's all. That's simple. As that. I, I, I think um, you, you get the picture. So, put hands together. Um, there, are, there are a number of things within that line. You know, there's the side of first of all, check your traction. Is it traction by pity or traction by value? If it's traction by pity, just, there is no need to just keep going on. Uh, but I want to still like give a touch on that. But then the other question is, um, what's called? Do you do you go and look for the market share, or you wait for the market to come to you? Open market, or you section the market. So just take it. Uh, I think on the first one, um, it depends on your uh, on the goal. You know, um, for example, when you. When you are trying to launch a campaign, there are campaigns that are targeted towards awareness. They will never combat. I don't know if you if you mistakenly run likes and comments on Facebook, you don't see by. It's only likes and comments you will get. If you run mobile app downloads, you will get mobile app downloads. So um, again, you have to look at the type of goal and the type of um, I'm sorry, the type of goals that you have set. And that will also determine um, the kind of output that you would get. In retrospect, you might actually be doing things wrongly, in the wrong way, and expecting a different type of result because awareness is cheap. You can spend 5,000 naira on awareness, for example, and you reach 10,000 people. Try it with conversion. Try your 5K might not convert more than two people. So, um, at the end of the day, the kind of um, the kind of goals that you set uh, also matters. And again, um, at the onset, these businesses that we, we say we do, we've done multiple businesses. Um, again, it, it's like you building your CV and your experience. So um, nothing is really a waste. Uh, nothing is really a waste. Around um, so before techno and all this, we started doing tabs, we bring tabs in, populate. Or and all After that, we tried using, you know what Starlink is doing now? We tried to do it with TV white spaces. Um, TV white spaces is when, um, you know, your normal television, now that white and black, internet can actually pass through it. But 
uh, we saw few a few companies were doing it in Kenya and Rwanda. We wanted to try it out in Nigeria around 2014. We're just putting it out there. Uh, Omobala Johnson, Minister of ICT, he sent somebody to us. I was shocked. But we were broke. We were just tweeting. We, you know, then there was one new site, uh, Tech or Tech Byte. Uh, they, they were the ones that, you know, before Tech Papa, we're just sending free. We've done this today. We'll send it. We'll create that press. We'll just put it out there. Then one day, somebody came, like from the minister of ICT, that she has seen what we are doing, and she wants to. At that time, we were already tired because we were broke. We we're just uh, let's just push this. Thing. Let's do it. We've not even done the first demo, so because it was an expensive technology, and so I just told the person that. Uh, thank you for coming over. At this time, we are, we, we are getting tired and all those things. They were not ready to give us cash, but they gave us a project to actually go and survey students uh, at Unilag that had internet issues and how these are our solutions. And so they funded that research. That, after that, they started to send us to. That was the first time I heard of Simawa. They started to send us to areas where it was a bit. That boosted us. Another time was I was working on a project, just pushing. I did not get customer. Somebody just messaged me randomly on Twitter. Bro, I love what you are doing. Can we meet? And I back and forth. We met. Found that that they sent it off and was the chairman, the uh, health committee, at the send it, and they actually did that. Is that particular solution that we were trying to handle. At that time, we were trying to sell to people, sell to the market. We were not seeing anybody. One person just came and changed and had came a government project. So at times, uh, what seemed not to be working was just uh, building experience. Uh, uh, so if that helps, so that's the way me, I like to see some of those things. So. I might leave the project for some time, you know, I close it down. There was a project that I closed down. And somebody reminded me of the project this year, and it was getting relevant. It was, then it was AI, but at that time, it was more of machine learning, Python. Market was not ready. Now, everybody is AI, AI, AI. The person just sent my text to me. Uh, we are fine. Just this, uh, last month. So that was that was that. Again, I'm talking about products. Earlier, it was easy to just put something out there and you think people will come. Now, I have to be very aggressive. And I said my story that I'm not very good with marketing and going into the market. I found some okay, let's work together. And so you undo this part where you have to actually go into the market. So what I say I will do cross border payment, but I will not tell you that, oh. A village. All those people selling phones. We were meeting them, and you know, some people will tell you that no, they cannot give you their money. So what we were doing is we would import the products with our own money. We will mark up. It's cross but that people we are doing. You know, or if you tell me that you need hundred phones, <laughs> you need, yeah, you need hundred phones. We will bring the hundred phones. Then we will give you a rate. So we knew that you were going to use us to purchase anyways. So we were just doing that. We brought in products for people so that they, at least they would pay us that rate. So we would give them a quote. The other is 650. We agree on that quote because they didn't trust us to leave their money with us, bring in that product. So they give us a better of Some will give us deposit. I'm trying to use you people. If you bring the product, we'll buy it at this designated rate. We'll go and import it. Then we collect our, our payment company, but we needed that money. So we entered market. We went to Alaba, carry POS and go to Alaba because those kind of customers, in fact, they don't have the apps. So you have to go to them offline. Go to them offline, they transfer the money to you. On that spot, you help them wire the payment or you record it as part of your transaction. So um, right now, growth is. Uh, being aggressive means you have to actually go to customers. Uh, you might attain 
So you will wonder why is MTN still running hard but They have to constantly stay fresh in the minds of people. They spend billions staying on top of the mind because if they slack, even Coca-Cola, you wonder that these brands, so who am I? You know, so these big brands, they just spend every fund staying on because the day they stop, somebody is taking their market. So if you are also starting afresh, I'll give you an example. When I was in Puta, I that was my first business in Puta. I was printing. So I just had engineering wanted to do awards and whatever. I had one friend in part of the S code. I just told me, I'm printing you. So uh, they did the proposal. So he told me that some people had brought proposals to print those certificates. So I told him that I would design and print. So I love it. That let me get the proposal. Let me know the, uh, the cost of those people so I can short it. So after I got the cost, I went to this um, stadium road where those people are printing. I had to look for printer. I told him what I wanted to do. I had a friend that was in IDD. Design certificate. So we designed the certificate with three, three samples just to fit the people on ground. We did three samples and then we cut the cost, I think, by 20k. That was my first money, 60,000 naira. 60,000 naira. Print certificate. We paid the printer. We paid, uh, I, I gave the, this my friend that was doing the, this thing, Stephen. I was like, come on. We can double down on this thing, though. We started lobbying different faculties. And they want to do award. They want to do, you know, we started doing the awards and all those things. But we actually went to them. I didn't just say, oh, anytime you bring your idea to We actually went to them. And um, that was it. So sometimes you have to be very aggressive with your, especially when you have nothing to lose. Your product, there's, you are not gaining anything by sitting down and saying that your product will grow. When we did not have money to push blogs, we were writing on Medium. So we were constantly using Medium. We were using the free version of Medium. Medium, you know, Medium is five dollar per month. You didn't want to pay that five dollar. We were writing free, and Medium brought a lot of customers to us because for every post we Medium high ranking on Google. So for every post, we, we yes, we were doing SEO. We were add our links. We tell you how it's easy to call those things. At the end of the article, we will put the call to action, so people will reach out to us. In a way, that was a form of marketing for us. That people would stumble upon it, and after a while, we started seeing people doing comparison. They will carry Vela, they will carry Chipaka, they will carry PD. We were not paying for that, so it started. That was how it started growing. So the first thing was actually to be, I told you organic 400 people. They didn't just find us. We are going to them, okay? This is what we are doing. You find trials, trials, trials. And that was how we got the initial form. Like, we just built and put another. We have launched though. No, we built and we went to the market to talk to people. Sorry, Victor. Uh... Sorry, I want to emphasize on one thing he said. For every business idea, leave a footprint. Yeah. You cannot know maybe it's going to work or yeah. not if you don't just take it to the market first. Yeah. Because he said something about people, even if I, after you have left a particular business, people can see. People can see. I could still remember. People even still call me on over time to agro, build machines, uh, to buy machines. Commodities that we started with, agricultural commodities, supply house mess. I still do that. Yeah. People will just call me that mess. I just call somebody in Kaduna. She I will send the money, even if it is ten thousand or fifteen thousand naira markup a ton. We need twenty tons. Start it. We still quickly do it. You make your because million. we have put footprints on Nera Land. Yeah. In those days when Nera Land started, Shewa yeah. Shewa, people still see my post in two thousand and seven, and they still call in twenty twenty four. That they will even some things they will ask that you sell donkey skin. <laughs> because I talk about donkey skin down now, and that is one thing about digital footprint. It will always we shunt you back now to profitability. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I know our time is fast spent, but I'll still ask the questions. I'll allow them to ask their questions. Um, who is the next? Kim. You know, the interesting part is this conference that we're having today, CIL, Campus Innovation Labs, right? I designed it in 2020. So, um, money is, is now being done four years. 
four years after the design. Just sit down and ask the question very fast here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, I'm from Puta actually, so I have a physical um, product based business, okay, a digital product based business. So the physical one here is that I have issue with my pricing, although the price is normal, but I do supply these stores. I say Kilishi. You say Kilishi? Yeah, I do supply these stores. So at, at the point, they increase the price themselves. Okay. Like I, I was from I was, your suppliers. Yeah, normally they're supposed to be selling like 1,200 naira, 600 naira. They started selling one five, and they were buying from them. I had people have to, some people come to me that this thing is expensive. I will can't tell them that they should bring it down back. I'm now thinking that that means that thing is actually worth that price. But yes. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Okay, so increase the price. Your 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 challenge is you're having conscience challenge. Conscience matters. And um, in business, why you don't want to share your conscience, like become atlas. You also want to have a normal conscience that is not feeling like you're cheating people. And um, how you know the value of your stuff is how much is it in another environment where you are not? How much is that cliche in Lagos, for example? How much, uh, I'm just giving an example. How much is it in Abuja? How much is it in Port Harcourt? For example, when we started the growth hub, we started with 1,200 naira per day for power only 1005 for internet plus power but i know that in lagos even to sit down in a restaurant you could pay like 4k or 5k to just sit down in a restaurant except you go and buy something what you go buy for yourself you buy one coke and everything so i knew that we're like 300 percent lower than our normal pricing by the virtue of our prayer but fuel increased and everything we still didn't increase but right now for you to come and use power only, one seven. For you to use power and internet, two thousand five hundred. You in your mind, you think that we are charging high. Because I was in Portacourt last week or last two weeks, so I was doing financial analysis for them on hubs. That's what someone told me that ah, where am, that, where, where am I saying that they would do hub for two thousand five? That they cannot they cannot have hub used for one day for less than four thousand in Portacourt. So I'm still selling one five lesser than a Porter Court value. So if I'm charging 4,000 in Akure, am I wrong or am I being, am I cheating people? The question is, the fuel that is in the Porter Court and the fuel I'm using here, is it different? No. They are using 600 per liter. I'm using 600 and 650, 650. That isn't the same internet. So I'm the one that is actually cheating myself are not charging the value of what my product should have been because of the environment. So like I think um, he mentioned something the other time that how much, uh, you know, how much uh, risk can you take on your pricing and how much testing can you do? If people are buying it and you don't have a lot of competition that wants to compete with you on price, then stay on your lane. Do what you are doing. Sell at that level. But if you have competitors that come and compete with you in price. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, how many of you have heard the story of what's going on with earpiece right now? That's exactly the issue. People have been taking this thing 3 million, 4 million, Lagos to London. But you came and you said you want to do 1.5 million. They now went down to 600,000. And it's now, you know, what happened? He had competition. So you need to first of all check. Do I have competition in my immediate environment that can do price war with me? Number two, how difficult or easy is it for these people to get from another supplier? If I have supplier leverage and a demand leverage, then I can actually do the price. I can beat the, the monopoly in that environment. But if your competitor says to cheaper, uh, what's it called, supplier, then you know that they'll come back with price war with you. And then, so business is basically intelligence. Keep selling for now, but observe what is going on around. If somebody is buying from you, stop buying about two or three times. You ask, at my phone now, you say, your price is too much. I have bought it, so, so please. So you know that somebody has started price war with you. Then you also start using intelligence around it. It's stupidity if everybody is selling at 
I, I, maybe not total stupidity if you have all the money and you are doing premium, you know. But everybody's selling one five, you are selling three thousand. Except if your product has special premium value. If it has premium value and you have people that appreciate premium value, sell premium. You make more money. So it's not a yes and no question. It's about how intelligent are you? Are you are you serving a mass market? Do you have supplier leverage? Do you have a demand leverage? If you have, just keep on going and observe your market and demand. So I think that would be the answer for that. All right. So um, before tech and after tech, I will give you a product. So um, before we did Bella, and I think it's one of the things that led to Bella was I used to sell perfume oil. So perfume oil is a physical product and it's cheaper. You know, that small bottle. So my own perfume oil started from 10 mils. Again, I told you I don't like marketing. I'm not a physical person. So how many people am I going to sell this small bottle of 10 mils to, to actually make money? So um, my first thing, the first thing I needed to figure out was distribution. Distribution is always key. You know, so um, what I did was I was doing five in one. So my 10 mils, I'll pack it five. You can't buy less than five. So I created a language online and it's not really difficult, but I will use celebrity pictures. I'll write a type like uh, I will just write a small story and put Joker Silver. In fact, um uh, is it Joker Silver? The, the wife of Olu Jacobs they sued me and I took a picture of like yes, so Joker Silver because I, I use that a lot. And I used back, uh, back W and the wife for my perfume. I would just create that. You know, the, the babies alone do offline that you just put two pack. Put somebody's picture. I took it online. Um, I I don't sell every day. I sell at on weekends. So because I know weekends people are relaxed. That's when they will go to their phones more. So anything from Friday, I will launch my ads. I was selling perfume of 1.2 million airbags. Perfume oil, that's my small bottle. That's my small bottle. So I could not go and meet people. In fact, I never posted it on my on my social media. I only had 200 followers on Instagram. I was only using Instagram. I only had 200 followers on Instagram. I never posted it. People around me, unless I tell you, you would never know. But I was good at running ads. If I'm broke, I'll put 30,000 inside Facebook. I'll make like this. So it's guaranteed. Because that model, was already working for me. So I did not care that somebody was selling it for 1,000. I was bundling it five in one, 10 mil, 12,000. Um, 24 mil, three in one, 24K. I had repeat customers. Um, you know, this, um, when, when you do mini importation, you start having delivery agents in different states. I had agents in 12 states. And those are the states I was running market. I would do Lagos, Ibadan, Ogun State in Southwest. Because some, I spent more time in Akure. I had somebody in Akure. So I added Akure to it. And the north, I only did Abuja, Kaduna, and Kano. I did Portacot. I did Delta. Because I knew okay, the economy is still viable in this area. Those are the places I only target. And I know that if I run my ad, I know if I run ad 100k. It's, it's so sure that this weekend, though, I'm broke. I can borrow 100,000 from you. I will put it in my ad bag. I will make it so certain for me because that's my distribution line. Then you might say, okay, I'm online. I perfume online. My friend says, fully, fully. I said, fully, fully. That, that the brand I put in back, it sells 700 naira. The day he told me, he said, I'm going to buy this 700 naira, fully. He gave me sample to go and test. Because I went to my auntie's house with that sample. Yeah. Auntie, this is what she's going to do. She's pulling it. When you call me, she tasted it. Everything is nice, though. What am I allowed to export to? Uh, so, for an export market, then what I'm going to is too cheap. They buy in packs. 
For me, it was a twenty. Ah, what, what do you mean? Seven hundred. And again, supermarket. So if you go to motor, go to sell, go to it's on, it's on their shelves. Again, distribution. So it was not a look. It was not within an environment. When we wanted to do that fully, fully, they said go and do trademark. It took time. We did the trademarking. We did all these things. For my perfume, I repackaged. I was not buying locally again. I started importing from Dubai directly. I would, uh, I would import it in the start. Hands. Then I would report to. I would print label. Package it. Add so that I can justify my price. So I make 40, 50 percent. I have 40, 50 percent markup. When somebody will sell five, or one thousand, or one five, I will sell it. I have to add that extra packaging and sort out my distribution. So sometimes, most, again, I'm trying to work on the physical product. I've not added the product. And my only worry is distribution. Where is this product going to sell? Where am I putting it? I don't, I don't really care about because, again, you will buy fake shoe. Somebody will say that 1,000. You will go to bend down. You will buy a 15K. Another person will tell you 10,000. The same shoe. Obviously, we are all buying fix. Different prices. Somebody will put it inside store and on blue lights. The price have changed. So I don't really care about pricing. I care about and find pocket that can afford my product. Thank you so much for that. Um, the last question. Okay. All right. And on second to last Sunday. Thank you very much, Sars. Mr. Mark, thank you for your insight. Thank you, Mr. Van Kole, Mr. Victor. Thank you so much. I have two questions. We want to Mr. Mark. I just want to ask, what was the, let's say, should I say, what was the X factor? Because when you started Bella Finance, there were many fintechs doing almost what you were about to do. What still pushed you to do that? And I mean, not afraid that. And they were already big fishes in the industry then. So that's my first question. Then the other question is to my others. Um, I mean, the real estate industry, I know you're in the real estate industry. The industry is a high ticket industry. And at the same time, low trust. You know? mm. So how, what are the things that you do? What are the things that matter? Because I know you are both sales, sales advocates. What are the things? that actually drive sales in, in that industry. industry. Okay, so please, we want to run, so let's do one minute, very short, then I also not take time. Okay, so um, in the market, there is always a gap. There is always a gap. Um, even after we started, there are tens, but everybody has a reason, everybody has a why. Why Bella? And I said when I was talking about that uh, this perfume business led to Bella because it became a serious challenge to pay our suppliers. The competitors are there for if we want to send money in our hala. That was why I started with crypto. But I could easily send USD to somebody and the person will convert it to AED. I was pricing USDT is priced to one USD. So I had that thing. I was already buying the dollar anyway. But USDT was faster. I didn't have to go through the banks, you know, do more uh, Western Union, go and fill all this form. I just get on my system, do P2P on finance, that was that, 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 10 money. I had that, I had that challenge. I was in the channel. And a lot of people too, they had the same challenge. So, and we would say that uh, a lot of incumbent big fishes are in the market already. But we were all having this problem. After Bella, people are having this problem. Because I've, I know somebody that started after us, and we were just casually joking. With him. He was telling me that his monthly volume is $4 billion. Sense for people, pay for goods abroad. He started after us. In fact, he started last year. And he was actually telling me that 
it's Monday for the four billion now. That so because we were just this thing I was telling you that it needs good uh, partners to work with. This was after understand, and there are people uh, in this space that I don't want to mention, even back of banks, between the groups, to casually hear somebody say, I don't have $20 million. Shop. We had a customer that came to us and told us that the so Naton, they are not my customer, so Minaton Mobile, uh, about three other multinationals use this company to move. So monthly, they were moving 60 million USD. So if you are charging, if you have a markup of one naira, on that customer, you will make 60 million every month. On customer. So, and there is a lot. So, is your wife, is your, you are going to niche down also. You see some companies, they only care about any of that. See some fitness companies. They, there's this thing that is always funny that when you do think that you know you say retired card. You you see you understand so you see some people they're only focused on he today. My friend is a top PM at Twitter. He messaged me yesterday. Like, uh, OTP. You, they are looking for OTP. It's bucket MS provider. And if you look at that solution, you say a bucket no, a lot of people are really doing OTP. Yeah, any any OTP provider in Nigeria, you are setting. You know, somebody will tell you that use this person, use this person. Use this, you will try the three of them. They stick up. So it's just a matter of that wider perspective and there is no oversaturation. There's no oversaturation. No over they will tell they they. they Let's say just with your hands together for him. Um, again, at the end of the day, we're the one that should be worrying that time has gone because I mean, these are experts that let their business come and do this. Um, but my hope is that someday somebody will watch this on YouTube and this will be the what will change their life altogether, you know. So, you asked a question about real estate space. Uh, I think I'm the sales guy. Is um, is a, he, he can sell, but has a choice of what he wants to sell. So, but uh, when it comes to real estate, I will tell you this: the number one thing is you need an army. Um, you need an army if you really want to like do real estate and sell. The reason you need an army is this: real estate is not what you want to advertise on digital ads, and somebody will click. And drop 50 million to buy. So it's always lead magnets. You are inviting them to a webinar. That's why I see Stephen do a lot of webinars. You see Tade Cash do real estate millionaires, Kenneco Academy, because it is a low trust thing. So you want to activate KLT, know, like, and trust. But ads, it will be very rare for someone to just click, especially maybe on some real estate digital platforms where maybe property pro that people already know for genuine validated properties so because of that it's either you decide to go through a network and that's why you see the like of um, brg and all that brg is not making its money from itself alone it's making from the network of the outer so you if you can do the hard work of building realtors, even though you are a realtor, it will definitely work. It may take six months to one year to do the hard work of building it. I was telling him a company I coach did about 180 million deal of last year. After I coached them and we worked, by this month they've done 400 million already, already in three months. So they they took me to Portacot again. I just came back from Portacot, and. Every time I go to Port like that, they have to pay me like 1.5 mil just to move me and all that and just a few days to come and speak and coach them again. Because they told me now that their target for the end of the year is 5 billion. Now, this is a company that has just about eight staff. 
has done 400 mil. But we have built a community of close to 600 realtors for them. So the strength is in the numbers. Now, if you cannot do that, your job is to network. Right? You have to network physically and virtually. The top most real estate people in Lagos, you see them at parties almost every weekend. It is not that they like partying. They just need to really, really network. Because it is on top of, you know, talking, hey, Papa Muman, I have one property for that lake you, and hey, ah, I they look for. And then they talk. So is it that you have that network you are building of lower people that are selling for you? Or you yourself, you are building a solid network. And number three, this may not be popular opinion. I have to tell my people to go PR, even if it's 50,000, to write on, on a, maybe one newspaper to just feature how a day, you know, is building, is using real estate to change your those state story. Nobody cares whether you are a big company or not. Is your name, is your picture, is your, somebody will see it. Somebody will check you out on Google. Somebody that wants to buy from you will go and check you out on Google and say, where was this guy's name? You will see that newspaper, say, eh. They feature him, not knowing that you pay 50,000 for PR. PR is not expensive. You can pay 50K, 30K, 100K to just do some things. And by the time you've, by the time you've created some kind of digital impression, people will come for you. Uh, just about four, about three years ago, this way I'm going to end. Stephen Akita started borrowing Rolls Royce and doing a billionaire conversation in Rolls Royce. He did a series. That is where the likes of some major foreign guys started seeing him and then they started, started going to Dubai. The most I said in that time, I know this is a PR game. But nobody cares whether you bought the whether you bought the Rolls Royce or something. But people, this is Nigeria where people perceive you by the virtue of how you appear. And real estate is a is very close to showbiz. Very, very close to showbiz. So I'm not saying. This is what you should do, but you can take a look at either of those three or four options. And then, but I'll ask you, I mean, is critically on the field. So, what's time? One person might just pick one information and run with it. Most times, conversations like this, I like the way it is. One, two, three, four people, it does shots. Because there's only a few people that build a nation, not crap. That's the one thing I've learned in business, maybe real estate or generally, is confidence. Everything you've seen, those guys that are making it, doing very well, is they take their fear aside and they dip into the water. They sink, they do not sink, they drown, they do not drown, fine and fine. So confidence will help you. I've started seeing you doing video jump on one of your videos maybe yesterday on Facebook. Somebody will call you and say, ah, there's a video on equality. Uh, Koshiba, they are not doing anything. They are just the talkers. The ones that doesn't like quality will also come to you. Like, for example, I used to say it. There is no way people like Mimi, skit makers, the video, we advertise a product and I will ever buy. Or possible. But many young people, even if it's the most calm thing in the world, as long as it's whiskey, I used to see on TikTok how people idolize whiskey. One well, real, they have never met in life. If whiskey advertise a product for those type of people, so we buy. Uh, this lady that did uh, this film that sold over one billion. Is it the one marketing a man estate? Yeah. She will tell you that she lives at Teleco inside the Amen estate phase two. That's why she's living. She can carry Amen estate on her head to any level. Some people buy into real estate because they are buying you. It is because they just like Funke Akindele, not because they have planned one month ago that they wanted to buy land or whatsoever. They just want to buy you. Some people buy Stephen Akita your book 
just because they want to have one on one with him. Some people come here today just because they want to, they have been hearing about Victor. On last Sunday, one man, not a very meet here. One man, very difficult to meet. They will just form some impression in their head. You know, it's people that form blockage for themselves. Mind. I can't meet by Chancellor Futa. Blockage. Mind. But how did I meet about Sanjo? I know they will not allow me to meet him in Nigeria. We were in an agricultural conference in Kenya. Is it Kenya or Rwanda? I can't remember. He was sitting here, I was sitting here. And Shrimasi Iwa took me. Uh, we went to him. Oh, the entire, of course, Shrimasi Iwa is also a billionaire. Happy? And we sat down together. We just said, just like Mamu uh, Okoye Baba Yabo, no, Lele, whatever. You know, it's just about confidence. Do you know one thing? There are some people on our table that day. I said, let's use this opportunity to go and meet President Thomas and Jonah. They said, no, there's fear. Eh? The old former president of Nigeria. Meeting. It doesn't work like that. Some people are on Lucas. Some people are just pash pash. So if you can get your confidence right, let me tell you, almost 90% of the businesses that we are doing today. Of course, they can say we attended Lagos to or EGC to some extent. Whatsoever. When we started fintech, did we go to school of finance? We went to Futa. Some of you are Futa and said, "Is Futa? Is it teaching finance? They're not teaching finance. We just tap into some of these things and we move along the way. And the second part, which is very key for me, that I have seen quite a lot of retailers that are not doing. Everything they have said is correct." We don't leverage on multi channels. What he just said here is just multi channels. There is no one way thing that works for all these things. Like me now, I know my strength. Like he said, I don't like marketing. But I love to close deals. One on one. If Victor has done everything, whatsoever, there's a guy that Victor brought in that we gave some lands to our present. And he will be talking to some people in diaspora. And those people will be having some sense of belief, 70%. But they, are still, they still don't know him like that, like that, like that, because it's also a reader that I've introduced. But immediately, I, they just make me, they say, sir, can you just quickly jump on a call with a, a client so that you can just help us to close this deal? You know what I always do? Check Google. If you buy today and you discover that it's a scam tomorrow, come back, we'll pay your money back. I use my name to tell. Google it. I'm everywhere. So that's, I now I see that. Thank you so much. It's as if, as if I'm the one that did the marketing alive. Some people have watered the grant. I can just do this one on one and said, I will use testimonies, my personal experience, my story, and whatsoever. And that is how we also raise most of the investments that we raised. Some people will say they saw LinkedIn. You will notice that. Victor is almost virtually the face of Extra My Africa on social media. They see most of his posts on LinkedIn, and because of that, they lack the social story part. That is the social value. So because of that, I want to be part of something social. So different people with different ideology. If you are not targeting all of them, you might not be able to get the right. And I wanted to tell the guy, and of course, it's also applicable to you, get this book, Business Intelligence. Of the thing that performs, make people to be high performance in anything, entrepreneurship, is you must be intelligent. Victor mentioned about it. If you cannot multi think, let me use that word, multi think of so many things. He was talking about um, uh, doing returns, millionaire, whatever. For the past one month now, we have been designing Oshogo Ibadan. From next month or ending of this month, I target uh, returns, millionaire, high school. I saw it in another person, whatsoever. I steal it. I retweak it. They make content, and you must be a content creator, aye? What he just did on Medium is just content creation. You must be, a, you must not be tired of creating. One of the things that I've distinguished some of us from the crowd is content creation. Teaching is content. And selling is content. Marketing is content. PR is content. Talking is content. is content. The more you can know how to create content out there, you will see that I've been forced now to be doing video. I'm not TikTok by force. TikTok, you, will, you see TikTok on my phone. 
app TikTok. But today, I'm now doing TikToking. Whatsoever. You will now see me a video on Instagram. Why? It's not always convenient for me. Oh. Sometimes I might not be in the mood for another six months to even do anything. But thank God for those guys that are posting it, that are extracting my, some of my videos, old videos on YouTube, whatsoever. What sells today is what? Content. If you don't know how to talk, but for you that is any kill issue, you can see the way a package five in one. Get another person that can. When Wale started uh, on the play, and he came to me in the early days, I said I will take it to now, take it to this, to whatsoever. No, he came to complain. I look at his books, they were just making laws at the early days, whatsoever. They know that I'm very outspoken and I'm a talker. Even if I have not met Ceci, Fanda, CEO before, now before, I will take you by the end. Right, let's go there. Ololama and so. The worst thing he can tell you is what? No. And he can still tell you no today, and you return back tomorrow. And you will. But when you are returning back, returning back with a higher offering or higher value. So that when you are sitting together, there will be that mutual respect. I think I should, I just said I should just put. Wow. I mean, this is like business school. Anyway, um, I'm happy that we're doing this. Your question. You have a question. <laughs> we didn't plan with the, the, the time table was for 6.30 to be ended. So uh, we're going to take your own last thing. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So my question is from the beginning of the discussion where Mr. Mark spoke about um, growth and he spoke of structure, how that he can sit in his room and draft the plan. And then you sir, spoke about experimenting, how that you just tried many things. So I was wondering, is there a way to balance? At what point should you be more focused on experimenting? At what point should you focus on structure? Is, is there... I like that question. Victor, a very structured person. He like even the only thing that we fight a lot for in Nigeria, we fight a lot. Uh, even most of my team members fight me a lot because me, I was coming from the background of student unionism, activism. I never knew that I'm going to go into business. The only thing I was thinking is that when I was doing forestry in Futa, when I got to part five, if they still ask me, what will you do after part five? Because Forest. I was just doing everything I did in Puta absent mindedly. Absent mindedly. Nothing look futuristic. Something just started looking futuristic a bit to me when I went for NYC. And they said we should start attending one or two seminars. So I started making little money, you know, leadership. But luckily, I was even at a point regretting that. Why didn't I do entrepreneurship in Puta instead of doing leadership? But it was later I got to know that leadership is the father of entrepreneurship. The reason why some of us are being audacious, ruthless, the way they call my name, ruthless today in the market is because of the leadership of that corridor of student union that I wish by chance of. I will wash you down. Which grammar do you want to speak? So, or the president of a country, whatsoever. So that has given me that. Activism, courage. So, for I'm a Paul. Quite a number of them are Peter. Paul is ruthless. He can shut anything, open anything. He doesn't care who's goose. Professor Equally was on call with me yesterday for almost 20 minutes. He said, I do not value relationship. He was like me. Because his wife uh, went through some. Uh, health challenges a few weeks ago, and he told me on phone. And I was on my way to Lagos. I totally forgot because immediately I get to Lagos, even my wife I don't call her. It's when I return back to my own. Hello, have you got into Lagos? Yes, yes. Okay, or to the one month. So by the one month, one month here, unless there's no emergency, you don't call me. That I say I should check on you. You'll be in trouble. Now that might not work for a very calm. Easy going person. My wife is a lecturer, a PhD. Even they were talking about tech fund the other time. You know, something that was exciting me when they were talking about research is that 
I, I wish I can advise young people to marry a lecturer. The guides. They got, do you know how much funds we have taken just because of her? They have used almost all my businesses. I have used it for her to take grants. Financial inclusion, she has taken grants. How many years? And uh, what do you call this one? Rural empowerment is taking. I will 2 a.m. be writing grant research. You know, she doesn't even have the capacity or the strength for that. If she has not married a husband that knows that he took grant from the thing here, he can write grant application from thing here. She will not, I will sit down with her, point the old words, use number, data statistics, or be that phone that come from her. Understand? That collaboration is what matters. There's nothing like balancing. You are not the organized person. Look for the organized person. You are the organized person. You also need the rough hand. Because if you are the, all of you are the organized person, and you, that's why I hate tech guys. They will spend all their life building the app, building the tech, building the product development. They never care about the market that we buy it. And that, do you know why? Uh, did you ask that question the other time? That why did they start Bella? Do you know how many startups that have closed down in the last one year in Nigeria? Why are they still opening petrol station? Do you know how many petrol stations that are not selling petrol station petrol in this Akure in the last one year now because they increased for it? Almost 50% of petrol in Akure now is not selling petrol in the last one year. Because they don't I one of the startups that closed down that pay me the most in Nigeria is this Okada book. After 10 years, because I love books. I say if I lay my hand on this dead startup, I will revive. I will pivot it in different ways that the nine-year-old boy will, will read books, we order everything, but because they don't, many startups don't know how to pivot law and pivot and diversify. And they don't have the team members that know how to pivot. So the whole 10 of them are just introverts, techie, strategist, product developer, web developer, like my Aburu. I know he spoke, I don't know, maybe he spoke earlier. Ademola Murebishi, he can, he's one of, he's the first person in Futa that started tech. Ademola Murebishi. Do you know just when he posted this event yesterday on his Facebook page, seven people came after him on his comment box. Ademola will remember that you started this character. You started this. You, where are those, all those 10 ideas that you started? All of them are talking to consultants. Not that they want to be consultants, it's because they don't know how to build and bridge things. And which is very, very important. They can add to it, but your question touched me that by the whatsoever, there is no thing or balancing. It's just, I am the it guy. This person can be the, let's structure it, but there must be a room of availability for every to accommodate each other i mean i'm gonna end this yeah put your hands together um so i was in i was in portacos and i told them i said honestly if it were left to me we won't be in real estate left he knows my name is very important to me my brand is important to me and even though i take risks crazily but i also don't want to take any kind of risk. But I need someone like him. I can take a crazy kind of risk. Oil of Olijado or Munile, but that's not me. You get the picture. If I'm waiting for my structure, structure, you know, calm, demeanor kind of person, we will not be in real estate. But on the other hand, I have the publicity, I have the Tennessee's go and do the market, bring this and that and all that. I have the network. I can just sit in one place. Everybody that spoke here today, I gathered them in two days. And I did not leave my bed in the hotel in Portaco to do it. I'm not using that to post. I appreciate my relationships. But that's my person. I have not just relationships. Do you understand? So my personality and nurture relationships. And that is good for marketing and sales. 
So I know my strength. Do you get? In structuring business, I'm the one that can study multiple models, do this and that. So you, you want to have a team. It is not about you being in both places. He mentioned something else. I said, he quickly got someone that understands growth to work with him. That's why Jesus had 12 disciples. He did not do it alone. Eh? Paul had a Timothy and he had Silas and all that to work with him. In your journey, you must know the people that can play team with you to achieve your vision. David had a Jonathan. Moses had a Joshua. You can, I can keep giving examples. I don't, it doesn't mean there are no solo preneurs that do it alone. Like, uh, what's this Twitter guy? What's his name now? Eh? Jack. But they are outliers. It doesn't also mean that if you do it together, you will succeed. The risk is also there. But even, even that's the Twitter guy had a very solid team that they hired. Facebook hired a woman. What's her name? The COO. Another. So what am I saying? You don't have to have it all. I don't have it all. When we did FinTech, I'm the one that traveled to all the state, gather people, go and meet with the association. I can spend one hour, two hours, you know, so. But when it comes to collecting our money back, credit, I cannot lock somebody in prison, but he can. He can lock somebody, he can say, they come and arrest him and take him to court. But you, me, 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 schedule your combine for my life, you know, What am I saying? Understand the balance. Know who you are and know who you need. Do you get it? And that's going to be the end of the convention for today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we've come to the end of the Campus Innovation Summit. Um, it's been a long one. For those of you that waited behind, I have a gift for you. So we are giving you one free day at the hub. Full internet, full day. Come and use it any day you want within the next two weeks. So feel free to come around. But thank you so much for coming around. We really appreciate it. But I think, I think they have, where are they? Yeah, so they, they have something for you. So thanks, everyone. Do have a lovely days ahead. And uh, if you have not joined the Campus Innovation Labs WhatsApp group, join it. Thanks, everyone. Do have a lovely night. See you again.